Καταρχήν, καλημέρα σε όλους. Good morning to everyone. Um, honorable Deputy Minister of Culture, Your uh, Excellency Ambassador of Israel, representatives of the embassies of Greece, France, Italy, Romania, the Netherlands and Spain, dear Director of the Department of Antiquities, dear Director of the uh, Leventis Foundation, dear representative of the Chief of Police, dear members of the Board of Trustees and the Friends of the Cyprus Institute, dear colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Nicolas Bakirtzis, and along with uh, co-organizers, uh, Dr. Michel Menou and Dr. Sorin Hermon, we welcome you to today's symposium. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. Of course, our gratitude goes to our international guests who we'll be hearing from later today. Today's event is the first of several others celebrating the achievements of the three years of operation of our art characterization of um, laboratories, of the Andreas Pitas Art Characterization Laboratories, APA Clubs at the Science and Technology in Archaeology and Culture Research Center. We've come a long way since the inauguration of our labs back in 2018 at the commencement of our full operation in 2019. It was all made possible through the generosity and support of Dr. Andreas Pitas who from early on recognized the potential of our interdisciplinary expertise to study, document, analyze, characterize, and visualize works of art, archeological treasures, monuments, and sites. Today's event is dedicated to his vision for the APAC Labs, and I want to deeply thank him on behalf of all the members of our team for his steadfast support and leadership. Over the past years, our team comprised of young researchers, technical experts, and graduate students, tackled a broad array of research projects and opportunities, benefiting, of course, from the expertise and broad research infrastructure of Star C and the Cyprus Institute. We analyzed works of art, discovering unknown secrets, documented and digitally reconstructed archaeological objects, built dedicated data management systems and visualized monuments and sites at risk from looting, but also from the impact of climate change. We also developed techniques and new instrumentation to study and preserve our cultural heritage. More importantly, we had the opportunity to support the work of archaeological authorities and cultural heritage stakeholders like the Department of Antiquities, the Church of Cyprus, and other local museums contributing thus to societal needs. Finally, we also addressed the challenges of research innovation and commercialization, a priority for the economy of Cyprus. Of course, we have all day to present and discuss our, our activities and also hear from leading international scholars and researchers. And I will now ask Professor Costa Papanicolas, president of the Cyprus Institute, to offer a brief welcome. Thank you, Nico. Uh, Minister, Excellencies, and there are so many of you. Uh, dear Andrea, uh, it, is, it is truly a pleasure to, uh, to welcome all of you to today's uh, symposium for several reasons. This is the beginning of a series, as we already uh, were told by Nikos, of events uh, celebrating the three years of operation of the Andreas Pitas Art Characterization <laughs> Uh, laboratories uh, at the Science and Technology in Archaeology and, Cult and Culture Research Center, Star C, of the Cyprus Institute. It also coincides with the celebration of this year of 15 years of operation of Cyprus Institute itself, uh, which uh, will be also celebrated uh, throughout the year. Andreas uh, played a defining role, not only for launching uh, and endowing uh, this uh, wonderful uh, set of laboratories at Star C, but at uh, the uh, growth, establishment, and 
for court uh, disciples instituted it is uh, today. So we thank him for all that. Andreas Peters is one responsible for the establishment of APAC. Everybody knows that. The laboratories bear his name. His true love for art and his curiosity for its hidden secrets draws, drove his, his decision to support the establishment of these laboratories uh, dedicated to interdisciplinary study of uh, artifacts of archaeological and other uh, kinds of artifacts, generally of uh, our uh, of objects of heritage. Andreas' generous grant for APAC was a milestone for our institute as it continued the as it constituted the first major private donation to the Institute uh, to be uh, actually soon followed uh, by the Levendis uh, Chair in Archaeological Sciences uh, funded by the Levendis Foundation. Um, please allow me actually uh, to digress a bit from the um, uh, from the standard uh, 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 welcoming address to give you a bit of history, um, the, which um, has to do with the establishment of APEC. It is assumed that Andreas got engaged with Star C and subsequently uh, played this uh, tremendous role of establishing APEC uh, through his involvement of the Cyprus. Institute. Actually, it's the other way around. <laughs> uh, in 2008, let me go back, roughly a year later from the establishment of the Star C and the start of operations, actually, of the Cyprus Institute, just a year later, um, uh, the establishment of Star C was done in collaboration with the Centre de Recherche et Restauration des Musées de France, CDRMF. Uh, the, I got a phone call from the director of the Department of Antiquities at that time, uh, Pablos Florenzos, uh, on the advice of uh, uh, Professor Kirsi Lawrence, and he, I was, uh, I didn't know him, he called me and he said that he had just made a significant discovery of three sarcophagi in Larnaca and one of them was of extraordinary, in his view, uh, value, made of really the top quality marble, which didn't exist in Cyprus, and even more so, uh, traces of color uh, it was painted, were still visible. He was worried that uh, the exposure to light and to atmosphere will uh, de destroy the pigments and the traces of whatever painting was uh, remaining. And he said, uh, I noticed that your collaboration with the Louvre, he meant the CDRMF, and this uh, famous French scientist, uh, Maybe they can help us identify quickly what these uh, pigments are and if we can stabilize them if they are in danger of uh, being lost. Also do provenance and uh, analysis of the uh, pigments itself. Uh, well, I called at that time immediately uh, Jean-Pierre Moen, uh, who played a key role in establishing the um, uh, in the, the Star C through the collaboration uh, with us. Uh, probably uh, most of the experts, at least in the room, know uh, this giant of, uh, of, uh, of using science and technology in archaeology and culture, later uh, director of Musée de Lomme and Musée de Franli. Um, and he told me the following. You know, the guy to talk to is Michel Menou. Uh, he is the uh, head of, the, of our laboratories here at the Louvre. And this is uh, something that, uh, that uh, you should talk to him. So this is where Michel Menou comes into the picture. 
this for how I got to know Michelle. Long, making a very long story short, shorter, uh, uh, about uh, two weeks later, a French uh, contingent arrives with uh, the latest equipment. Uh, they do studies. They take uh, even samples back to uh, uh, to the, their laboratories in France. They use Aglai and the, the latest technology that uh, uh, exists in uh, anywhere. And uh, a year later, uh, a volume appears uh, published by the Department of Antiquities uh, with many articles from French uh, uh, scientists, from uh, CYAI, Star C scientists, uh, and Department of Antiquities, uh, of course, uh, scientists. Uh, the volume was uh, edited by Florenzos himself. A year later, 2012, uh, I had my first lunch with Andreas Peters. Uh, I, 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 11? 11. Uh, so it was the same year that uh, the, the, the volume was published. Uh, so uh, it was a time, actually, that uh, we were, had some negative press about the Institute. Uh, and uh, we had lunch to, to inform him about what the Institute was all about. And uh, he asked all the right questions. Uh, and what is this new institution? Who needs it? What is it doing? What is his vision, et cetera, et cetera. And then he drops the bomb. He says, uh, I'm reading this book by Florenzos. OK, um, you understand, these are highly technical, scientific uh, um, uh, volume with uh, reports. And I'm being very impressed by the contents of it and the fact that uh, there is this uh, unit star C that you have that uh, doing this wonderful work, and we need so much of it, we need really uh, to enhance it, support it, and expand on it. Um, so um, I say, I, I, I'll stop there. You can fill the dots uh, uh, to where we are uh, today. So that's how it started, Andreas. I, I have a vivid memory of this. and I, I, uh, clearly, you remember it uh, better than mine since you corrected even the date. Um, over the past years, APAC labs have managed to establish their expertise at the local, regional, and international level, uh, tackling a broad range of research projects in collaboration with local authorities and stakeholders like the Department of Antiquities, primarily the Department of Antiquities, and I want to thank here uh, the, um, its director, uh, Dr. Marina Yeronimidu, who is with us and very uh, engaged in the activities. The Church of Cyprus, the Levendis Foundation, Lugia uh, Haji Gavril, I hear, is here. I would like to thank her. Uh, and uh, the um, impressive work that has been done, I will not uh, do this year. Throughout the day, we'll hear uh, the so many achievements, really impressive, that have been done in, uh, in, in these three short uh, years. Uh, we are really proud of the development of the new methods and instrumentation, like the multimodal scanner developed right now here in collaboration again with CDRMF, a unique instrument, the first prototype worldwide. I expect, I, 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 it is in the adjacent room in the exhibition of instrumentation that is used. It's in, done with collaboration with, uh, as I said, CDRMF and the, uh, and the uh, Fondation des Sciences uh, du Patrimoine, uh, the uh, latest, uh, uh, the, the new uh, foundation, foundation uh, in France. It will be an omission here if we do not highlight two activities for which I'm sure we'll be hearing more and more in the coming years. Uh, a, the engagement in innovation uh, through the ARTES uh, program, uh, it was just mentioned by uh, Bagirzis, uh, among um, another initiative which actually uh, is driven by a vision that was uh, uh, 
brought to us early on, actually at the very foundation, at the opening of the APAC Labs, uh, Andrea said, hey, we, sh we should move into this uh, innovation uh, direction, and the result is artists which would hear more. Uh, I would like to uh, thank also the uh, Cyprus Seeds, uh, the wonderful Cyprus Seeds program, uh, Maria Yoriadu, uh, the managing director, I would like to thank, and Karen Golmer, who is from MIT here, who is acting as a mentor uh, to, uh, to this uh, program. Thank you. Um, and second, uh, an issue that uh, I'm passionate about is uh, addressing the risks presented to the cultural uh, heritage by the, cl by the evolving climate crisis. It's, it's real, it's here, and it's destructive. Uh, and uh, already there is activity, there is a report that came out of it, uh, and an example is the uh, digital documentation of the ancient necropolis of Shad B in Alexandria, which is under serious threat. Unfortunately, it may be already uh, foregone conclusion it will happen that it will be uh, threatened severely by the rising sea at the uh, Nile uh, Delta. Let me conclude by congratulating the faculty, the researchers, and the staff of APAC Labs, and uh, especially uh, its director, uh, Professor Nikos Bakitsis, but also the entire Star C uh, Center in which APAC is embedded. I will conclude thanking the distinguished speakers that came from uh, uh, from as far away as uh, Chicago, uh, uh, throughout from Europe, uh, that will uh, uh, touch on aspects of uh, the activities throughout the day uh, to let us start the celebrations of this great occasion. Finally, uh, Andrea, many thanks to you. All this is happening because of your vision and generosity. And uh, I think the Fun has just begun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I now want to call Dr. Pitas, uh, Executive Chairman of Medochemy and uh, Chair of the Executive uh, Committee of the Board of Trustees of the Cyprus Institute. I think, uh, Nicolas, you greeted everybody, but uh, first of all, I have to thank Costas for his words and greet my friend, Yanis Tumazis, who happily is now a minister of culture. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a true pleasure to welcome you to today's symposium, the first of a series of events celebrating three years of operation and achievements for APAC Labs. The Art Characterization Laboratories of the Cyprus Institute. I will let our prominent guests and speakers of our symposium to properly explain and address matters of research in the broader, in the broader field of arts, characterization, and heritage science. For me, it has been always a matter of sincere interest as well as curiosity for new knowledge in art. Revealing the secrets and the hidden stories of works of art and archaeological objects through the use of science and technology is an exciting journey of discovery. As such, it is a core focus of our, our, our characterization labs. Growing up in our island of Cyprus, I was from a young age fascinated by the remains of its rich archaeological and cultural past, in particular by the artistic legacy of the Byzantine and medieval periods. Later in life and during my studies abroad, 
I was enthralled to discover the ways Renaissance artists in Italy responded to the achievements of Byzantine art while opening amazing new venues of artistic expression. Style, technique, and the materiality of works of art mirror the creative skills of their makers. They also reflect the cultural sensibility of their patrons and the aesthetic taste of their audience. As I became involved with the establishment and development of the Cyprus Institute, I immediately recognized the great potential of our science and technology in archaeology and cultural research center, Star C. I was especially impressed by the collaborative work in heritage science between Stasi and the Centre de Recherche et Restauration des Musées de France at the Louvre Museum. I was also very happy to see the close partnership with the Department of Antiquities and other local institutions, which I consider of fundamental importance. Seeing the impressive results of the digital and material analysis of archaeological objects, I was convinced of the importance of these efforts and proceeded to support them. Over the past years, our APAC team has established a world-class laboratory that has gained international recognition. We provide a holistic approach to our characterization possible through a cross-disciplinary scientific pipeline that integrates digital and scientific analytical methods driven by art historical and archaeological inquiries. In addition, we are actively engaging doctoral and master students who are developing their research in the context of APAC research. You will be able to hear about our work during the symposium, but also meet our researchers and students and learn about some highlights of APAC research in the exhibition in the room across from the lecture hall. From the material analysis of archaeological objects, like their high terracotta status from Salamis and the digital documentation and the construction of the unique Paleocastro Kuros to the discovery and mapping of hidden paintings, unknown signatures, and overpainting interventions in works by masters like Titian and El Greco, the research team at APAC has achieved extraordinary results. Without any doubts, advances in the use of advanced scientific and technological methods have truly revolutionized the ways we study and in turn preserve art and archaeology. We focus on the integration of expertise in art history, digital heritage, and visualization with physical chemical analysis and dendrochronology based on portable and bench instrumentation. Besides focus on specific works and objects, the work of APAC Labs has also contributed to the interdisciplinary study of monuments and sites of global significance, such as the UNESCO prehistoric settlement of Hirokitia and the UNESCO painted churches of the Trotos Mountains, where, with the collaboration of the Department of Antiquities, we document, analyze, and visualize the arts and the architecture of these gems of medieval Mediterranean culture. I want to also mention the contribution of APAC Labs in efforts to tackle the challenges of heritage at risk, including the impact of climate change and the threats by looting and illicit trafficking of antiquities and heritage assets. And I want to note here our collaboration with the Department of Forests and the Cyprus Police. Our team is also working outside Cyprus, for example, 
in Alexandria of Egypt, helping to digitize its antiquities under threat by the rising waters of the sea, something mentioned already by Professor Papanicolas, and in Venice, specifically in the Basilica of San Marco, for the digital analysis of the thousands of unknown graffiti covering the interior and the exterior of the major site. I want to also emphasize that our lab's research is part of key European initiatives, such as the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science and the Competence Center of the for the Conservation of Cultural Heritage. I have also, from the beginning, supported the potential of APAC towards innovation and the commercialization of our expertise and services. I'm very proud to see the growth of our art characterization services effort, known as ARTES, which is exceeding and rapidly developing, benefiting from innovation accelerator programs, like Cyprus Seeds in Cyprus and DGG in Greece. I am also very excited for the completion of our first innovation instrument a unique in the world multimodal CRF scanner, which has been developed in collaboration with our French partners in Paris and the Louvre. You will have the chance to see and learn about this novel instrument in our exhibition. It is really unique. I'm very proud of the work and achievements of APAC Labs at the Cyprus Institute, and I'm grateful to all our team members for their efforts in particular. I want to congratulate and thank Dr. Nicolas Bakirzis and Dr. Sorin Hermon for leading these efforts. Also, I want to express my appreciation to Dr. Michel Menou, now Interim Director of STAR-C and previously Head of Research at the Louvre Laboratories for his continuous support and contribution. Of course, I want to also acknowledge the support of the Cyprus Institute in the successful development of APAC as an institute facility. I look forward to the next steps of our exciting journey of discovery. I am committed to APAC's efforts in the use of scientific and technological research and innovation to enrich our knowledge about the past and to strengthen our ability to protect our cultural heritage for future generations. I will continue to support APAC's growth with funds to help the enrichment of its instrumentation and its analytical capacity as well as in relation to the work of researchers and students developing their expertise within the scope of APAC research activities. As I mentioned, today's symposium is only one of several events celebrating the three years of APAC's lab successes. In January, we will organize a lecture by Professor Calabresu of Harvard University on the art and the cultural significance of the Church of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, a series of presentations in various localities throughout Cyprus and in particular in sites where we have worked like in Kalopanayotis, Kakopetria, Aia, Napa and Paphos, will offer us the opportunity to disseminate and share our results with local communities and stakeholders. Finally, in April, we will organize an exhibition on the discovery of a lost masterpiece by Titian, specifically how APAC scientific analysis of the Ecce Homo painting by the Renaissance master led to the mapping and the recreation of the unknown portraits of a man. Following Nicosia, the exhibition will be hosted in Paris by the Institut de France also planning to organize it at the Institute of Chicago. I will conclude with wishing every success 
to today's symposium. I look forward to the presentations and the related discussion. I thank you for being with us and for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter. I will now ask uh, the Director of Antiquities, Dr. Marina Solomidu Hieronimidu, for her address. Thank you. Dear Deputy Ministry of Culture, Dear Deputy Ministry, Minister of Culture, Your Excellency, Professor Papanicolas, Dr. Pitas, Mr. Malas, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, dear friends. It is with great pleasure that I address this symposium celebrating the achievements of the first three years of the Andreas Pitas Art Characterization Laboratories at the Cyprus Institute. I can recall the inauguration of these labs, where the importance of their establishment for the development of the cultural heritage sector was underlined. Today, from this floor, I am indeed very happy to look back into the first years and observe that the mission of these significant laboratories already began to be implemented for the benefit of the art and heritage, not only of Cyprus, but of the world in general. It is such advances that have placed our island in the center of international scientific developments in times they are needed the most. It is perhaps needless to emphasize once more the strong relationship shared between the Department of Antiquities and the Cyprus Institute, specifically with STAR-C. Our long collaboration, which includes a wide range of activities, has produced and still produces invaluable outcomes, <coughs> contributing to the advancement of archaeological research and also to managing our rich cultural heritage. In particular, the Department of Antiquities as the governmental department responsible for the control, preservation, research, and promotion of the archaeological heritage of Cyprus, currently manages and protects over 1,600 list detention monuments on the island. As per the Antiquities Law, one of our primary objectives is also to protect all movable and immovable artifacts from illegal activities, such as looting and trafficking, and promote research for the benefit of archaeology, cultural heritage, but also of society, and especially in times of crisis. Indeed, one can grasp the importance of the activities of APAC labs through the generous do donation of Dr. Andreas Bitas in the fields of heritage, science, and art characterization, but also in digital cultural heritage, scientific visualization, and many other research areas if we consider the circumstances and conditions currently faced by humanity. The too many challenges of our days, ranging from the climate crisis, the destruction of the environment and other disasters, either man-made or natural, armed conflicts, energy and economic crisis, call for increasing resilience for the protection of heritage and for establishing preventive measures in this spectrum, digital documentation is, for example, crucial for recording the values of the different kinds of cultural heritage, as well as for assessing their condition, reconstructing and preserving key elements in digital form, and providing the basis for enhancing the overall management strategies. As I refer to, to challenges, I must highlight that the Department of Antiquities works closely together with the Cyprus Institute for combating the impacts of the climate change on cultural heritage in the, in the framework of MME. 
the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East Climate Change Initiative of the President of the Republic of Cyprus. In addition, we strongly collaborate for addressing looting of cultural heritage. It is thus evident that the issues examined in the APAC laboratories further support these mutual endeavors for addressing risks threatening our cultural heritage with destruction. Moreover, the labs facilitate our common efforts for developing a concrete and complete heritage science infrastructure as part of the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, ERIS, in collaboration with other EU member states and heritage organizations. Within this context, the innovative techniques provided by the APAC labs and the application of state-of-the-art technologies for the analytical study and characterization, not only of art and archaeology, but of cultural heritage in general, enable us to not only address research questions, but to, but to expand our management tools and responses to threats and other needs. Such examples that have contributed immensely in safeguarding our heritage are provided by the work conducted, for example, in the virtual, in the virtual reconstruction of the looted church of Christ and Fonigis in the occupied district of Gerinia near Calogrea, as well as of terracotta statues from Salamis dating to the Cypriot archaic period, now located at different parts of the world. Further documentation work has focused on the graffiti apparent in churches, contributing in documenting and digitally preserving heritage, heritage elements that are gradually deteriorating. It is therefore obvious that the labs, since their full operation in 2019, have already contributed to the important mission of the Department of Antiquities for the sustainable development of the cultural sector. Another important area of our collaboration is the Cyprus Dendrochronology Laboratory, for the establishment of which the Department of Antiquities has signed an MOU with the Cyprus Institute, the Department of Forests, and Cornell University. Again, this lab, which aims at enhancing the methods used for the study of monuments and artifacts, has been further developed within the framework of the Andreas Bittas Art Characterization Laboratories, <coughs> producing significant results. As follows from what I have briefly mentioned, the multifaceted benefits of the operation of the labs that will be celebrated in this symposium are more than evident. The innovative research conducted in these three years has already helped us to better understand issues of provenance and the technological processes relating to the manufacture of various ancient materials for a better understanding of past societies. It has also become apparent that scientific documentation and analysis are vital in our struggle to address risks and make heritage resilient and sustainable against all threats. At the same time, young researchers are being trained and new opportunities are being created for the younger generation of scientists. And of course, our knowledge on the cultural heritage of Cyprus is being widely explored and disseminated, while our, our island becomes a world hub in the sphere of heritage sciences, and particularly of archaeological research, management, conservation, and protection of archaeological heritage. The Department of Antiquities, and I personally, value our collaboration with the Cyprus Institute and the importance of building a scientific basis for development in the field of cultural heritage. Within this framework, please allow me to express my sincere appreciation to Dr. Andreas Bittas for funding the creation of such a basis through the APEC labs. Looking back at these three years, I am happy and content that I supported this endeavor, as our knowledge on the archaeological record and the tools for its preservation have already been increased. I am confident that they will continue to do so, and I look forward to the next steps of the exciting future of APAC Labs. I look forward to listening to the fruitful outcomes of the research that will be presented by the distinguished speakers, and I thank you all. Thank you, Marina.
And finally, I want to call uh, the, the Honorable Deputy Minister of Culture, Dr. Yanis Tumazis, for a brief address. Thank you. Kalimera sas. Oops. Elia. Tora poste kerefto. Δεν μα θέλουν τα κανάλια. We do like live performance, so it's great. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's always very exciting to visit the Cyprus Institute, the valuable work of which I strongly support and greatly admire. That's why I'm very happy today that I'm here to address the Milestone Symposium, Old Masters, New Tools, Science and Technology Approaches to Art History, that is organized as part of the celebrations for the three years of the Andreas Bittas Art Characterization Labs. Established, as we have heard, in 2019 at the Science and Technology in Archaeology and Culture Research Center of the Cyprus Institute, the labs stand out for their holistic approach to art characterization, effectively deploying cutting-edge technology and science in the characterization of works of art, monuments, and heritage material culture. APAC Labs researches valuable works includes developing task-specific service protocols in art characterization, addressing issues of style, technique, provenance, as well as preservation. In addition, they offer training and educational programs for experts and students, promoting knowledge, exchange, and furthering the Institute's impact and outreach via interdisciplinary methodologies and approaches. Most importantly, not only for us Cypriots, but for the wo whole world, APAC labs are distinguished for their attention to heritage at risk monuments and materials. As I'm sure everybody gathered here acknowledges, Cyprus, despite its small size, can boast some, about some of the oldest and richest world heritage treasures dating back millennia, and naturally, many of them included in UNESCO's list. However, and unfortunately, a substantial percentage of these treasures are now facing decay or even destruction as a result of the Turkish invasion in 1974 and the continued occupation of the northern part of the island. APAC Lab's work turns the spotlight on the urgency to protect and preserve our precious material culture across the island. I would like to thank and congratulate the president of the Cyprus Institute, Professor Kostas Papanikolas, and all the staff, researchers, and students of the Institute for their invaluable contribution to knowledge, heritage preservation, and exchange. The symposium organized these days is only but proof of the world-leading work that is being carried out in your institution. I would also like to congratulate uh, Professor Stavros Malas for his appointment as the new president of the Institute. I wish you every success. On this occasion, of course, I take the opportunity to express my particular thanks and gratitude to Dr. Andreas Pitas, President of the Executive Committee of the Board of Trustees for his outstanding contribution, special interest, love, and financial support for research and innovation all these years in the fields of arts and cultural heritage of Cyprus. Thank you so much, Andreas. Last but not least, I would like to welcome the impressive lineup of esteemed academics, researchers, curators, scientists, and cultural professionals from across Europe and North America to Cyprus, and wish you all a fruitful, productive, and knowledge-expanding symposium. In the face of the great many challenges of today's world, one must stress must stress the beacon of light that your institutes and organizations represent 
emphasizing that the only way forward is one of exchange, integration, accessibility, collaboration, and synergies. All the best to your proceedings and to our friends from abroad. I hope you enjoy your stay in Cyprus. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So as we, as we break uh, for coffee, I want to just acknowledge that across the hall there is a, an exhibition of uh, APAC instrumentation and projects. Uh, our staff members are there to kind of share with you aspects of the research. But uh, first, let's allow our uh, guest of honor to, um, to have the tour, which will be led by my colleague uh, Sorin Hermon. And then, uh, and then everybody else uh, will uh, have the chance to, to, to enjoy this exhibition, which will be running uh, uh, through the day. So thank you very much.
All right. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for staying along. Uh, of course, I'm thrilled that the exhibition and the coffee really engage people to, to stay longer. We will now start the, the presentations of the symposium. And uh, I want to just briefly mention how the rest of the day will run in a way. Uh, we have organized talks in uh, thematic sessions. Uh, each session has uh, uh, a chair, more in the role of a respondent in a way. Uh, in the morning we have uh, Professor Iolik Calavrezu. In the afternoon we have uh, uh, Dr. Michel Menou. Um, so after the speakers will present, then, in a, then we will have a kind of a discussion with questions. So before, uh, so let's uh, start immediately. And uh, I'm very happy to invite uh, Professor Ioli Calavrezu, um, Dumbarton Oaks professor at Harvard University in Byzantine Art, uh, who will chair this session. Thank you, Ioli. Good morning, uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Um, as uh, Nicholas mentioned, we are going to have four papers this morning, and they are divided into these two uh, uh, different sessions with the different topics. Uh, our first one will be on issues uh, of art historical uh, questions and perspectives, and um, I'm going to but before we start, I wanted to say also personally two words to thank and congratulate the team of the APAC and their success in these last three years. And I want to also say that nothing of that would have happened if we didn't have the generosity and vision of Dr. Pites. <laughs> thank you, with whom, you know, with all I want to thank. Um, so, our first speaker is uh, Professor Anastasia Dandraki. She is uh, Associate Professor of Byzantine Art and Archaeology at the National uh, Capodistrian University of Athens. And since 1991 uh, all the way to 2017, she was curator of Byzantine and post-Byzantine uh, of the collection in the Benaki Museum, which we all got to know her with her great exhibitions that she organized on uh, Byzantine art and culture, uh, mainly on objects like ceramics, jewelry, and icons. You know, it was an object-directed sort of exhibitions. Um, so her work in general is focusing on late antiquity and medieval uh, art objects like metalwork, icons, but also and wall paintings too, right? Yes. So uh, we're going to start with her paper, which has the title, The Technical Side of Art History, The Case of Cretan Icon Painting. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Yoli, for the presentation. It's, um, it's a great joy to be here again. Uh, I've, I haven't been to Cyprus since before the, the COVID outbreak, so it's, um, it's not just a joy to be here, but also a great opportunity, the celebration of the three years of the APAC laboratories. <coughs> In a pioneering article on the contribution of physicochemical methods of analysis in the study of 13 icons from the Byzantine Museum of Athens, published in 1985 in the Deltion of the Christian Archaeological Society, the authors stated that, I quote, the examination of, by physicochemical methods of the structure and the use of colors reveals the handwriting of the painter. 
Its interpretation and evaluation should be based on parallel data from archaeological research so that in the future it could be possible it could be a possible method for the identification of groups of images with a common local or chronological origin, or even the identification of a painting workshop." Unquote. The article was signed by five researchers, among which one was art historian, Nano Hadzidakis, and the other five scientists, Chrysoulakis, Alexopoulou, Philippon, and Osset. It was the outcome of a collaborative research program conducted by the Byzantine Museum of Athens, the laboratory of the School of Chemical Engineering of the National Technical University of Athens, and the Institut Français de Restauration des Oeuvres d'Art in Paris. Though not the first attempt at using physical chemical analysis in the study of icons, the 1985 article was indeed groundbreaking because it raised important methodological issues and research questions that are still, after 38 years, pertinent. According to the authors, I quote, the selection of 13 icons, we're looking at four of them, was made with the aim of recording the technology of construction of icons dating from the same period, and furthermore, icons that either belong to a common artistic workshop or icons of particular interest for the high artistic quality, or even their peculiarity." Unquote. In fact, the 13 icons that were analyzed using a combination of destructive and non-destructive methods have quite diverse stylistic features and origins, their only common link being a fairly close dating in the 13th and 14th centuries. However, the co-examination paved the way for a more systematic mapping of the materials and techniques used in the successive stages and layers in the construction of icons, from the wooden support to the varnish. Since 1985, an ever-increasing number of technical studies on single panels or groups of icons have appeared in academic literature, introducing or expanding innovative technologies. The development of new tools by leading universities and research institutes, like the APAC laboratories we are celebrating today, is opening endless possibilities for diverse, often complementary methodologies that can be applied in the study of materials and techniques of icon painting. Most of these tools in our days focus on non-destructive diagnostic methods, the APAC laboratory uh, among the leading forces in this respect. Non-destructive methods which alleviate ethical and practical concerns caused by invasive cross-setting of the panels. One such tool, for example, is reflectance transformation imaging or RT, sorry. Nope, it doesn't want to move forward. Thank you. <laughs> so RTI, a method systematically applied here in Star Saint, if I'm not mistaken, it is one of um, Sars's RTI applications on early El, Gre El Greco paintings that has quite fittingly become the logo of our symposium. Especially as regards icons, the development of a non-destructive investigative methodology is of essence not only because of the painted panel's age and fragility, but also because most of them are to be found away from the cl clinical and controlled museum environment in churches and monasteries. They are still functional cult objects invested with sanctity and beliefs that render their dissection under the stereoscope quite challenging. Oops, sorry, I did something here. <clears throat> Yet, despite the proliferation of technical studies and the explosive development of new tools in the past decades, it is quite disappointing to realize that the main desideratum of the 1985 article I used as starting point is still as much relevant today as it was in the beginning of this research path 38 years earlier. In her closing remarks, Nano Hadzidakis stated that, I quote, 
Only the creation of an archive will allow the full exploitation and evaluation of all the results of physicochemical research." Unquote. The creation of an open access, expandable library database on the materiality of icons, collecting the results of technical analysis and detailed descriptions of the methodologies applied for their extraction, is in my view the most pressing need in this field of research. The analyses are still scattered in periodicals and conference acts, not always easily accessible, while others remain unpublished in museum, lab, archives, and I'm talking from experience here, from my uh, long career at the Benaki. There is a lot of data still not uh, disseminated. Next to the pressing need for a library database, even more important perhaps is the lack of true dialogue between art historians and scientists that is easily detectable in a large part of academic publications. Despite a promising joint start decades ago, technical and art historical studies often appear to be following parallel but not intertwined paths. Technical considerations only occasionally inform our historical discourse, while historical questions and sources that could render the technical results more meaningful are often absent from technical analysis. With these concerns in mind, I will focus today on methodological problems in the study of a specific class of icons produced in Venetian Crete from the 15th to the 17th centuries, problems that, in my view, may be dealt with only with the aid of a systematic investigation of the icon's technical traits. Cretan School of Icons is considered the most prolific and influential trend in Orthodox religious painting after the political dissolution of Byzantium with the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans in 1453. Venetian Crete, strategically placed in the heart of the Mediterranean trade routes and with a flourishing urban economy, became in many respects an ideal place for many Greek artists and literati to relocate as they left the last remnants of, remnants of the collapsing Byzantine Empire. Thanks to the relentless mercantile endeavors of the Venetians and in a climate of appreciation of Byzantine or Byzantinizing art in Western Europe, Cretan icons became a much sought after artistic commodity and reached an unprecedented volume of production from the mid 15th century on. The dogmatically mixed society of Venetian Crete and the demands of their international clientele led Cretan painters to develop a surprising dexterity in painting icons both in a traditional Byzantine style, a la Greca, like the ones we see on the upper uh, row, and following late Gothic models in forma and la, a la Latina. The terms are from the sources. Another large group of Cretan icons reveals a different sort of coexistence between Western and Byzantine models. Here, purely Byzantine and purely Italian figures are stitched together side by side. See, for example, this um, Byzantine Paleologan uh, baptism next to a purely Gothic crucifixion. The multifarious elements so carefully combined in this idiom retain almost unchanged the characteristics of each part. The process and the resulting new images remind me of pictorial centos, a visual counterpart of the literary form popular from Roman times in which erudite intellectuals selected, rearranged and stitched together verses or excerpts from well-known literary works such as Homer's Iliad in order to create a new narrative, a patchwork of separate recognizable units. This description translated into visual language could very well apply to this type of Cretan icons. Their mixed visual language has been discussed extensively in art historical literature. However, it is only very recently that our understanding of this pictorial duality went beyond the surface, beyond the obvious assimilation of Gothic iconographic elements by Cretan painters. A systematic research project investigating the technical features of early Cretan icons conducted by the Benaki Museum Conservation Lab 
offered new insights to this dialogue between Cretan and Italian painting. An inspired and innovative two-tired icon with the Noli Metangere and the Miracle of San Fanurios could be the subject of a dissertation on the conscious combination of Italian and Paleologan features expressed here in a perfectly realized theological and artistic balance. The technical examination conducted in the Benaki lab revealed that in the Noli Metangere, the artist used a technique, we see um, a, de a detail from the Noli Metangere on the left and a detail from the lower scene on the right. The artist used um, a technique for rendering the Italianate soft folds in the woman's garments different from that employed in the traditional geometric striations on the draperies of the more traditional figures, like Fanurius or the Virgin on the lower scene. The artist delineated the soft folds of the draperies on your left with a multitude of fine lines using their fluctuating density to render the darker and lighter tones of the garment's folds. This technique, well known from Italian paintings of the Trecento and early Quattrocento, is fundamentally different from the use of successive layers of gradually lighter tones in order to create the geometric draperies of Byzantine figures. It is clear that the painter of our icon was able not simply to imitate the iconography and style of, Itali of Italian works while employing traditional Byzantine painterly methods, but had also mastered the technical skills necessary to express himself in a genuine Italian idiom. In the case of the Fanorio's icon, the results of the technical analysis paves the way for a new appreciation and interpretation of information gleaned from the sources regarding, for example, partnerships between Italian and Greek painters in Candia, and at the same time raises new questions, as every good piece of research should do. Is this deep understanding of Italian painterly methods a distinguishing trait of a specific artist that could help us identify his fingerprint and attribute other similar works to him? Or was this knowledge shared among his peers? This icon has been plausibly attributed to the famous icon painter Angelo Sacotandos, who lived in Candia in the first half of the 15th century. Yet, this technique has not been identified in any of the other eight icons bearing his signature that have been similarly examined by the Benaki conservation team. How should we interpret this discrepancy? Should the two-tiered icon be attributed to a different yet unnamed artist? Or was it a special commission that demanded special treatment? Only by expanding the body of technical evidence with additional targeted material, we may be able to give answers. Perhaps with analysis on icons such as this one, a purely late Gothic panel bearing the signature of Angelus in Latin, Angelus paints it. And it is worth noting that in the entry, the Museum Correr, this icon is uh, characterized as um, olio su tavola, oil painting, which is not. So it's still uh, a lot of things we need to investigate. Be that as it may, by the mid-15th century, Cretan artists already had at their disposal a well-assimilated, extensive repertoire of established Byzantine and Italian iconographic subjects and the technical skills to reproduce them in high-quality icons. And this is exactly what they did on such a massive scale as to be quite astonishing. Sources from the second half of the 15th century refer to commissions for hundreds of icons and to contracts between artists that laid down working methods along the lines of small-scale industrial production. For example, in 1499, the artist Antonio Tagliapiera agreed to paint seven faces of the Virgin per day over a period of two months for his fellow artist, Michael Focas. The apprenticeship agreements, the frequent collaborations between artists, the way an artist's vocation ran in families, the systematic use of working drawings handed down from generation to generation and from workshop to workshop, and the conservative nature of the commissions they usually received 
gave the output of the Cretan workshops a coherent and instantly recognizable form which continued until the capture of Candia by the Ottomans in 1669. As we learn from notarial documents, Venetian merchants commissioned and channeled Cretan icons to the European market by the hundred in Italy, Flanders, Spain, Russia, and of course in Ottoman territories with dense Orthodox population. While the market was flooded with mass-produced preta porte icons, renowned Cretan artists were creating for demanding commissioners exceptional works of art on which they proudly put their signature and place of origin. The existence of numerous high-quality icons bearing the signatures of famous Cretan painters defined the directions of art historical studies on Cretan painting. Because unlike in the study of other areas and periods of Byzantine painting, the study of Cretan icons, to a large extent, concentrates on the issue of the famous painter and his work, thus putting the question of attributions at the center of the discourse from the outset. However, as all, of us, as all those of us who work on Cretan painting know, securely attributing works to specific artists is proverbially challenging, at least using the tools currently at our disposal. Painters and patrons consciously sought faithful repetitions of well-established iconographic types, and the high standards Cretan artists achieved in their work allowed them to imitate models by other artists extremely successfully. In studies on 15th century Cretan painting, the attribution of icons revolves for the most part around three names, although from the sources we know over 100 names of painters working in Candia in the 15th century. The three names are Angelo Sacotandos, we already mentioned him and we will return to him, Nicolas Zafuris and Andreas Rizos. To each of these painters, based on their signed works, we are inclined to attribute expressly or tacitly a sort of specialization in a particular type of painting. Thus, Angelus, undoubtedly an outstanding figure in the first half of the 15th century, is credited with more than 40 attributed works, quite varied in nature, including a group of icons of St. Fanurius, including the one we already saw. Nicolas Zafuris is credited with a large and equally disparate assortment of good Italo-Cretan works of the second half of the century, despite the fact that we already know, thanks to a signed thesis in Corfu, that he also produced beautiful traditional painting. However, there has been only one attempt, not very successful in my view, to attribute an unsigned icon of traditional style to Zafuris. While a large assortment of Italo-Cretan paintings uh, are being attributed to his um, hand, to him. As to Rizzos, he is connected with a large number of Cretan icons of the late 15th century in the classicizing style and with refined technique. Yet the evidence we have at our disposal undermines the theory of specialisms or exclusivity that dogs many of these attributions. In the case of Angelos and St. Fanorius, for example, we know that at least one other successful bourgeois painter from Candia Cosadino Serenikos played a vital part in creating the iconography of, of the scent, which was created in the 15th century. It was a new scent, a new invention. Um, when he undertook the job of painting the walls of the corresponding shrine with the scent's miracles and an impressive full length portrait of Fanorius. See here. Angelos was certainly some sort of expert in producing icons of St. Fanorius. Four bear his signature and two others can, based on the historical evidence, be securely attributed to him. However, should we consider him responsible, as if by right, for the other icons of the period that share the same iconography and style? Should we concur with Robin Cormack's assertion that, I quote, 
Angelos seems to have something of a monopoly of the representation of St. Fanorius, and it may indeed be possible that he is the only artist in the 15th century to have painted icons of this artist." Unquote. 20 years ago, oh God, it's so long, I confronted this question when studying an autograph icon in the Andreadis collection, which had already been published as one of Angelos's works, an attribution that I too then supported. In terms of its iconography, handling, and style, the icon is undoubtedly painted in the same spirit as the icons by Angelos. These are signed uh, icons of St. Fanorius, signed by Angelos. The written description of the modeling and of the skillful combination of paleologal and Italian elements in the Andreadis collection icon could be used word for word to describe, indeed, signed works by Angelos. Yet, 20 years later, things have changed. Thorough technical analysis of eight icons signed by Angelos carried out by the uh, Benaki Lab in collaboration with the Byzantine Museum of Athens and published in 2008 and 2014 has elucidated and deepened our understanding of Angelos' working method. The way he worked with the wooden supports. This just to show you um, what is uh, included in this a small part of what is included in this, uh, these publications on Angelo's uh, technique. The first exhibition dedicated exclusively to Angelos at the Benaki Museum, curated, curated by Maria Vasilaki, a, a, an expert in Angelos, was equally revealing. Having the chance to compare the numerous signed and attributed works in the exhibition, emphasized in many instances the differences between them which are often diluted in publications and written descriptions, art historical descriptions. It was not only the technical analysis, but in my opinion also the comparing and contrasting of the works themselves at first hand that once again raised the issue of the methodology of attributions. The data from the technical examinations and the publication of brilliant details of signed works by Angelos show that the Andreadis collection icon, despite close iconographic and stylistic similarities with the latter's work, cannot be attributed to Angelos, because the preparation of the ground layer, the underdrawing and the brush strokes used by its painter are quite different. He achieves the same artistic objective by another route, as I believe happens with at least one other icon of St. Fanorius, also attributed to Angelos this one here, in another private collection in Athens. Both works go back to the same model, which, for all that it is in the same vein as works by Angelos, is nevertheless different. The example I have used shows how systematic technical examination of icons established for decades in the history of Western art as a necessary part of the methodology for attributing works to named artists is even more essential to Cretan painting, where a certain uniformity in production and the repetition of specific models was a desideratum and a criterion of the success of these works. I believe that in order to identify the work of any given painter, it is essential to begin by gathering detailed technical information by analyzing signed works, like the projects on Angelos Acotandons, on Emanuel Labardos, a, a painter of the late 16th century, and of course on early Dominikos Theotokopoulos El Greco. But as far as I know, there are no other systematic investigations on the artistic fingerprint of um, Cretan artists other than these three. Once we have that data, we can at least exclude the attribution of icons that diverge significantly from the approach that a particular artist regularly uses. Unfortunately, however, the converse does not apply. A great many of the features that distinguish signed works and painters, even Angelos, are not their personal characteristics, but traits that they share with other contemporary Cretan workshops and artists. As mentioned above, repeated iconography, systematic copying of techniques, restricted color palettes, even standardized dimensions for icons and triptychs, 
are for the most part what distinguishes Cretan icon production. Creating a systematic methodology that could include not just subjective, iconographic and stylistic descriptions, but also detailed technical analysis of the, work of the icons is an essential prerequisite for attributing them to specific painters, albeit not always sufficient in itself to achieving this end. Yet, it is, in my view, the only way forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Anastasia. And we're going to take questions after the second talk, so we're going to have lots to ask you, I hope. Um, can I have the second PowerPoint changed here? Our second speaker in this section of art history presentations uh, is Professor Roma Toma, who is Associate Professor in Early Modern History of Art at the University Paris uh, Nanterre. He turned to uh, art history, the field where he received also his PhD, after a master's degree in quantum physics at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. It's quite a jump from one field to another. I was quite taken by this. <laughs> uh, he's particularly interested in the 17th century Dutch art in aspects of technical art history and digital humanities. In 2019, he co-authored a book on les provinces unies à l'époque moderne, that is the Dutch Republic in early modern times. He is now the principal investigator of the Aurum project and also deputy uh, scientific coordinator of Espadon. And his paper today will deal with the Aurum. So his title, his new title, it's not quite as we had it in the program, it's called Old Masters New Tools, uh, the Aurum project. Please welcome Professor Thomas. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and, and I would like to thank uh, particularly the organizers for their uh, invitation. I'm very pleased and uh, honored to, to be here and to be able to uh, present this, uh, this project. Uh, at the very end of uh, at the very end of the 15th century, the so-called master of the Saint Bartholomew altarpiece one of the best known masters painters of Cologne, even if we do not know uh, his real name, created a winged altarpiece uh, for the city Carthusian monastery. This St. Thomas altarpiece in the left here shows in the middle panel St. Thomas touching the wand of resurrected Christ. Both characters are dominated by God the Father and surrounded by a ring of saints. The whole scene appears on a gold ground, which reminds us, of course, of uh, Byzantine icons, uh, made with real gold leaf on a mordant. Probably some 150 years later, in the middle of the 17th century, an anonymous, an anonymous artist copied the central panel of the St. Thomas altarpiece on the right here, patronized by one member of the Habsburg imperial family, as the coat of arms in the bottom uh, points to. A few more differences appear. Indeed, the copist has, un has used canvas uh, instead of wood panel, a support widely used at that time, even if not exclusively. 
As mentioned in the catalog where this painting is recorded, the colors, ideas as they appear today, are more vivid than in the original. What then about the use of gold leaf? Um, was then about the use of gold leaf by the copist to paint the gold ground. Probably he did use gold leaf, but this is difficult to ascertain by simply looking at an image of the painting uh, that is without seeing it in Ambras Castle, where the artwork is curated. And uh, that's what I haven't done yet. Indeed, the copist could have used Latin yellow for this in the middle of the 17th century, using real gold in painting practices is much less widely used than in the 15th. The fashion has changed. And this is uh, an example to show this. Uh, the Sigismund Sebastian art art piece by Hans Bruckmeier uh, has been created in 1505 for Elector Frederick the Wise of Saxony. The history of this triptych itself is emblematic of the history of the relationship to gold in European painting. This altar piece, indeed, has been dismembered in the 17th century, while in the collection of Elector Maximilian, uh, parts of it were repainted with a landscape. Uh, at the very beginning, if it, there was a, a gold ground uh, uh, covering the, the whole uh, background. And in the 1930s, some parts were restored, but not all of them. Today, its appearance is a testimony of this historicity, as the upper part of the central panel still has the 17th century landscape. However, the work, was, uh, the work commissioned by Frederick III should be thought of as a sort of frieze of six holy figures on a gilded background. Actually, uh, this, uh, all these works give a few hints of both the richness and the difficulties inherent to the research program, our room, I would like to present today. That is the question of late copies, and the transposition of techniques they sometimes imply, as shown in the copy of the St. Thomas altar piece, the evolving taste of gold and the historicity of the gilding, as shown by the Bruckmeyer altar piece, and the visualization issues for a material that is difficult to detect on usual photographs. So more broadly, our room, which stands for uh, analyse de l'or et de ses usages comme matériaux pictural, this is analysis of gold and of its uses as a painting material, is an interdisciplinary project at the heart of heritage science. It aims to study gold as a material for easel painting in Western Europe in the 16th and 17th century, a period when it is usually thought gold is no more used in artistic practices of painting. Its ambition is to gather an original corpus of artwork uh, and to analyze it from a threefold perspective, historical, technical, and optical. It involves some uh, 25 people, historians, historians of art, historians of science, curators, conservators, chemists, physicists, a documentalist, and a data scientist. Together, we want to inquire how the study of matter, uh, which means gold here, techniques and material productions can contribute to the historical understanding of artworks and how to look at paintings, sometimes otherwise well-known, in a new way by considering the specific gloss of gold and the importance of the lighting. It has started one year ago and has just been funded by the French National Research Agency for another three years. So it is still in progress, and some work packages are about to start. Consequently, I'm not able here to present definitive results, uh, but I will mainly present the program and a few examples. So let me say a few words. Uh, on the historical context of the use of gold as a painting material. In early modern times, gold was still widely used in post-Byzantine painting 
as well as across the Iberian Empire, for instance, in the religious paintings created in the Catholic vice Viceroyalty of Peru. On the contrary, Western European painters began to massively leave behind this material in the 15th century. This, time was a ta this was a time when the perspectivist and illusionist quest was beginning. Strikingly, gold grounds gradually disappeared. However, many gilded elements persisted in painting even from the 16th century. This is evidenced by some paintings uh, of such famous artists as Raphael Durer in the 16th century and even Rembrandt and Vermeer in the 17th century, as you can see here. But uh, probably because it was condemned as old-fashioned, as soon as the 15th century by influent art theoreticians like Alberti and later Vasari, art historians have usually been blind to the use of gold in paintings from 16th and 17th century. Physical chemists studying those artworks poorly consider it. When they mention the use of gold, they seldom do any in-depth study or offer any overview. Far more attention is generally devoted to pigments in respect to the way painters have elabor uh, elaborated perspective or chiaroscuro effects, for instance. These approaches have a, ma a major drawback in that they do not do justice to crucial societal and historical phenomena. There are many unanswered questions to, that deserve attention. Who and why did use, as a painter, and love, as a patron or buyer, gold in paintings? How, given its ability to convey iconic abstraction rather than pictorial death, can we explain that this material is still adopted in the workshops of some of the most innovative painters? Um, innovative painters that are strongly attached to uh, mimesis. How do they cope with? How to interpret it at time in terms of symbolic, decorative, semiotic significance? Which strategies of display and lighting were used to take advantage of the specific gloss of the metallic material? And what about the place of the spectator? Our room aims precisely at answering such questions for Western European art. These issues are all the more pressing at the period under review, as the period under review, sorry, uh, is one of varied and changing economic, social, and, and cultural context, and particularly artistic context. Indeed, a series of backgrounds impact the uses of gold, painting practices, for instance, evolve with the diversification of the pictorial genres, the, de the generalization of oil as a binding medium throughout Europe, and the diversification of the supports, uh, wood, canvas, copper, stone. Colors are increasingly thought of in their hue dimensions, even if until uh, Newton, they are still explained on the lightness scale, and furthermore, since precious materials circulate more and more in 16th century, gold is increasingly visible by Europeans, but it also haunts their minds through quests such as the Eldorado. Finally, the Reformation century also witnessed uh, a clash of theological points of view on the legitimacy of its use in sacred images. So here I would like to present the different work packages of the project and several related examples. Those uh, work packages are uh, first the, the search for the corpus and specific art historical questions, the historical materials and gilding techniques, the diachronic study of the appearance of gilding and the data management. Uh, the first work package aims to identify the corpus of images with major European public collections, but also to gather all the documentation, uh, that is sources and secondary literature. 
And this documentation will uh, be searched in order to apply the fundamental methods of art history to study this corpus. The historiography of the use of gold in Western European painting has focused mainly on the study of religious paintings with gold grounds from the Middle Ages until the 15th century and on their symbolic or decorative significance. Most of these studies focus on the disappearance of gold grounds and the reasons for this disuse during the 15th century. If only one among numerous art historical questions, this topic of gold grounds is one of the issues of uh, this first war package. For instance, what can be said about the use of gold grounds by painters in the German-speaking countries in the early 16th century? That's one example I would like to speak of here. I have shown elsewhere that dozens, perhaps hundreds, of preserved works are involved. Works from the whole range of religious commissions can be, can be found. Large altar pieces, which with only painting panels, such as uh, this patient triptych by the Nordlingen artist Hans Schäufelein. But there are also altar pieces with sets of smaller panels, such as this holy kinship by Bernard Striegel, the leading Memmingen artist, also employed by Emperor Maximilian in the early 16th century. There are individual panels of any dimensions, which may have been used as altar pieces or as part of larger ensembles, such as this scene of the wedding at Cana, which was probably produced in central Franconia or northern Swabia. The diversity of artists, uh, personalities, or generations is great too. As far as, as patrons are concerned, those, are known, uh, those that are known exhibit a variety of profiles that seem to correspond to the whole of the usual spectrum, or at least to its more affluent segment. Rich and powerful burghers, territorial princes, such as the Elector of Saxony, Frederick III, I have already mentioned, but also ecclesiastical patrons. And geographically, this production and order extends over a large part of present-day Germany. My colleague from Burbeck College London, Robert Manura, showed even last year during a symposium that indeed all Latin Christian Europe was concerned. As far as German countries are concerned, examples are numerous until the beginning of the 1520s before disappearing. Could this be a change in taste or the effects on pictorial production of the spread of the Reformation in the cities and princely states of the Holy Roman Empire? The, lacquer, the latter could not explain everything since a significant number of territories in this region remain Catholic. The investigation will therefore have to be continued. This corpus, with its diversity in terms of format, use, um, uh, themes, artistic focus, generations of artists and types of uh, patrons, suggests that the taste for, uh, gold uh, for gold grounds was still very much alive in German-speaking countries at that time. Uh, to emphasize this, I would like to focus on two elements. On the one hand, the personality of Frederick III, Elector of Saxony, between uh, 1486 and 1525, may be exceptional. Uh, his personality may be exceptional, but his personality is particularly interesting to understand uh, the kind of uh, patron who commissioned such works. As soon as uh, this man uh, became elector, he sought to transform the city of Wittenberg into a capital worthy of a prince of his rank. From 1490 onwards, he had a palace rebuilt and a chapel built from uh, 1496 onwards. He was a great collector of relics and commissioned gold and silver reliquaries. 
His taste for the arts was also evident in the field of painting. He commissioned works from Albert Dürer from the late 1490s and had him paint this portrait on the left. It, uh, in a kind of competition with other courts, especially the imperial court, he employed the artist Jacopo de Barbari, who had been employed as a court painter by Maximilian, the emperor, since 1500. And he employed uh, him as a court painter from 1503 uh, onwards. In 1504, he, he engaged the services of Lucas Cranach, then a prominent young painter who had spent several years in Vienna. In 1505, he may have commissioned the Yabar altarpiece, uh, the panels of which have gold grounds. He, recently, uh, he certainly engaged the services of another great name of the period, Hans Burkmeier, for the Sigismund Sebastian altar piece uh, that I have already presented. The holy figures depicted, uh, some of whom are patron saints against the plague, have allowed historians to interpret the altar piece in the context of the waves of plague that were sweeping through Europe at the time. Heinrich Dormeyer has even interpreted the use of gold ground as a reference to some healing powers of gold. To summarize, Frederick III in the 1490s sought out the most prominent artists of the new generation to produce artworks. Among these paintings, some included gold grounds, and surely the taste of such a patron should be taken seriously. On the other hand, it has been acknowledged that some written discourses of artists from the Italian peninsula despised the, the use of gold as irrelevant, such as the architect Alberti in the 15th century, or old-fashioned as the painter Vasari in the 16th century. Nevertheless, we must undoubtedly take seriously the visual discourses and the image that painters liked to give of themselves in the empire. Representations of St. Luke's drawing or painting the Virgin were often a, mean, uh, for, uh, a means for artists to present themselves in a self-portrait, or at least to promote their own profession. So I have... Um, two such representations are of interest, here, because they show St. Luke painting the Virgin on a gilded background. The work of Hans Traut on the left, a painter active is in Nuremberg at the turn of the 16th century, and the later one by Niklaus Manuel Deutsch, a painter in Bern who just, uh, just before the city's transition to the Reformation. Each belonged to a publicly exhibited art art piece. In Deutsch's work, St. Luke has his foot on um, a sheet of paper bearing the painter's initials. Um, sorry. Um, uh, 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 and this is a clear indication that the painter recognizes himself in the figure being painted. Of course, there are significant differences between the two pictures. Um, the most notable being that Deutsch depicts Luke as having a vision of the Virgin Mary. The latter is present in the picture only in the form of uh, golden rays arriving at the top left. <laughs> In this sense, the, golden, the, the gold background uh, probably has a symbolic meaning here. But Traut and Deutsch could have, could have been content only to show St. Luke drawing the Virgin, as many of their colleagues did in the 15th and 16th centuries. Here, the use of a golden back, uh, of a gold ground probably also refers to the status of the painter his ability to handle precious materials and his complete expertise, uh, the handling of gold leaf being in itself a very delicate operation. 
Uh, let's talk about the second work package. Uh, if uh, the first one is devoted to specific art historical approaches for its part, work package two is devoted to historical materials and gilding techniques. It aims at enriching the knowledge on the history of gilding techniques in painted works of art of the 16th and 17th centuries. A number of those techniques have long been well known to conservators, conservation scientists, and art historians. The basic material, gold leaf, was obtained from the gold beater, probably most often directly from gold coins, as this is the easiest source and of the highest grade of gold. Uh, three main techniques could then be used by painter in the Renaissance. The first one is the water-based technique of which gilding on a bowl uh, very fine red clay was probably the most common. The sheets uh, thus laid down could then be burnished, uh, that is, smoothed, to give a solid gold appearance. A second technique, oleo resinous this time, also known as mordant gilding technique, consists of laying a generally even thinner gold leaf on an oil-based binder. Here, burnishing is impossible, and the final appearance of the gilding is more matte. And finally, the shell gold technique made it possible to obtain a golden paint, which could be used directly with a brush or a feather. Also, also conservators sometimes find it difficult to distinguish it from the use of modern gilding. It was primarily used to achieve fine details. Uh, work package uh, two, we imply an interdisciplinary research on technical sources of art, archives of museum laboratories, uh, that is analysis reports or restoration reports, for instance. And this will imply also a series of analytical research campaigns on a limited and duly selected corpus. So the aim is twofold, uh, to get an idea of the diversification of gilding techniques over time, for instance, the adaptation to new supports as canvas, copper, or stone, and to get an idea of uh, their distribution on the main European centers of artistic creation. Uh, the synthesis of the analysis of the laboratory archives and of the conclusions of the experiments carried out on the artwork will make it possible to carry out a classification of the gildings of this period and to draw up a historical cartography of the uses of the various gilding techniques in Western Europe in the 16th and 17th century. So let me take a few specific examples of actions carried out in this work package, very briefly. The first one is the research in the written sources from uh, 16th, 17th century, and furthermore, the recipe books. For instance, the French manuscript uh, 640 from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France is a thick recipe book from the end of the 16th century, originating from Toulouse in the southwest of France. This book has recently been the focus of the fascinating knowing and making project directed by Pamela Smith at Columbia University, and it has been transcribed and critically edited online. Among the numerous and diverse recipes related to all kinds of crafts, some address gold as a painting material, either for the decoration of building or furniture, but also for easel painting. It is a witness to the circulation of ideas among crafts. As far as recipes concerning easel paintings are concerned, they address a number of questions that will have to be taken in consideration for the Arum project. For instance, the surface treatment, and more specifically, the use of varnish or matte on matte gold, the preparation and application of shell gold, and the layering process to enhance surface properties, in this case, to get brownish gold. There are, there are just uh, three ideas uh, among uh, many. These themes uh, will be further elaborated by the comparison with other written contemporary sources and the input of chemical characterizations on historical materials. 
The aim will also to reenact such recipes with conservator and student conservators and make uh, mock-ups. A second kind of actions in uh, this work package uh, concerns the material evidence. Analysis will allow to witness the possible complexity of the technique. For instance, our postdoctoral fellow, Ariane Pinto, uh, has analyzed a cross-section from the mass of St. Gregory, painted in the second half from the, 16th, from the 15th century, sorry, uh, by an anonymous Westphalian painter. She has shown that the technique here is actually hybrid, mixing an old mordant with clay. All the same, we'll probably find most of the time just usual techniques, but the aim is to get a wide overview of the, of, uh, at a European scale. The idea is to achieve a cartography of gilding practices. It seems to me that uh, the interdisciplinarity between art historical approaches and physico-chemical approaches revolves here partly around the discussion of the choice uh, on the corpus to be analyzed. Indeed, as the possibilities to analyze artworks are not infinite, because of the access uh, given by museum curators is most of the time restricted due, due to a lack of disponibility of museum registrar, but also due to the time it takes to make uh, the analysis. Um, a, a drastic selection has to be made. Should we then uh, choose paintings exhibiting standard techniques and leave exceptional ones? Indeed, we chose to study both, even if this means less artworks from each category. Why? We want to understand what were the usual practices of gilding, but also we want to understand what were the extent of the scope of possibilities. This means we are just as interested in exceptional practices as the use of gold as a painting material on a painting of stone. Uh, you can see here, for instance, a double-sided oil on alabaster created at Ambras Castle and showing the fall of Phaeton by the Mannerist painter Hans von Aachen. On this work, on, on this artwork, that was made for a cabinet of curiosities. The artist has used gold, probably shell gold in particular, to reinforce the preciousness of the object. Um, the objective of uh, the third uh, work package is the diachronic study of the display and visual appearance of gold in paintings. Gold is distinguished from usual non-metallic materials by its strong propensity to reflect light. Thus, the relationship between gold and light is fundamental through the question of display, the place of the spectator, and lighting. When the archives uh, and the documentation allow it, uh, we will try to reconstitute the special context of the exhibition of the works and the luminous atmosphere at the time of their creation. Let me take a historical example, the Isenheim altarpiece by uh, Matthias Grunewald, created near the city of Colmar, today in France, in the 1510s, uh, for a convent of Antonite monks that hosted both pilgrims going to Compostela and people suffering from the heavy disease called ergotism. <coughs> As other Germanic Renaissance altarpiece, it is a big altarpiece with uh, several painted wings. The painted, the painted uh, scenes are based on Christological iconography and the life on, of St. Anthony, the convent's patron saint. The central sculpted group shows the gilded figure of St. Anthony and other saints. The different wings were opened in relationship with the liturgical calendar. During uh, casual days, the altarpiece appeared closed, and during Christian celebrations, it was opened the first time. Finally, during the celebration days of the saints of the convent, it appeared completely opened. 
Is there any gold of uh, the painting panels? Uh, and the rest, the answer is yes, a lot of it. Uh, when the altar piece is closed, gold appears in a ring held by angels above St. Sebastian, an element for which, to my knowledge, no interpretation key has yet been proposed. In the first opening, gold appears in most of the panels as ornaments of, on the figures, as architectural uh, decoration, Uh, in the columns of the small temple of the angels' concert, uh, not forgetting the frame. Finally, the gold sparkles bright brightly when the altar piece is completely open, thanks to the hull of the case, the predella and the frame. For most of the liturgical season, the gold does not appear in the altar piece, but above it in the extraordinary uh, set uh, carved uh, in the extraordinary set of carved and gilding canopies and pinnacles. The latter no longer exists, but the testimony of two revolutionary commissioners in 1794 is known, and I would like to quote them. There is no monument more worthy of attention than the structure of this altar, which is a production of the chisel of the same Albert Dürer, it was at the time when uh, the altar piece was considered to be a piece by Albert Dürer and Grunewald, and which is still standing in the church of the Antonites in Isenheim. Nothing could be more elegant in the Gothic taste. The architectural ornaments uh, which decorate the altar and which consist of gilded wood imitate so much the cast metal that it seems to, all, uh, to have all the lightness of which is susceptible. Um, so let me do uh, briefly, uh, before concluding, uh, some remarks about the lighting, since the vision of the altar piece and the effects of the gilding were determined by the ambient light, a light that was not... Uh, um, a light that was not necessarily the same as the one that allows us to see the altar piece today. The influence of natural light poses the problem of how the altar piece should be placed in the choir of uh, the uh, Church of the Antonites, but also the question of the stained glass windows and their color. For the most part, however, artificial lighting was required. Not only at night, when uh, certain offices were held, also, for example, on, on days, or at times when there was little light outside, especially in winter. As the historian Catherine Vincent has shown in churches of this period, the core uh, era seems to have been the place of a high concentration of lights for both practical and symbolic reasons. The lights, which included oil lamp or wax candle devices, were present as sconces on the core pillars, sometimes also in the form of mobile devices carrying condors and surrounding the core. Finally, condors were often placed on or around the altar, the burn marks uh, found on the predella just a few years ago, here and uh, there. Um, during the restoration of the altar piece suggests such a device lighting the altar piece from below. Together with the other lights and their flickering flames, the whole thing must have given a certain glowing effect uh, to all the gilding. Uh, so this uh, third uh, work package will also, of course, involve physicists and use optical tools and I will try to link the optical properties of reflectance um, of, dif of the different gilding techniques to the measurable parameters of appearance, that is color and gloss. 
so I, I leave uh, the, the Espadon uh, presentation to Vincent, which uh, Vincent Detal, who will talk about it uh, this afternoon. Uh, this uh, slide was just to see that uh, the, the data in the project will be managed in accordance with uh, the Espadon project. And uh, to conclude, I would like to thank uh, for uh, Worley for my colleagues. Uh, of the, uh, this interdisciplinary team, and most particularly the postdoctoral fellows that have worked or are working on the project, Valentina Ristova, Alice Otadzi, and Ariane Pinto. And I thank you very much for, for your attention. <laughs> This is meant to be an open discussion session. We have the speakers here with us, and we would like to take questions from the audience. Um, you heard both papers. Uh, these are art historians who now also get interested in techni the technical aspects, uh, a field that is new to art history and not everywhere uh, available, so to speak. Uh, but one of the questions would be how much has this new technology enriched uh, your art historical research? Do you feel it's threatening your art historical? <laughs> or is it enriching it? You know, so that would be a question perhaps for you to answer. Anyone? Oh, okay, there's a question from the floor. Afterwards you can answer that <laughs> broader one. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, <coughs> your presentation and very <coughs> clear and interesting. Uh, I, I have a question about um, general view, in fact. Uh, for you, what is the limitation of the generali generali generalization of this kind of approach in art history? I guess the question is to both of us. Yes. <laughs> Anyone who wants to answer, it's up to you. Well, I think that it is, it is impossible to, to do proper art history without studying the materiality of artworks. Um, so it is, it is, we need to develop um, consciousness as art I'm speaking as art historian now, um, about the importance of the technical uh, aspects of art history. Otherwise, we can't really understand the, the artworks. And I also think that our, uh, art, the art historical eye can and should get trained in looking uh, at the materiality of the works. And it can't get trained. To me, it was a, really a revelation when I after the work, the, the work I presented to you on Angelos, um, I started seeing things with naked eye, without the, the stereo micros microscope, which are there, but I, I couldn't identify the information that is visible beforehand. So it's, it's also a training um, uh, activity <laughs> for art historians. But also it is vice versa, because I have to say that I've read a lot of technical um, um, articles and publications which to me, I'm afraid I should say, are uh, almost meaningless because they do not have a historical question behind them. So it's, it, it runs both ways. <coughs> to me this is perhaps the most important uh, thing we should keep in mind if we wish to move forward in a more meaningful way. Um, perhaps I, I For, for, for um, to start, um, how did it enrich my research? At the very beginning, uh, this project was uh, 
personal project, uh, so only art historical uh, project, and I very quickly, in a few weeks, um, uh, acknowledged that uh, it, uh, well, uh, I, I would not uh, uh, enlarge so much uh, the knowledge about that subject if I uh, uh, had not um, uh, the, the, the contribution of uh, both uh, physical chemists and uh, physicists uh, to examine the, the, um, the whole aspect. Uh, so this was really fundamental. I very quickly uh, gathered a team to uh, um, to inquire on, uh, on that subject uh, and the, qu the question of the um, uh, assessment, uh, the, the certification of uh, what we can see in the artwork is uh, definitely uh, uh, fundamental. Uh, and f for as far as uh, limitations are concerned, um, at the moment, perhaps I, I will say uh, something uh, more uh, in two years or three years' time, but at the moment I, I can't see um, theoretical limitations, but uh, uh, as far as practical limitations um, uh, are concerned, of course uh, there are, but there are the same kind of uh, practical limitations uh, that we know in uh, historical sciences. Uh, in the historical sciences, we are uh, limited by uh, what uh, stays uh, today. Uh, so the, the nature of the archives, uh, what uh, artworks have been uh, preserved, and we know that lots of them have, been, uh, have disappeared. And uh, as far as uh, material limitations uh, for, this, um, for the other parts, so, uh, technical parts are concerned, uh, those are, uh, well, I, I, in, in an ideal um, world, I would like to uh, be able to get analysis on everything uh, in my corpus, but it takes uh, time, and we uh, have difficulties to get to the collections uh, sometimes, uh, not because the, the curators are um, uh, not, uh, willing, but just because uh, time is missing for everybody. So this is the, the principal limitation. So perhaps uh, a name for a, a physical chemist uh, working in instrument, instrumentation would be to uh, develop uh, tools that make uh, this kind of research much quicker. <laughs> and, and if I may add, also the, the, the non-destructive uh, methods are certainly um, those that um, help us, uh, you know, um, overcome limitations uh, in many respects. Because first of all, it's not just, uh, as I mentioned, with in, our, in the case of icons with monasteries and churches where things are really almost impossible to, 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 um, to take samples and to do destructive um, analysis, but also uh, it's less time consuming and museums have, uh, are always reluctant to give access to uh, cross section so it's, it's really the way, to, the way forward. Do we have any other questions? Yes. I'm going to say something. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Professor Dandaki. Um, you mentioned the studies in the 1980s were pioneering now that it's a slightly more established methodology to, to use scientific techniques to interrogate objects. As an art historian, in addition to attribution and workshop practices questions, are there new questions that you have that are enabled by this technical knowledge? What are they? A if you can share an example. They're endless. <laughs> Uh, for example, um, pigments, the circulation of pigments, the value of pigments, um, how pigments are being used and what color palette uh, they produce uh, in different workshops and different areas of production, how um, techniques circulate and the exchange of, um, uh, of ideas and uh, solutions. Um, Wood, what else? The, the, the identification of wood which is extremely uh, important. We can understand so many things about uh, uh, the value of um, of artworks or their uh, their origins. Um, 
I have an example in mind, which is very well known, a, a, a brilliant altarpiece in, in Boston, which is made by a um, Cretan painter for um, the Hospitaller um, uh, Knights. We thought it was made in Crete, yet the identification of the wood pointed to Veneto, because it's a different kind of wood that was not in use in Crete, so it's a completely different story. So, I mean, truly, the, 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 the questions are endless. And they should be there to, before we begin um, analyzing and identif identifying the, the materials. So basically, you know, we are getting more information from all kinds of media directions, uh, materials, and so on. So as art historians, we're going to be much more knowledgeable about the work of art than just know the iconography or, you know, the. Uh, material that it was used originally, you know. If, when I remember when I was trying to write my dissertation, which was on uh, carved uh, steatite, it's a stone, soft stone, uh, small icons. But at that time, I needed to put the whole thing in a kind of chronology that existed all over. All kinds of museums had pieces, but they were not really identified precisely when they were made. So one means that the art historians had to sort of categorize and organize this material was to look at style, right? That was one way to, and style had its ups and downs through the centuries, you know, sometimes it was very good, but sometimes it was very low quality, you know, whatever the idea was about what style was. And I hated this idea to have to do this because I thought that was not quite precise, it was too subjective. We had no information about what, how people carved, nothing of that. So uh, I have to say that I tried not to use the word style at all. It's a whole catalog. I have huge, you know, 200 and something pieces. But to talk about um, carving technique or things like that, it started to be more scientific than I wished I had the knowledge of what we have now in the sciences to be able to discuss the material because if you compare ivories and steatites, the ivories, the steatite is easier to carve, for example, than ivory. And you know, you have to be very careful with ivory. You have to learn the veins of the, the bone, you know, of the tooth, sorry. Uh, so these are all kinds of things that nowadays we can be much more precise and can date things without having to go through these stylistic discussions. <laughs> Oh, my dear. That was a parenthesis, but I thought it's sort of relevant because I was fighting with this old traditional way of uh, dating things. Yes? Um, it's uh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question related to the style, as you said, to Dr. Kandagi. You. Um, was there any pigment analysis on San Panurio's icons? So, because I know that, as far as I know, they, they had their own palettes, each painter, each. So, yeah. The pigments didn't uh, make any differences. Actually, the, um, uh, for the most part, Cretan painters of this period have a rather restricted um, palette. I should say a few pigments from which they could produce many shades, many color tones. So the actual identification of the pigments didn't say much as, um, as to the painter, to the attribution. But it was the way, the brush strokes, the way uh, the artist used his, his uh, materials that made the difference. Thank you, and I have another question. You, I'm sorry if I missed it. You mentioned something about the healing power of gold, and I, I missed the relation between that and the. No, I guess I was, so myself. I haven't researched uh, this theme, but uh, uh, it's uh, Heinrich Dormeyer, a, a German historian, who uh, um, uh, wrote um, an article about uh, this uh, Bokmeyer altarpiece, and who interpreted. Uh, the, the use of gold in terms of uh, um, uh, belief at, uh, at the time about uh, God. But I, uh, this is one of the 
small, uh, small topics I have to inquire uh, more profoundly. Sure, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Drandagi, I liked how you were just talking about different ways of seeing that the scientific methods um, allow us, and I think that resonates with what Professor Calavarezu was saying about technique and, and instead of style. For me, I understand like this scientific uh, methodologies to like really to be technical. They provide you a different way and an artistic, a te technical way of, of, of looking at things. So I guess my question is, um, you also mentioned Professor Dandagi at some point, I think, about like um, the, the scientific and the art historical proceeding along parallel paths and not intertwined. So one w thing I, I could understand you guys saying is that the, the scientific provides us different technical methods for enriching our art historical knowledge. So we're still driven primarily by historical questions and we just have more information from the technical side. Um, I, I'm, wonder, I'm just wondering if, 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 it's, if it's, no, I, 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 it's a genuine question whether the kind of knowledge we produce is, is and the direction of inquiry is affected by the scientific approach to cultural heritage or if it just provides us a broader range of information for the same uh, questions. I think it's both, in a way. Um, <coughs> My main issue here is that we, we don't work together enough and not in depth. Uh, in museums, for example, analysis are mostly um, used for conservation, how to, you know, how to identify what's there and decide how to treat the object and then restore it and put it on display. But this is just the, the, the surface in a way, <laughs> in service. You know, this is just um, the first step. Uh, and unless you put forward the question, analysis cannot give results. Yeah, they, they cannot proceed. It's, and on the other hand, um, technical analysis cannot solve our art historical issues, for certain. You cannot make, you, you cannot um, become a good art historian just by having in your hands uh, good analysis. That's not it. It's just a, a, a different, very valuable set of data, of information, produced by the very materiality of the objects. And at the same time, to me, this is also very important, these analyses give new meaning to the, story, to the sources. The sources are such that by themselves are again with limited use unless we have next to them, the materiality, the, the analysis of the, of the objects themselves. And this is what projects like yours do, in fact. This is, this is what we're trying to, to do. But the question of why was it popular, the gold, suddenly, you know, uh, that is not technically <laughs> uh, solvable. So this is the social question at this point. So you have to combine this information both ways. May, may I say, ask something about this question? Um, I had this idea, but we know that in the second half of the 15th century, especially towards the, the end of the 15th century, Cretan icons, we know about Cretan icons because we have the, we have the archives, that's why we know a lot about it, were uh, really <coughs> flooded European market and it was partly because Byzantium had fallen, I mean the Christian Empire had fallen to the Ottomans, so it was also an ideological issue, this appreciation of Byzantine or Byzantinizing art. Could it be possible to see um, this predilection for gold leaf, especially at this period, as a, an, um, a result of this new or renewed appreciation to anything Byzantine? And icons was very much a um, um, let's say, it, uh, uh, the symbol uh, of, of, of Byzantine arts. I don't know. At, at what period? Of the uh, uh, second, uh, end of 15th century, around uh, 1500, which I think coincides with this, um, in your works, with, with this uh, preference for Greek, for gold leaf. Am I, am I wrong about it? Uh, actually, well, the, the, the doxa is that, uh, on the contrary, uh, gold is uh, less and less used uh, from the mid 15th century onward. So the, the, all the artworks I've uh, shown actually in the German speaking countries um, 
are a kind of, uh, uh, well, are, are still um, uh, produced, but uh, generally speaking in Europe, uh, it's, uh, well, or at least in, in some, uh, in some artistic centers, uh, the production is really decreasing a lot. Um. Okay, we're minute. going to take one more question and then we have to move because we have two more papers to listen to. That's <laughs> okay. a big burden now to ask a clever question, which is not. I wanted to ask Roman about uh, if we know anything about the, if there was a trade in, in these gold leaves. How they circulate? Uh, sorry, uh, what? Trade. If there was a trade, a trade yeah. in gold leaves and how they circulated, <coughs> and if there was any recycling. Uh, actually, uh, um, uh, as far as uh, studies have been conducted on this uh, topic, uh, gold was directly um, obtained from uh, uh, beating uh, gold coins. Uh, so, uh, because it was the easiest source of uh, to get gold uh, at that time, uh, and um, some, uh, well, generally speaking, also the, the purest uh, material. And one uh, coin that was particularly appreciated was the fluorine, uh, which appeared in the uh, 13th century because uh, its uh, uh, the, the uh, proportion of gold was very high. It's uh, 23 in 74, uh, 75 carats, so nearly pure gold. Um, but uh, one of the issues we are wanting to examine is uh, just uh, that topic, so the, the proportion of gold and other alloys, uh, to inquire what kind of uh, um, coin uh, of currency uh, the gold leaf could have been uh, beaten off. In, in Spain, it appears that uh, in some artistic centers, it's not fluorine that is used, but local. Uh, Currency, so it's uh, but uh, there there is only partial information at this moment, and we would like to. Um, if it will the gold from the South America. When did that start to influence? You know, because they get a lot of gold that they find there, in Mexico yeah, and other places. But it's, it, 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 it's we don't the need an answer now. No, you know, no, no, it was it, just a thought. It's the just second the half of the 16th century. Yes, yes. Uh, not yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you both very much, and we're going to move to our second session right now. works of art in the 21st century. And uh, our first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Francesca Casadio, who is the founder of the Scientific Research Laboratory at the Art Institute of Chicago, and currently holds the post of Associate Vice President and Granger Executive Director of Conservation and Science. She is also the founding member and co-director of Northwestern University in cooperation also with the Art Institute of Chicago uh, for scientific studies in the arts. She received her PhD and master's degrees in chemistry from the University of Milan. And in um, 2006, for example, she was the recipient of the L'Oréal Art in science of color silver prize, which is quite an exceptional different kind of uh, prize. She also, though, uh, was awarded in 2019 an honorary doctorate from the Sorbonne University in Paris. So um, the paper uh, is, uh, has the title Non-Invasive Techniques of Point Analysis and Imaging Applications in modern and contemporary art from the Art Institute in Chicago. And I have my timer, so we'll try to stay on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll try, obviously from America, but as I have, although thank you for the kind introduction, our chairwoman, and thank you, Michelle, Menu, and colleagues from the um, center for the kind invitation. I've slightly changed my title to really reflect on intersection of art and science and how scientific investigations can inform new paths in art history and also in conservation. And I had just, uh, I wasn't expecting the really generous and long introduction and I had a little bit of the origin story which is I was trained as a chemist and worked mostly on sculpture and wall paintings. You may know this one sculpture which was the last work I worked on when I was in Italy and I've been now for 20 years <laughs> at the at the Art Institute of Chicago, <laughs> which was founded as a school of fine arts and a museum in 1893. Um, and uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the collection, hosts a global collection from antiquity to present day, uh, and uh, has a very active exhibition program, and is a what we call yes a global. In the past, we used the term encyclopedic, but it's no longer in fashion uh, collection. Um, the application of scientific tools to the, to the study of uh, our art and archaeology in the States was born mostly in museums. And so the Art Institute follows in a tradition that started at Harvard at the Fogg um, Art Museum in 1928. So it's a fairly um, a recent tradition. At the Art Institute, the first conservator was uh, established in 1956 to, to work on paintings. And today, I am privileged to oversee a group of about 35 specialists in both art uh, conservation and scientific research. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a sort of exploded view of our painting studio, for example, and also a little bit of a sense of the lines of research that my colleagues in the department are um, developing, and you see them here on modern paints and early cellulose-based uh, plastics imaging, which of course we've talked here, and also most recently proteomics and gamma analysis in, in the investigation of works of art. So it's a combination of both applied studies on the collection and also trying to push research. And in this respect, it's also very important, this collaboration that has been invoked with Northwestern University, and to me, I see a parallel <coughs> with Stark. Clearly, the collaboration with innovation in the sciences is incredibly, in, incredibly important, because at the museum, we have a lot of objects in search of an application. And I'm sure that you um, will be pleased here to know that two, my co-director and the senior scientists at NU Access are of Greek uh, nationality. Um, and the two points of the, of the collaborations are really to allow access to heritage science to institutions that don't have uh, scientists on staff. So again, this idea of the mobile lab and leveraging instrumentation. Uh, and also, and these are some of the areas in which uh, we, we operate. Uh, but also um, really partner with uh, faculty at the university in material science, computer science, the humanities to um, develop new tools that can be used to investigate art. And at the, uh, coming back to the Art Institute at the museum, it's really an ecosystem where the research informs not only the treatment, but also the exhibition program and the collection, the care of the collection, and also everything we do is disseminated to the public and to scholars as well. And so uh, it was evoked before, how can we make this information also more digitally available? We have a, a very rich uh, program of digital scholarly catalogs where anybody can access also layered images and cross sections and so on and so forth. That of course, because the strength of the collection uh, was uh, founded on 19th century French Art is very heavily skewed in this area and hopefully uh, they're developing in the future. And this, um, this knowledge not only again informs scholarship but also is brought in the galleries. So I have a little bit of a search of panorama of exhibitions where the science is actually brought into the art galleries to uh, be shared with the public and uh, most recently with an exhibition on Cezanne that is now um, at the Tate, uh, where this aspects of materialities, techniques are really discussed and, and uh, these new discoveries are shared. 
And in some cases, special exhibitions that we can have at the university, this is a case of uh, an exhibition of mummy portraits where actually it became a student project. The students designed an augmented reality where you could use um, a tablet and uh, visualize a CT scan that was obtained at a synchrotron lab in Chicago on a mummy that was on display. So it sort of comes uh, full circle. And so with I've been asked in coming here to reflect on the intersections of science and art and certainly these imaging techniques that have been evoked many times and analytical techniques are extremely helpful in that respect. Um, here we add to the 19th century technology of the X-ray which uh, very interestingly as soon as it was developed three years later it was used to analyze paintings. Um, and, uh, and we add with other imaging techniques you see here um, this is a Blue Pierre painting by Pablo Picasso that was actually painted on a painting by another artist and then with different imaging techniques we can also visualize the, the changes that the artist himself did on the composition and uh, to many of you, both the art historians and the physicists in, in the room, different energy uh, wavelengths can penetrate different layers and so uh, unlock different types of information. And this, of course, is also very interesting for the media and contributes to also diffusion of the um, understanding that there is a societal impact of science as well because of the ability of the public to relate. My colleague Giovanni Verri at the museum has been one of uh, the people that have enhanced on this tool set and, uh, for example, um, developed a technique that is called visible induced luminescence that can visualize uh, the presence of uh, Egyptian blue uh, very easily on uh, archaeological artifacts. And as it was uh, mentioned before, this is an example of an Etruscan terracotta in the collection of the Art Institute. And with a couple of imaging techniques, this is the ultraviolet induced luminescence, we can see in the pink the distribution of uh, a colorant matter uh, in there. I assume this is, nope, never mind. Um, and then with the, with the visible induced luminescence, you can see the distribution of Egyptian blue, the first synthetic pigment uh, ever uh, invented by um, humans. And while in some areas, like in the wings, it's very clear that there is blue, there are other areas, and I'm Italian, I gesticulate since I cannot find the laser pointer, where it's a little bit less uh, evident and the technique, of course, brings it out. Um, with this technique, we can read also some hieroglyphs on a sarcophagus that are obscured by additional um, uh, um, deposits, uh, or burial deposits, and then start to understand more about technique and use of this material. Material here is an Egyptian um, artwork where clearly the blue has been used as an optical brightener for the eyes. And uh, the non-invasive nature of these techniques make it so that now we can, it was thought that Egyptian blue, the, the secret of its manufacturing was lost uh, after the Middle Ages and only this is rediscovered in the 20th century. But um, colleagues in Italy and in London are starting to identify the use of this pigment in uh, 16th century works uh, Italian. And so again, we can enrich this knowledge without having to take any samples because the imaging is fairly straightforward to do. And as it's been ar argued here, I hope convincingly, why is it relevant to do this kind of studies where we can argue that this aspect of material iconography, artists could achieve what technologies and materials available at the time uh, allow them. And so I've seen yesterday here in the Archaeological Museum some beautiful uh, examples of use of ochre and, and grinding of ochre. And this is the kind of things that the prehistoric um, humans could achieve in art. And then the 19th century, the explosion of the chemical industry and the introduction of many new pigments. And these are uh, other things that artists, this is a palette by uh, Camille Pissarro in the collection of the Orsay that they could achieve with these uh, new pigments and materials. 
And within our collection, we use these techniques systematically to learn more about artistic production. One would think that everything is known already about Impressionism and the way that they produce work. The Art Institute is fortunate to have uh, six of Monet's haystack, about uh, um, 27 of them that were produced. And uh, uh, I'll bring this example, which is actually something really interesting, a winter scene. If you look at the x-ray, you start seeing that there are, in fact, other haystacks that were uh, painted originally. And this is reminiscence of a summer scene in, in another composition that we have at the museum. And in fact, by looking closely, in the lower right corner, there is actually a fragment of, of uh, hay that is embedded in the, in the, um, in the painting. And at the bottom, you can see evidence of the fact that the fresh paint was actually engaged in an easel, and so evidence of reworking. So we think of Impressionism a la prima, the impression of the weather, etc. This was clearly a summer scene that he kept in the studio, decided to rework, and became a winter scene. Um, so this is something that, in fact, in many of the of the compositions that we have studied has, has emerged. And this is with simple techniques that are not particularly advanced. Fast forward this exhibition of Cezanne, we've been able to augment this tool set with more um, imaging and um, scanning techniques. Here you see a macro XRF scanner that has been developed by my colleagues at, uh, at Northwestern. Uh, and with this uh, particular composition, the base of tulip, you can appreciate in the lower left corner how there were more uh, fruits there, and in fact also microscopic uh, examination of just the base of the base shows some remnants of that orange paint over there, but adding um, imaging techniques like infrared false color, or you see at the base the mapping of the pigments used, we can start to appreciate that, for example, even the background that looks just modulation of uh, a turquoise color is obtained, and you can see it very easily in the imaging, uh, with the color that shows uh, pink is ultramarine blue, and the color that shows uh, on the blue is a cobalt base. Um, cobalt blue that you see there also very well mapped in the cobalt. Um, and clearly also the imaging techniques have the value that because the data is embedded in the image, they're really wonderful tools to engage with art historians and other disciplines as opposed to maybe graphs like the visible spectra that are a little bit uh, less conducive to that collaboration. Um, an interesting uh, example of these applications where we actually collaborated with Michel Menou um, is Van Gogh's bedroom. Uh, there are three versions of the bedroom. One is in Chicago, one is at the Orsay, one is the Van Gogh Museum. And there we find an echo of what's been presented before. Um, he wrote extensively about his material, so we have an opportunity to compare the archival sources with actually using the objects are, as evidence and interrogating those. Um, and uh, you can see here, just for a moment, the XRF scanner in action. So it's a way of basically creating an X-ray in color. And this also gives us an opportunity to then compare um, style and use of pigments as it was evoked in the um, uh, um, presentation about the icons, and in a few seconds you'll see that, for example, what looks green in Amsterdam and Chicago was obtained with emerald green in the Amsterdam picture that comes one year before the Chicago pic picture, and in uh, Viridian with the, somehow the video stopped, but you get the sense. Sometimes even with this uh, techniques that, um, that identify the inorganics, we can get a sense of how the colors have changed and altered. And this is another Van Gogh painting in uh, the museum collection. On the right you see the UV light and already the luminescence uh, gives a hint that there were some organic colorants there that have now uh, faded. And with the macro XRF we were able to map um, the presence of the element bromine that is uh, an identifier of eosine, a very bright pig, pink pigment that we know Van Gogh used, and so have a sense that those colors 
those flowers was, were much more pink originally, and you can see where the rebate of the frame protected uh, the work that we can start seeing this, this pink. Um, and again, very interesting, such a full circle with the artist's writing where he wrote to his brother Theo, all the colors that the Impressionists have made fashionable are unstable, all the ro more reasons to use them more boldly. And uh, um, so sometimes time softened them, sometimes it really erased them. And so now with digital technologies, this is uh, uh, an example from our work. Actually, on the left-hand side, it is a sample from um, the wall. And then if, we, if you flip it, you see that it's purple, and that allowed us to do a reconstruction of, on the left-hand side, the, the, the state of the painting as it is, and on the right-hand side, a digital visualization of what it might have been when uh, Van Gogh painted it. And of course, this is science infused with art history because we were literally uh, in a conference call with our colleagues from Amsterdam who were um, sharing with us how Van Gogh used um, also Japanese prints and, and dialing. We don't know, we still cannot know to the state of knowledge of today. We can know what the pigment here is. Here we analyze it with surface enhanced Raman scattering, but we will never know how much the art is used since for the most part mm -hmm. it's gone. So the exact hue is still a little bit of interpretation even if it's grounded in the science. And this, of course, for anybody that looks at 19th century art is this degradation and color alteration of pigment is something very real. Uh, this is another uh, very famous painting in our collection where it's the yellow that actually degraded and went from a bright yellow to an ochre color. Certainly we um, know now, thanks to scientific analysis, this is a technique that is called electron energy loss spectroscopy or what happened to the pigment. There was uh, um, a reaction uh, that made a yellow pigment green. And again, we can uh, propose a recolorization of what the artist originally intended in addition to the mechanism of what happened chemically to that pigment and why that was. We think, in fact, that in this case it wasn't light, but it was a, a, a coal burning and wood burning stove united with the humidity of in Sora's studio that caused this change. I also want, we were reflecting about the fact that this kind of approaches have been around for quite some time, and to reflect also on what has changed now. Certainly the studies uh, have been published in exhibition catalogs, in scientific literature. What's very interesting for me as a museum professional is how even with Van Gogh, this type of analysis is now included in press releases where, for example, the Van Gogh Museum announced its sunflowers would not travel, or even influence, as we know, with kind of um, specific bands of light can accelerate the degradation to inform LED lighting of the, work, of the work of art. So it's really very heartening to also see the, uh, the impact there. Uh, and the other paradigm shift, this is clearly not a 19th century uh, example, but I thought it was fitting for this uh, symposium, is how I see the conservators working uh, in the studios. This is a, a really important painting. In fact, the Art Institute was the first museum in the United States to acquire an El Greco painting. This came in 1906 in our collection from Toledo. You see it before and after restoration. It was treated in 1913, and then again by my um, esteemed uh, former colleague, Frank Zuccari, in 2018. And you can see the tool of the trades of the conservators have not changed too much. There are some nanogels occasionally, but it's solvents and swabs. On the other end, you see on the side of the table, as Frank was cleaning the, the painting from the varnish, and you see a sample of cleaning, there is imaging that informs how much is removed and how, and, and this information is really integrated. Um, scientists and conservators work together to understand, for example, in this passage that the original appearance was not what we see, but it was a degraded smalt, for example, that caused um, also the smalt has reacted with the medium and so informed part of the treatment. 
And at the same time, because the painting, when it was removed from the altarpiece, was expanded and it was extensively overpainted, the cross sections can help. Where you see in UV light, this bright white line is actually a varnish on top of which the restoration was applied. So again, uh, this dialogue that is particularly possible in a, in a museum setting where the, you have the conservators, the art historians, and the, and the scientists working together is, is a really wonderful um, development, I think, in, in the field. And then again, this commitment of sharing this with the public, this, uh, the, whoops, the treatment, <laughs> Of, uh, of the Assumption of the Virgin has been uh, transformed into an interactive label that is in the galleries but also in the website. And about 25,000 uh, people interacted with it within a three months period and learned about both the history but also um, the, the conservation campaign. And I think this is incredibly interesting we tracked it, we measured it, and about 90% of the people actually went to the end of this three minutes interactive, and almost 100% went back and looked back at the work, which is extremely relevant because research that's been published in 2017 has measured that on average, visitors spent 17 to 21 seconds in front of a work of art. And, uh, and especially there's been research done in 2001 and again in 2017, and the time in front of the works had not changed, but the 2017 uh, authors also observed that, they, in fact, part of those 21 seconds is taking selfies. So you understand that this kind of scientific engagement can also uh, ex extend the narrative and, and promote a different kind of, of viewing. So in the last uh, couple of minutes I have uh, at my uh, disposal, I um, want to share maybe a couple of thoughts or observations about the developments that are helpful and will not be anything new that has not been touched upon already um, today. Uh, I think this opportunity to create sustained collaborations between conservators, archaeologists, scientists, uh, humanists, art historians is key so that that interaction is not superficial. And this can be, of course, obtained both uh, in cases where all these professionals work together in the same institute, but also with these mobile labs and opportunities to continue engagement with the same professionals over and over again so that we create a common way of working, of working together. In fact, this summer for the Gordon Research Conference, which is an important conference um, started in America, um, to look at um, heritage science developments. I did a survey of art historians, of conservators, uh, of scientists to search of name, the one product of, let's call it technical art history for lack of be better words, uh, <laughs> that they thought was most innovative. And repeatedly, museum catalogs have been named as some of those successful uh, opportunities and to me the key is because of this continued search of work work together and <laughs> the development of mobile labs expand that because of course equipping a lab in a, in a collection in a museum is is a very um, resource intensive both human resources and and equipment and then uh, very interestingly I think these mobile labs can also help us expand the canon of art history. Of course, we've done a lot of these studies, at least in the fine arts, uh, on artists that were considered important, white male, North American, or European artists. And so if we want to expand the canon, we, we need to bring this equipment around. Uh, and then, and we'll hear an example from my um, colleague, Jorgen Badum, uh, being able, and later on uh, with, with other projects, being able to network this knowledge. Uh, Professor Drandakis mentioned often this knowledge is lost in exhibition catalogs and specialized publication. Uh, examples such as the two that I've uh, uh, brought up here make it so that this data is available to, for mining by a variety of, of, of scholars, and so I think that it's really it's really uh, wonderful. And, and then 
I, I will say I really, we want to keep this for the specialists and yet it's super important to also share this knowledge with the public, with the public at large and this digital, digitally enhanced ways of, of sharing information are, are really key. So to quote Van Gogh again, science is an instrument that will go a very long way in the future. He was writing this to, uh, to Emile Bernard in 1888. I think it's still very, very true. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Well, our last uh, speaker in this morning uh, session is Professor Jürgen Vadium. Um, he is uh, director of the Vadium Art Technological Studies and specialty advisor of Dutch and Flemish art at the Nivogord, is that correct? <laughs> Collection <laughs> in uh, Denmark. <clears throat> Until 2020, he was director of the uh, so Center for Art Technological Studies and Conservation, a research infrastructure of the National Museum of Denmark. Um, from 1990 through 2004, he was chief conservator of the Maurits Hus, uh, Hus in The Hague, and, or Hague, I don't know. And, uh, <clears throat> He also had the position of full professor in conservation and restoration at the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Amsterdam. His title today for his talk is Facing the Unexpected Infrared Imaging of Heads by Rembrandt and his contemporaries. It's already up, so we have to put it into form here. To this. No, yeah, we have to skip to this one and go back to... Yeah, which is that, that is. one, F5. Oh, that doesn't work here, this one. No, it has to be here, down okay. here, this little thing. Okay. Okay, and the point of this here. Thank you very much for your generous introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. After this fascinating talk we just heard, this is going to be kind of a nerdy looking inwards of somebody who's been mining some of these databases. Um, it's also fascinating to be in Nicosia, again on Cyprus. I was here for the first time in 1985, and uh, now I'm here again, and that's great. Now, facing the unexpected and infrared imaging. Infrared imaging, as you know, uh, in use for the study of paintings, was established somewhere in the 1970s by Dolphin Aspen de Boer in the Netherlands, and he wrote his dissertation on this. Um, thanks to his work, and thanks to a lot of museums uh, doing infrared imaging of paintings, there is this huge resource that uh, Francesca just mentioned, the Rembrandt database. And thanks to people sharing, museum sharing, scholars sharing, we have this enormous resource of material. If you don't share, you just have a one-to-one -one -one image of a painting, and how do you know if that painting or that image is different from any others? You create an expectation that we know everything about this artist by having a few images of one art piece rather than looking at the very broad scale. I also want to emphasize that using these images uh, requires not only uh, technical skills or scientific background, no, all scientific data will have to be interpreted. And that's a, a dialogue between art history and science that is also opening up that have scientists accused the, con the art historians for always interpreting and uh, making uh, assumptions, especially since maybe the introduction of, uh, of a new art history in the 1970s, uh, when then conservation studios began making more of the technical art history studies and seeing now new art historians, and thanks we have so many of those here today, that also can appreciate the scientific study. They have become a threat to those technical art historians. So now it's really is time to, to fuse these, uh, these skills. It was looking at some of these faces of Rembrandt 
that, uh, that made me may consider that there's something here we haven't really studied thoroughly yet. Um, there is a saying here by Carl von Mander, without great trouble or skill, uh, and an artist uh, may paint directly with a brush and paint in a free approach and thus set down their paintings deftly in a dead color or sometimes re-dead color soon after. That means setting down the sketch, changing the idea, sketching a little bit again, and then applying paint that covers up and maybe re-sketch again. How do we see this happening in a painting? Because we see these multiple layers, but can we separate these? There were artists that tried to emulate this, and William Sanderson, an English author of painting materials, he described in 1658 that an imitator does never come near the first author unless excellent modern masters own working. A uh, uh, similitude over uh, uh, evermore comes short in truth, which is the things themselves, the copier being forced to accommodate himself to another man's intent. Bear this uh, quote in mind when we go through the, the next slides. This one is an old story, but I just want to briefly mention it. Two paintings uh, that were competing to be uh, the original and not the original. The painting to the right in the Marat house was thought to be the skillful young Rembrandt, a smooth painted portrait, the cornerstone of how the young Rembrandt would paint the cornerstone upon which many other attributions were made. A copy in the Nuremberg's uh, uh, Germanisches Nationalmuseum was hanging in a period room and not really counting. However, infrared imaging of the two paintings uh, clarified that there is a significant difference between the two because the Mauritshaus version has a very careful underdrawing. Look at the eye and look at that extra eye down here on the nose and there is one out here as well. This is apparently completely alien to the technique of Rembrandt. So how can the cornerstone of the young Rembrandt be uh, having an underdrawing like this? Whereas the uh, uh, infrared image of the Nuremberg painting showed, on the contrary, no underdrawing, but as well this very patchy, uh, thinly painted area in the shadow uh, part of the face contrary to the other one. Well, that opened up uh, new avenues of trying to understand the imitator or the authentic work. Two early Rembrandts, uh, you know, Rembrandt started out in Leiden. Uh, he went to Amsterdam in uh, 31, 1631-32, probably kept his studio in Leiden for some years while still working in Amsterdam as well on commissions from uh, Van Eulenburg who was an uh, art dealer, but also had a large studio of portrait painters. And these portrait painters were then uh, uh, supervised by the young, skillful painter from Leiden that came in every now and then, the Rembrandt van Rijn. And when we look at these two paintings in infrared, uh, we again see that uh, scratching in the paint, which is uh, famous for Rembrandt, but also these kind of patchy, unfinished, uh, sketchy ways, and look at the, uh, the young woman in the fantasy costume, um, not a very pretty face to look at in an infrared image, but it reveals a lot about the, the, uh, uh, the shorthand with which Rembrandt is painting. Not everything needs to be filled in, because the, the paint and the ground layer, all this will operate together and in our eyes be sufficient for us to get the image that he wants to share with us. Um, the portrait of Hase Jacobs uh, van Kleiburg from 1633 is particularly interesting. Um, there she sits with her skillfully painted eyes and with an infrared image uh, you suddenly discover, and now I point to this particular thing which has been there all the way until now, that the white in the eyes and the eyeballs are black in infrared imaging. You just saw the image with the, with the uh, 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 Egyptian blue in the white eyeballs of the, uh, the painting that you showed us, uh, Francesca. But here we have black pigment, apparently, in the white of the eyes. Now, how often does that occur in Rembrandt's paintings? Here's another one. 
the painting uh, in, in, in uh, Berlin, again, the white in the eyes appears very dark and blackish. So there is a technique here where Rembrandt wants to soften the whiteness of the paint by adding black. Maybe because that when you add black, uh, lamp black, for instance, to the white paint, you get a kind of bluishness in the, in, the, in the white paint. And as you will be able to confirm for yourself during the lunch break, looking into the eyes of your neighbor, uh, you will see that they are not at all white, actually. We all know that. But why did Rembrandt do, use this? And why is it not there in all his paintings? The majority have it, but some have not. This painting doesn't show it. It has also uh, non-spottiness in the face. Well, maybe it's an explanation that she is lit from the front, and there's no really hard shadows in this face. So that could explain why this is happening. Uh, this guy, a self-portrait again now in the Musée de Louvre, is also revealing in infrared imaging. No underdrawing, but this very splotchy, uh, loose hand of painting and the blackness in, in the eye as well. These two are hanging in Boston, uh, and uh, they're not both by everybody attributed to Rembrandt. They are on display as Rembrandt, and many scholars believe that both are, but, uh, but uh, the woman has been questioned. Uh, but you see that the, she is lit from the front, so like the former one, but he is having a more shadowy appearance, so there you see the blackness of the white in his eyes as well. <coughs> Saskia von Eilenburg, genuine painting by Rembrandt, reveals the other one I just uh, showed you, no blackness, but also illuminated right from the front and no dark shadowing over her face. Would that be an explanation? I'm still searching for an, uh, an answer to all this. Uh, especially when you compare to the eyes again of, of uh, Hashia that I showed you before, which is so utterly different in the way that it has been, been applied. Is Rembrandt having this technique in a period only, and does he then stop using the technique of adding the black to the, to the eyeballs when he paints it? Well, um, I've looked for manuals, Dutch manuals, haven't been able to find a single one that mentions how do you paint eyes. But in Henry Peckham's uh, uh, publication, it's not from, well, this is the second uh, publication from 1661. There is one from 1635, uh, The Complete Gentleman. And in that one, um, and here you, you have another image of the front, he writes, to begin a picture, first draw the eye, the white thereof, make a white let with a little charcoal black. Having finished it, leave uh, from the other eye and the distance and so forth. And you continue to paint, and here you have it more close up. So there is this very, very short introduction to how to start painting an eye. I'm not assuming that Rembrandt would have read this book. Of course not. Um, but he knew something that he was sure would have an effect. This book is mainly uh, written for those who wanted to do uh, miniatures. So it wouldn't really count in Rembrandt's case either. But there's somebody who's aware of it, and there's only one more, um, I'm just going back once, one more source I have been able to find, also a British source from the 1660s that mentions that you should add lamp black to the white of the eyeballs uh, when you paint a, a portrait. These are the only two sources I've been able to find. So having gone through the, uh, the Rembrandt database, I could see that in all these paintings, and none of them are being doubted uh, seriously, you can see that there's black addition to the large majority of the portraits in the eyeballs. And there are a few that have no blacks, maybe because of their frontally lit, uh, or in other ways, uh, not relevant for him. We also see that there is a slight change at the end of of the uh, the uh, fort, uh, well, in the in the, in the forties, um, but I can show you more of that in, at another time. Um, reproducing Rembrandt as this artist here to the right is doing by painting in everything you see here, 
is making a misinterpretation of the way Rembrandt paints. And that is what I wanted uh, to show already in the beginning. But the color you see here in the corner of his eye <coughs> and in here, that's a color of the ground layer of the, of the canvas. Because he is so very uh, brief in his paint application that the ground layer has to play a role. But this happens when he introduces the colored ground in his panel, in his paintings. The early paintings were all painted on a wood panel that would have a white ground. So I'm speculating, would Rembrandt in the course of the 1640s, at the end of the 40s, change from adding uh, the, uh, the black to the white in the eyeballs because he changes to canvases with a toned ground so that this subdued tone and tonality of the white would be caused automatically by having a ground layer that was not white and reflecting as it would have been on the panels. I have no conclusion to this, but it would look like it. I've looked at all his colleagues, pupils, students, well, not all of them, but all I could find in this Rembrandt database resource. And mining through that, I can see that the majority of artists not being Rembrandt, they do not add black to the eyes, but only a few does it, a studio of Rembrandt or, or whatever. So, it seems to be something that particularly Rembrandt does. And he doesn't teach it to his students, except for a few that, do, that does use this technique. And why would that be? Would they not have the shop talk uh, where he would translate to them how to make a convincing eyeball when you are making a portrait? Um, we don't know, but we know that he had enormous amount of students that uh, would have been under his influence. Is it because the students also work more on canvas later on in the 1640s, 1650s, because Jan Lievens and Gerd Dao, Dao was an early student with him, no blackness and no splotchiness in the face. In uh, a circle of Rembrandt uh, attributed to Karl Fabritius in The Hague in the Marat House and in this painting by Samuel von Hochstraten uh, at the Museum Bredius just across the street from the Marat House in The Hague, there you see as something that looks like a student that has been listening to the shop talk uh, while being uh, uh, teaching, being taught by, by Rembrandt. So you have this, and I'm particularly interested in what happens in this Van Hoogstraten phase because there seem to be more paintings out there that have this particular phenomenon. This looks like a complete change, and it is, because this is, uh, these are eight paintings by Albert Eckhart a Dutch painter that uh, went with uh, Peter Post to Brazil to being the, you could say, the correspondence of uh, Maurits who went there and had his, uh, was governor in Brazil. Maurits, uh, Post and Eckhart would make drawings make, uh, uh, of, of people, of uh, landscape, nature, fruits, plants, and that would be reworked when they came home. Well, these paintings have been thought to have been painted in Brazil. Uh, I think we now know, and uh, I'm arguing for that in an article that will come out uh, later this month, that three of these eight paintings are not by Eckhart, actually. I'm now trying to look again at the blackness of the eyeballs. It's very difficult to see in these dark figures, but you can see the eyeballs are definitely white. And here is another one, an infrared image, and the eyeballs are particularly white. However, this guy, and I call him now anonymous in the National Museum in Denmark, he's still Albert Eckhart, but on the 20th of December, uh, this image will be in the magazine, and you see he has also intensively black eyeballs. Uh, so the same mixture of white and black. Would that give us a clue that these people are by a different hand? Probably, in my view, it does, because that whole uh, yeah, shorthand of painting a face is so comparable to what we saw in Rembrandt's studio, for instance. Uh, so that could very well be, and here I'm comparing uh, one of Eckhart's paintings with another one of Eckhart's paintings, and they are so utterly different. Look at the opacity of the paint in that entire face, also in the shadow areas, which is definitely not the case in the other one and comparing again to Eckhart just to make the, the point very clear uh, that there is a huge difference in the painting technique, paint application between these two artists. I wouldn't have 
noticed this had I not been through the Rembrandt database and all these images. And here's actually a painting that Francesca knows quite well. Uh, and uh, thanks to her, I've been able to include this uh, infrared study of this painting. And look, they are very comparable in many ways, I consider. Um, could it be the same person that uses the black as also done in this painting in, in uh, Chicago, the way that the highlights and the face are, are modeled? There's so many things that look comparable here uh, that we could probably consider this. I'm just showing uh, three paintings here close up by black people. That uh, was a Congolese uh, uh, envoy coming to the Netherlands in the 1630s. And you can see that even the closer we go, there is not, nothing of the blackness in the way that the artist, uh, uh, Mr. Bex, he painted this. We're not sure if the artist is Bex, but uh, definitely he didn't use this recipe. A number of painters did, most did not. And how does that relate these paintings to each other? That's still an open question. But with this, I wanted to say that um, if you don't have a large resource of data, even the smartest scientific instrumentation might put you on the wrong leg because if you don't do a massive survey of not only the masters themselves, but also the associates, you may draw uh, conclusions that state that the master is so brilliant and so extraordinary, but maybe the other ones were as well, or some of them at least. So I'm opting for sharing data as much as possible and making it available uh, for researchers. That's the only way that we can get a greater, period, uh, greater picture of uh, how these artists worked. So concluding, infrared imaging of a large number of paintings and his, uh, his uh, contemporaries reveals that in the 30s and 40s, there's this use of black application in the white paint to the eyeballs, but most people uh, in his circle and outside didn't do the same, except for a few. There may be many more paintings out there that need to be screened in this way, and I hope that people will share, and thank you for listening to this. We can start with the first hand that I saw when. <laughs> okay. Well, that's. No, no microphone. So I uh, have two, two, two questions. One first for uh, uh, Francesca. Uh, thank you very much for the impressive presentation of all the different tools you use and so on. And it is uh, clear uh, the new way to finally uh, engage information about. Uh, about uh, uh, the characterization of uh, the different, uh, especially as I'm painting, but not, not only. Um, uh, I, um, I have a first question that is concerning uh, the, uh, um, the analytical strategy, in fact, because uh, you, you have the capability to use a lot of different tools. So uh, I want to know how you decide the way you are going to uh, practices and to uh, finally uh, according the different techniques first. And do you finally uh, work on that piloting uh, with some uh, art uh, history questions or are you going to do that just for documentation without any questions? And I have a second question for you as well. Uh, you show some um, uh, things about uh, cleaning of artwork. And I was a little bit surprised that uh, because it is something now that I'm completely convinced uh, to use 
uh, optical coherence tomography in order to see when you remove or clean an artwork in order to control the way uh, <laughs> of cleaning in that way, especially your removal uh, varnishes. And I have a question uh, for Jorgen uh, in, in the same time, in different way. Uh, it's, your demonstration is very clear about the use of this carbon black or charcoal uh, uh, black. Uh, do you uh, verify, because it is written and it is something, uh, with any other techniques that is really carbon black? Sure. <laughs> we'll try to remember all the questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, the answer to your first question is really twofold. So most of the time the question is driven either by the curators, the art historians, or the conservators. So it may be a treatment question or it may be an art historical question. When we do the uh, collection catalogs, we tend to have, on the other hand, a uh, standard procedure, which is collect all the imaging because it's an opportunity even if our collection is, is not immense, still 300,000 objects, there's no way that even with the paintings, which are about 70,000, that we can have this detailed information for everything. And so it's an opportunity to collect the x-ray, the infrared, some now the hyperspectra, and we do that routinely, and then maybe take a ground, an image of the layer build up. Um, so it really depends and most of the time is an uh, art historically or conservation driven question. We've also done projects, one of those very close to my heart, looking at use of industrial enamel paints by artists and so that is a kind of scientific question that then interrogates the collection the other way. But most of the time those, those are the, the questions. And in terms of uh, using OCT, optical coherence tomography, to um, visualize the removal of varnish layers from paintings. Um, this is something that we don't do routinely. Uh, I mean, we don't do at all, actually, although OCT is uh, not available at the Art Institute, but is available at, the, at Northwestern. The, the practice at the museum is really that the conservator has a good working knowledge of what they're doing. And so, so far it's been more uh, led by the practice than by a sort of scientific monitoring of what's, what's removed, but the tools are there. And also the practicality, when you have, uh, in our lab we have uh, six paintings conservators, there's between a dozen paintings being worked on, so it would be feasible practically maybe on one major project if there were maybe questions about an original varnish and then subsequent layers of varnishes. Certainly my colleagues most of the time reduce the varnishes as opposed to completely removing them. But it's certainly something that I know it's, it's been used and, and maybe possibly helpful. I would sort of mirror the question to Jorgen who is a paintings conservator, how he would feel to be sort of having to stop and. Uh, OCT imaging, search of measuring progress of the work. <laughs> I think it would be challenging and uh, it could be interesting to try, but, uh, but uh, I have not been in the situation where that was an option at all. It has been the UV lamp coming in and out all the time to see how far are you at different fluorescences, and then you know you reach a certain level, uh, and that would guide you further in the cleaning process. Um, thanks, Vincent, for that question, because it's a very relevant question that I wanted to have somebody to ask, so you did it. Um, having a macro XIF uh, scan of all the eyes of all these people that I've showed you would be wonderful. It would be very worthwhile, but who's going to pay? Um, that is, that is the, the, uh, the haphazardness with the uh, big scientific tools that they are mainly being used and employed for the artwork that have a significant art historical connotation. Uh, and again and again, look now, the night watch of Rembrandt is being extraordinarily well preserved and, uh, sorry, documented. So was the girl with the pearl by Vermeer a few years back. And that's wonderful and we learn a lot about these two uh, artists. 
but we don't know if that is also the same with the other ones. And who will finance you doing a lot of non-Rembrandts and scanning them? Uh, that's why this infrared imaging is, is a, a resource that is uh, wonderful. You could, of course, do it a single one here and there to kind of uh, point uh, analysis and, uh, and verify. But I think the infrared image has already shown us that there is at least a carbon black uh, pigment, whether it's uh, bone, lamp, or whatever black. Um, but yes, it would be wonderful if these advanced equipments could be more broadly used as well. I could only advocate that and have more art historians ask questions so that these machines will get going and running all the time. Thanks to uh, both the speakers for the presentation of the technological investigation. My question is, is a painting before the final stage a piece of art? Well, <laughs> I think this is a good question for the art historians. I could certainly say that as we have so many examples of what is called non finito, when is the a painting really finished? Um, so, yes. <laughs> exactly, and that was a question that somebody put to Rembrandt at one point. And, um, and he said, well, it's finished when I think it's finished. And that's an important statement because when you see the roughness and the loose hand with which he paints at some point, uh, he, he came out of fashion in his own time because the classicistic way of painting, much more opaquely painted, like Dao painted and like Vermeer painted, by the way. That was Van Gogh at the time. Rem Rembrandt was still there and still around. Uh, but he decided that it's finished when I'm finished. When is a Pollock drip painting finished, uh, you could say, uh, just to be provocative in my, my, my answer here. And that, that is very difficult, but if the artist himself believes, I am finished, then we better believe it, I guess. There was a situation where people came up close to his painting, uh, to Rembrandt's painting, and he said, step back, step back, the smell of the paint is much too dangerous for you, you'll get, become dizzy. The reason he said that was, you should watch and view my paintings at a distance because then everything blends in your eyes. And that is a, a skillful painter and therefore his paintings, how blotchy they may have been, they were art. In my view at least as well. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Casabio and, and Professor Wadum. I was interested to hear uh, about the use of synchrotron radiation approaches um, to um, analyzing and studying works of art. And I wonder if you could comment a little bit, particularly given that we now have a relatively recently inaugurated synchrotron here in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle Eastern re region, Sesame that was inaugurated in 2017 on the um, issues around the transportation of works of art, um, if possible, uh, or whether it is samples that are going there. And, and that uh, a whole range of, of questions relating to uh, permits, uh, transportation, uh, related security, uh, and so on, and or the choice to sample uh, these um, uh, precious works of art. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I can share a couple of impressions from my experience in Chicago. I would then call my French colleagues to comment a little bit more because the synchrotron in Chicago and the synchrotrons in the United States were developed to do fundamental science. We do collaborate with scientists to analyze works of art, and certainly in my experience at the Art Institute, uh, bringing samples have been much, has been much easier. Uh, we brought Chinese bronzes, and very kindly, the physicists there borrowed a safe, like a band safe, 
that they left in the experimental set, uh, uh, station and, and uh, secure the art that way. Um, clearly, if, you, if the synchrotron is committed to heritage sti studies, as it's been done, for example, at Soleil, an area where you can actually store the art, an area where the environmental control is uh, uh, offered is valuable. Certainly also the, the value of synchrotrons has been to uh, pioneer techniques that then become portable and become lab-based so that we minimize the need to bring the artwork out to the synchrotron. And on the other end, the kind of advanced cutting edge science that has the micro or nano um, uh, spatial resolution and ability to, to do and uh, interrogate volumes, those are certainly things, and fast, somebody was mentioning speed, um, these are certainly opportunities that, that we in cultural institutions really value in the collaboration with, uh, with synchrotron scientists. And the other thing, again, if there is an investment and a value in the heritage sector, developing also synchrotron staff that is conversant in that language is acutely important because you'll see in the literature, at least the one that I know, that it's always the same half a dozen of synchrotron scientists that co-publish with the uh, humanists and with heritage scientists because they appreciate the value. Otherwise, often what happens is that we want to do this longitudinal studies, we want to look at 20, 30, 50 works, and in the world of synchrotron research, that's repetitive. You have studied that pigment once, why do you need to do it again? Uh, and so you need to also have that cross-directional <coughs> training, in a sense, for success. No, I completely agree with, with uh, what you explained. Um, I think there is an area that would be interesting to study further and has been done in a PhD study recently uh, uh, in Amsterdam on a certain group of painting. And that would be uh, isotope uh, studies. Lead white, for instance, uh, isotope studies, trace element studies would be greatly enhancing our understanding of trade of these materials. And I wonder if the old notion of lead white from Italy is so are really different from lead white in Northern Europe. Is that always true? There was a huge tr uh, trade between Livorno and England, for instance, where the lead ore would come from for the Dutch uh, artists. Would there be clusters in Tuscany? Would there be other places? Would the goals that you were talking about earlier, could that not, with isotope analysis, uh, be traced further down uh, and localized? So I think isotope analysis of, uh, of uh, material and matter in artworks would, uh, would be greatly benefiting our understanding of the trading aspect. Uh, please, uh, Professor. Between uh, finished and non-finished work, completed and non-completed work, uh, my teacher, Andreas Crisoho, is a painter in Cyprus, told me that uh, the, in Byzantine geography, since thousand, for thousand years, the thematography was almost the same, and the, techni the techniques we was uh, almost very close one to the other. Help the European painters to complete their works by repeating, repeating lines and lines, and after transparencies with transparencies. And Rembrandt is a very good example of this. Since Pandocrator, only Pandocrator in Byzantine geography is considered to be completely finished, the uh, Rembrandt's art is repeating, second to my opinion, a very good uh, uh, personal representation of the human figure in a beautiful way. Please, uh, Tell to us a parallel between the Byzantine art and Rembrandt. I, th I believe it is very interesting. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that other name you mentioned. And the yeah. The question of the eyes. Ah, yeah. The question uh, of the eyes. Yeah. And the surrounding of the <coughs> face in general way. 
in uh, the eyes of Christ from 1645, you have the same technique as you had in the earlier paintings uh, by Rembrandt. I don't consider him Rembrandt, that is, uh, changing his style according to what kind of personality he is depicting. If it's a portrait of a known person or if it is a historical person like Christ or, or any of the many other people surrounding Christ in the Bible, uh, they seem to have been painted uh, the same way as far as I can see. But the larger, the larger compositions of history paintings of Rembrandt in the early years are on small panels. That means that the figures are so small that there is no need to do this. It's mainly when you have almost up to life-size paintings. And there you would have the Christ figure or you would have a, a, a one of the apostles. But that was mainly in the southern Netherlands. You would have Van Dyck and Rubens repetitively have their studio making apostles in, in large scale for the market. And I haven't looked at these <coughs> paintings at all. But in Rembrandt's case, I don't think there would be any difference between you or a Christ figure uh, in his way of painting. I hope that answers your question. Nicholas. Yes, I, I have a um, quick question for Francesca. I was very fascinated by what you mentioned about the statistics and the studies about how much time people spend. And uh, I wanted to just ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about what you've seen in the context, of course, of the important museums such as the Artistic in Chicago. How setting and it was very interesting to, to hear that uh, in, in relation to the response of the public. Thank you for the question. Again, everything is quite experimental and there needs to be a very delicate balance between showing original works of art and all the interpretive material. We've certainly found that compared to a QR code that people have to download on their phone and then maybe interact later, to offer opportunities to interact in the gallery is very helpful with this, we call them digital labels that are really tablets that people can interact with. And normally for one exhibition, no more than, than a couple, two or three, but really we work very closely and this I find also very enriching, not only with the curators, but with specialists in interpretation. Because this idea that you're not just sharing a concept, but you're trying to stimulate the public to go and look back, to go and look closely, has been really, really important. We certainly see that uh, by doing interviews, that um, it, they can serve as a tool for engagement. Again, it, it, it cannot be overwhelming. I mean, I, even myself, I'm sure many in the audience, when you get to an exhibition and you're overstimulated with all this interpretive material, it's May I add briefly that at, uh, when I was at the National Gallery in Copenhagen, we had a project to restore a large painting by, by uh, Jakob Jordan's 17th century painting. And uh, apart from having it out in an open studio with a glass wall between the public and the conservators sitting with their back towards the public working on this painting, uh, we had tours for the public. They could book a tour with the conservators on a specific day and a specific time, and we would come out of the glass cage and tell them what's going on here. And we had a group of, uh, of 20 people coming four times during that whole period, and they were staff members or employees from an insurance company that had no relationship with the museum whatsoever. But when they came the last time, and I spoke with one of them. Uh, a lady said, but we, we recognize this painting as our painting. Because we come all the time, you are doing it for us, we call it our painting. So we go and have a look at our painting. 
And that is a very nice way of interacting. And they were immensely interested in all the technicalities, both the research part of understanding pigments, but also in how do you, how do you choose your solvents? How do you do this? Um, I, th I think that there's a great potential in this. And with digital means, you talk about the tablets, Francesca, if you would make uh, with your museum that have the objects that you would like to share with people or the techniques and material, an opportunity that when you take a photo of the painting with your smartphone, you get an x-ray automatically from the museum site. You can make these things happen. And that would ask a uh, question uh, or prompt people to go back home and look back on that website where you should have things ready for them to further study. Because that would be the surprise. You look through the painting and suddenly, hey, there's much more going on here. Or there is a, a color of the bedroom of Van Gogh uh, <laughs> in the realistic way. New technology again, right? You know? <laughs> here we are, depending on this. OK, we can have one more question. And he wants to, uh, to ask a question also. OK. So I have oh, a oh, okay. short question for you because right. there, there are many questions which have been uh, uh, already uh, asked. Uh, it's one to, uh, to Jorgen. Uh, you didn't mention the two large paintings from Rembrandt uh, from the Rothschild collection, Martin and Nokian. Did you get access to the infrared uh, images? Un no, no. Unfortunately not. They are not on the Rembrandt database yet. Yes. And what's not being shared, mm -hmm. you don't know. Okay. So, uh, you don't know. But uh, m my question is, uh, was not this one. Is, uh, is, uh, the, the, fir the first uh, thing is to discover that a specific technique uh, that means the presence of uh, black pigment inside the white. But do you uh, have an idea why Rampan did that? But what is, is the explanation? Uh, the uh, there is a physical explanation probably. That's exactly what I would have liked to ask him. But uh, so, so far I can only say that, uh, that it, it, it seems to be more frequently used by him on, uh, when he paints on panel paintings that have a white ground. And therefore, painting a white eyeball on a white ground makes it maybe look too bright because there's no, no color, color ground that subdues it. Uh, and that would prompt him to do this. That is my hypothesis. I cannot get that closer to that. But it is very obvious when you see the infrared images. I haven't seen it all the years I've been looking at Rembrandt since we discovered the, the uh, Maurer's portrait was not by Rembrandt in uh, uh, the late 1990s. Uh, but it's, it's only when you begin to, to see more and more of these images, suddenly it's, it, it struck me, why are all these eyeballs black? Uh, and oh. yeah. Uh, and I can only explain it that way, and because with the toned grounds, uh, it seems to appear, to disappear for him yeah. later on. Yes, because following the question of, uh, of uh, Vincent, uh, if it's really uh, carbon or uh, uh, bone uh, black, uh, it has to be... Uh, huh? Yeah. And the second is the size of the particles, uh, the size of the the carbon, so you should uh, have an you idea to the... You, uh, you should have the equipment to do this. <laughs> you have some paintings. But, uh, uh, yeah. Probably, probably uh, OCT could be, uh, yeah. could be uh, helpful yeah. for that. Yeah. And so uh, for one of the specific uh, paintings you study, maybe you should uh, ask for further uh, examination in order to answer this question. Why? Uh, so it's a, it's a first step to know that there is pre as a presence of carbon, but why? Yeah. Do you think Blaise Ducot at the Louvre would be welcoming you with your equipment? No, in fact, because it, you need to have OCT far easier for it. You can, you, because you, you can see it see it because in fact uh, you are catching the light coming from uh, between uh, 100, uh, 1,500 nanometer to, uh, to uh, 2 microns, something like that. So you need to perform OCT 
specific OCT about two microns. Unfortunately, there is no commercial instrumentation, so we are now trying to develop such kind of multi wavelength OCT, but it should be, of course, the solution in order to uh, at least have a good idea uh, about, uh, about the stratigraphy, but it will be not or we have to see, but uh, due to the absorption, maybe we can have information uh, in a specific spectral zone, but so maybe with hyperspectral, looking specifically at this part, uh, if there is some information that we can make a link with uh, carbon black, bone carbon, charcoal, and so on. Okay, we have this one last question from our journalist here. Yeah, thank you, yes. Uh, um, my name is Vincent Noss, I'm a journalist. So it's not a scholarly question, I'm afraid, but a journalist question. Yeah. Excuse well, me. That's what I said. Uh, uh, isn't what you said um, contradicted by the museum's policies of big blockbusters, where uh, people are supposed to go faster and faster, so you suppress the armchairs, you suppress the benches, and now you suppress the labels. I had, a, there was a curator of Dutch painting who had an exhibition on Dutch painting at the Louvre. And I, I said, there's no label, there's no panel. And I said, yes, because people must advance. And we, we need to have a big figure at the end of the, of the exhibition. So there's a contradiction there uh, in the museum's policy, isn't there? Well, thank you for the question. I'm aware that this happens in museums such as the Louvre or Orsay. Uh, the most well attended exhibitions at the Art Institute have about half a million visitors, which pales in comparison. So we haven't had those issues of moving traffic along. Um, I have advocated for some platforms for the selfie takers. So if people want to look at the art, they are not uh, intruded by. Um, but yes, I mean, it's, it happens in conservation where we have to balance preservation with access. It happens with curation where you have to balance interpretation with access by massive tourists. So it, it's, it's a very good point and uh, I still feel that it's a, a responsibility of the institutions to also offer interpretation of what the public is seeing, and so some form of labels or, or interpretive material is the added contribution. Otherwise, you know, we might as well just be scrolling on our phones. May I just add one comment to this? Think about this next time there's a general election, and vote for those who want to give the, uh, the arts money, because we are terribly underfunded, and that's the reason that sponsors can uh, come in and uh, request these huge figures, otherwise sponsors don't come. So don't forget it at the next general election. The importance of art. <laughs> I responded as a former curator <laughs> of this. Uh, if I may, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think that museums organize different types of exhibitions targeting different... Thank you. Targeting different um, groups. Uh, a museum can very well organize a blockbuster um, with, um, uh, you know, masterpieces or only highlights, uh, and at the same time, s smaller scale exhibitions, which are truly research exhibitions, uh, and they aim to deepen the connection between perhaps a small part of the public with the actual uh, procedures in the museums, what the museums do. So I think that both are true. I don't think there is a museum that only does blockbusters, or at least there are very few. I don't know. May I just add a, 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 sh a short comment? You had the Da Vinci exhibition in Louvre, which was an example of a, a blockbuster with a massive <laughs> attendance. And it was based on, on each uh, composition had an X-ray panel, for instance, and uh, infrared, infrared panel. And it was based also on forensic examinations. So, you know, that was Vincent's work. And, you know, I think this is also a combination of the two. Absolutely, and, and very interesting to do. Yeah. 
Well, with that, I would like to ask everyone to thank our speakers for this stimulating discussion <laughs> we've had. And we'll see you after lunch again.
Okay, let's um, take some seats. Mia, Mia. Okay, we are beginning in five minutes. Three minutes. So I'm very pleased that uh, I'm uh, here uh, chairing this uh, afternoon and especially to present two of my uh, nice colleagues from APAC, uh, uh, Professor Sorin Hermann uh, from uh, uh, APAC. I know him for decades now. Uh, he, uh, he is here. Uh, and uh, I have to, to, to read a bit what is on you in order, don't be shy, uh, I will uh, uh, tell how brilliant you are. <laughs> Soin, <laughs> Soin leads the digital, <laughs> yes, so Soin, Soin Hermann uh, leads the digital cultural heritage research group at Stasi. Uh, he uh, has uh, three, D three D approaches. You have a, a very nice example with an ivory uh, statuette uh, in, the, in the room nearby. Uh, it's the fruit of, uh, the, the, of his group. And he's a director of Starlab the mobile laboratory which has been mentioned and uh, thanks to uh, Francesca to have mentioned it uh, in uh, one of your last, uh, last slides. Uh, Sorin is also uh, uh, associated with different uh, European uh, projects. The Hyperion project which uh, will uh, uh, bring uh, the Cyprus Institute inside a consortium of uh, different uh, institutions in heritage science called ERIS, European Research Infrastructures in Heritage Science, and also is uh, uh, involved with ESPADON. ESPADON, it will be uh, uh, more uh, later, will be presented with, uh, by another colleague. So, Sorin. Uh, you, the title of uh, your talk is Digital Approaches to Art Characterization, State of the Art and Future Challenges. Please. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Michelle, for this introduction. Uh, good afternoon. So right now, I have the choice either to sleep very quietly and smoothly, so you'll have a nice afternoon nap, or <laughs> to wake you up, and this will be much more different. So I will try to do the later. And um, my, uh, my talk uh, connects, I think, uh, very well with what we have been heard uh, in the previous session about the importance of uh, sharing data and sharing information and sharing knowledge uh, because this is the, one of the key topics that uh, our group and the, our institute uh, uh, works on it. So I brought here um, a quote from um, now it's more than 10 years, but it's still very relevant um, initiative uh, conducted by uh, science where uh, they mention very clearly that uh, scientific innovation has been called on to spur economic recovery. And the scientific community has been criticized for not being sufficiently accountable and transparent. Data collection, curation, and access are central to all these issues. So this, I think, it's, uh, it captures very well what, uh, what are the latest efforts and what uh, I think it's one of the greatest challenges now in, uh, in our domain. Um, following that same uh, research, we have, they published, uh, I mean, the research was very broad, covering uh, almost 2,000 researchers from different uh, disciplines, but the answers were quite uh, homogeneous. And most of them, uh, when they were asked about how often they access or use data sets from published literature or original research papers, most of them you see here, they said it rarely, which is like really, really, um, um, bad for science. Okay, the other thing is that they would really like to collaborate, everybody's wishing to collaborate, but um, they really don't know where to store the data, what to do with their data, and everybody complains, of course, and we have heard it here uh, also, rightfully, that there are not sufficient investments in, uh, in this concept of uh, storing data, curating data, archiving, and so forth. So um, from our point of view, and this is something that uh, it's an ongoing work both in, uh, in uh, Iperion, in uh, IRIS for, with DigiLab, also Espadon put it uh, at the core of its uh, interest, is data sharing and data reuse. And in order to reuse data, we need to have a transparent process of data. So what does it mean? We need to know how this data was obtained, so provenance of data, how it was gathered, which tools were used, which methodologies, which uh, strategies for, for collecting data were applied, how this data was processed, post-processed, and they then interpreted. So we are talking here on ways to formally express, for example, reasoning methods and argumentation tools. The other thing, the other aspect is uh, assessment of the quality of data. Okay, we have the data out there, and we need to assess its quality. So uh, that's also uh, very interesting because yesterday I was in another meeting, and there was a very important discussion about quality of data, and it took me almost half an hour to realize that we were talking about totally, totally different concepts about quality because uh, my colleagues were mentioning quality data in terms of uh, resolution of an image, not actually what the image contains, which was interesting. So when we talk about quality, it, is, uh, it can be expressed through relevance, how much it is relevant to me and my research, um, how uh, accurate it is, how credible this data is, and you see here the um, and the description of these terms. A very important thing is the timeliness. Um, I'm, I think I invent, it's an invented word, I don't know if it exists in English, but it is, uh, it's to capture the length of time between when the data was made available and the phenomenon that they describe it. And then the coherence of this data. So in order to be transparent, we are, I'm, I will just uh, show a few um, concepts of uh, approaches of our work here, and then I will go on some um, nicer, let's say, slides with more examples of our work. 
Uh, this is our pipeline from the very early beginning. Uh, we are focusing on two key aspects in developing it. One is portability of instruments and also uh, we heard earlier the importance of uh, mobile labs and how important it is to set up laboratories in many different uh, environments. And the other uh, aspect of our uh, work, of our uh, pipeline, regards the non-invasiveness. There is less and less um, allowance of, to take samples, so we are trying to push the boundaries of non-invasive uh, methods as much as possible. Um, the next thing is to describe what we do in a way that it's understandable both for us and uh, machines, digital machines. This is a big challenge of sharing data. And we have to come up with formal languages, with formal ways of expressing um, all what we do here in a way that we can communicate that in a kind of, let's say, uh, neutral language to the others, so we don't get lost in translations. Um, but also, we, are, we, can, um, uh, we can create this environment where digital machines can help us uh, a lot. So we have to be very clear what are our, uh, which, which are our research questions, what do we want to solve, um, why, to justify why we chose one methodology over the other, and the reasons for specifying, for example, if we take a sample and from where, I mean, all these questions have to be uh, formally expressed. And then, based on that, we can come up later on with a more step-by-step uh, um, -step description of which uh, data was produced in which, in which step, by which instruments, what are the environmental settings. Um, Michel mentioned uh, Hyperion. We came back, when was that? A few months ago from a meeting in Florence where we were talking exactly about that, about the, to, yeah, about the uh, need to have a proper way to capture what we do in the lab. And most of people there rightfully mentioned the, the log and the laboratory notebook being the most important thing of every researcher. Okay, very good. How can we take this laboratory notebook and translate it into a metadata, paradata, a, a way to formally describe what's going on there. So this is what uh, it, it is uh, part of this uh, notebook. So what we suggest, and I think this is the last, uh, let's say, boring uh, slide, is to create a digital twin, a heritage digital twin, which is uh, semantic uh, aware, and I brought here um, a knowledge graph of this uh, semantic uh, aware digital twin and how it should be organized. It is based on SIDOC uh, CRM, which is an ontology um, in the heritage domain. It is an uh, ISO standard, and uh, it has all kinds of extensions. Uh, there is no need for me to describe it here. But uh, what I wanted to mention that um, this digital twin as a concept, and uh, Vincent will talk about it later on, uh, the augmented object, I think they are very similar uh, concepts, basically is the virtual, the digital environment that can really connect between the physical world and the digital uh, world. And have all the data around it, all the research around it, organized in such a way that it will be meaningful for uh, further uh, reuse. So I wanted to give you some examples now from uh, our work here. Um, most of them are from two, three years back. This is a project uh, on, archaeological, um, on archaeological materials that we are collaborating with the University of uh, Göteborg at uh, a site in Cyprus called uh, Hala Sultan Teke. Uh, the site had its main period in, uh, in late Bronze Age. It was one of the main uh, harbors of the city. So really an important uh, trade center for the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, recently in one of the tombs, this uh, very small object uh, was found. It is a Babylonian seal with uh, this, you can read here, the inscriptions. 
What is important to mention, it was, um, it mentioned a king that probably lived uh, in the 19th century before counting era. So when it arrived to us, we did uh, 3D analysis, uh, we did uh, mostly 3D, but also digital microscopy. Um, we virtually unwrapped it, so we can see now much better uh, and interpret much better the scene. Um, you can see up, hang on. No, okay. Like this, you see here, for example, how the drilling was perfectly aligned along the longitudinal axis of the uh, of the seal. Um, all these figures here and here were added later on in Cyprus. What is in interesting, there are several aspects that are very interesting in this uh, seal. One, there was some kind of process that turned the hematite into a magnetite. So now it's a magnet and it would be interesting to see how, we don't know actually how it happened. Uh, the other thing is that um, the seal was done somewhere in the 19th century. It was found in a tomb here in the 13th century BC. So for 500 years, it traveled around and it would be very interesting to see what happened to it in between. We know that once it arrived to Cyprus, it was remodeled and recarved, but actually considering the scenes that were already existing. And you see how, for example, this scene here with a guy with a standard uh, is embedded between the two figures of the god and the, and the king. Um, we also have conducted a detailed analysis of how this uh, object and similar others were done. And here is a mathematical, uh, geometrical analysis to identify different types of works and tools and methods that were done for carving this uh, seal. So for example, uh, there were micro chipping mm, hang on. here. I don't know if you can see. Two types of drills were used, and you can see really they are really, really small. And probably um, copper and bronze uh, objects uh, were used to carve it while using uh, an abrasive paste of oil and emery or quartz. And here is a um, mapping of the different types of uh, manufacturing on this uh, drill, of this uh, seal. We, where you see here the digitally unwrapped uh, version of it. Another, um, by the way, um, I think it's very, very important to mention that most of the projects that you, you will see here are done in our group by uh, PhD students. So most of the work is done by, uh, by our uh, PhD students. So this is a PhD um, thesis of um, of uh, a student who graduated uh, this year. And uh, she looked, uh, she took uh, upon herself a very uh, important challenge of trying to understand better things about the Ciprominon. So the Ciprominon uh, writing system derives from uh, the linear A. It's undeciphered. And unlike, uh, for example, um, cuneiforms, which are mostly on tablets, the Ciprominon appears on many different types of objects, on many different types of materials, um, also of different shapes. So one of the um, big challenges is to try to see how the materials uh, and the shapes, the curvatures, had an impact on the shape of the letters. Because um, according to traditional uh, research, there are several variations of, uh, of the Ciprominon, at least three. But actually when you look, uh, and this is something that I, I think it was also mentioned in the past, most of the research it is done in a very traditional way of having images, looking at images, and comparing these images primarily from printed material. So people go to a library, take out the book, make a photocopy and look, and then they discuss and analyze. Uh, about uh, the shape. But actually, as you can see here, shape of letters is very much uh, uh, influenced by the curvature. So we had to come up with methods to kind of uh, 
uh, harmonize the shape of the letters, try to understand how much um, the hand of a scribe would have influenced the shape, how much the material itself would have had an influence on the, um, on the letters, because it's a very different thing to carve on, uh, on silver, like here, on tablets, or on these kind of uh, stone uh, seals. Or, you see, when you have a letter on, uh, on a round object, you, and it depends a lot how you will take the picture, because you have different uh, angles. So a lot of work was done, and you see here, for example, down here are some examples of how um, publishing material in a very traditional way and then comparing it may lead to uh, erroneous uh, results. So this is an example of such a work where we took a, a, a seal with these uh, letters and we unwrapped it and rectified uh, the letters in order to reach um, their, uh, let's say, proper uh, geometric shape. So once we have reached this uh, proper geometric shape, um, we created a corpus of many, many signs, and um, the student came up with an algorithm to extract uh, primary shapes, let's say, and you see here these lines in order to compare, and uh, after this very tedious work, she came uh, out with the results, with the suggestion that uh, the Cipraminoan is one script with high variations between areas, um, with a fixed uh, number of signs, and uh, also that uh, if we really want to analyze this kind of uh, material, we need to do a very, very accurate uh, 3D documentation, ac accurate meaning at uh, micrometers. The other example that I want to show comes from uh, another site, uh, also in, uh, not far from Hala uh, Sultan Teke, Pila Kokino Kremos. It's also a late Bronze Age site, um, particularly interesting because it has imports from all over the Mediterranean, as far as uh, Sardinia, and um, also from the Levantine coast. Uh, it was probably a kind of uh, cove of uh, pirates at a certain point, because uh, many, many different uh, reasons uh, that are mostly archaeological. So here uh, I'm focusing on the example of a stone object, very small one, unique. First time we find something like that in, a, in the archaeological record, so no comparison. We don't know what to do and how to analyze it. Of course, because it, they had, uh, it had the carved signs, um, the first thing to do is to, to see how uh, the imprint looks like. So we have conducted uh, detailed uh, digital microscopy analysis and we found out a lot of col colors on them. So this is f immediately an add-on uh, result because um, if our lab wouldn't have been there and we wouldn't have looked at this object, these colors would have never been uh, uh, identified and recorded because you cannot see them with the naked eye. And much of the research in, in the archaeological uh, domain is done uh, visual, uh, visually with a, the with a naked eye. The other thing that we have done was to conduct a 3D documentation, and this 3D documentation led to um, a suggestion on, on the evol evolution of uh, carving the signs on this uh, object, because we, we have seen, and you can see also on the upper one, that uh, signs cut each other and there is a clear um, sequence of, uh, of uh, carving them. Then, because we had this detailed 3D, we, can, uh, we could look further on on how this object was carved. And we see that there are primarily two different ways of uh, holding the object in your hand and carving it either from one direction or uh, rotating it according to the types of signs that uh, were done. So probably we have here at least two different uh, uh, hands, two different uh, uses of the same, of the same uh, object. Then we can go in further details with the 3D because this, the tool was uh, also uh, drilled and there is a very um, high um, accuracy of, of the drilling itself. And finally, we also um, 
unwrapped the signs in order to have the exact um, marks on how these uh, signs may have looked like if applied somewhere. We also 3D printed it in order to look at how it, the object was hold and manipulated uh, uh, in the hands. And finally, because we are in an art characterization, primarily uh, symposium, I wanted to bring a more detailed uh, example of, uh, of an analysis of, of an artwork, but trying to formalize uh, the knowledge that we have about this uh, analysis, both in terms of uh, art history and later on in terms of um, uh, analytical uh, analysis. So what you see here in this uh, structure, this is a structure that uh, if you translate it in, for example, in a software called uh, Turtle, it will uh, align with SIDOC uh, CRM uh, very easily. So the painting uh, you see here, it's, uh, it was assigned actually to Giovanni Baronzio. In literature, it appears under different names, and we know from where. So all this information has to be, uh, can be, ha can be, and has to be structured uh, in such a way that we can communicate it uh, outside in a way that is understood by other systems uh, as well. So um, we don't know much about the history of uh, this uh, painting, but. Uh, it was owned before in France, it probably came from uh, Italy, and uh, now it is in a private uh, collection. Um, there is a very important um, um, archive of uh, photo, art historical photos in the uh, University of Bologna, uh, the Fondazione Zeri, and there we found earlier versions of uh, this painting, which are also interesting to see the evolution of uh, the painting itself and how different details changed uh, over time. Um, we have our research aims, which have to be clearly uh, described in order later on to align between our research and our uh, results. It may sound very trivial, but actually not always it happens like that. Okay. Um, so our approach was to do analytical and digital research driven by art historical question, of course, using non-invasive and non-destructive methods, and integrate results from different uh, domains. So we have done multispectral imaging. Um, and that's it. Large format imaging. RTI, uh, anal all kinds of uh, analysis. I don't know if Roberto is here because he, he has conducted most of this work to try to understand uh, techniques of manufacture and how color was applied and how uh, preparations was done and so forth. Um, we looked also at uh, con episodes of uh, conservation of, the, uh, of this icon and uh, restorations, older, newer ones. Uh, we have a lot of material from uh, digital microscopy, and you see here, uh, there, for example, um, different uh, blue because of uh, later interventions, uh, restorations that cover uh, cracks, and also some uh, curiosities like uh, this uh, fake uh, crackelure here which was actually painted and it's visible with a, with a microscope. Uh, we have conducted also uh, XRF analysis to understand the materials, both old and uh, newer ones, in order to come up with the palette of both the original and uh, interventions, uh, later on, the later interventions. Okay. We also looked at uh, various techniques, in this case the technique of uh, gilding, which, how it was done, what is the preparation layer um, on different areas of the, of the icon. And at the end, all these results, we uh, also translate them into a more uh, formal uh, representation uh, that is easily, it is um, translatable with uh, uh, 
uh, CDOC, uh, let's say, codings, which I didn't put because they will not mean much to you in this, uh, this stage, but uh, it is aligned according to that. So um, I think that one of the big challenges that we have is to be able to do this uh, paradigm shift where I will quote also Vincent here, move from a competitive science to a collaborative science. This is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we have in, the, in our discipline today. Then we have to look into how to integrate social sciences and the humanities with experimental sciences. So we have truly a, a, a dialogue where we sit together and it's not you tell me what to do, I tell you what to do, but we decide together. And we also formalize uh, the knowledge through a specific uh, domain ontology where we describe both the data and the argumentation process. And finally, uh, data sharing and reuse conditions are implemented through, as we propose here, the Heritage Digital Twin. So with this, I conclude, and thank you very much. So uh, now it's, uh, the floor is for Professor Yorgos Atopoulos. He's uh, also in APAC in Stasi. He is an architect and uh, he develops the data for the presentation. And uh, uh, maybe I will read what is prepared. Of course, don't be shy. <laughs> Don't be shy. I need my glasses, of course. So uh, you, you work mostly on immersive and virtual environment. He's the head of a group called uh, Virtual Environment Laboratory. And uh, he did some uh, urban modeling and digital simulation, simulation for the study of built heritage and the creative exploration of historical narratives. So the, uh, you are involved maybe in uh, also you are part of Daria Eric, which is important to say uh, also, and you are coordinating many uh, European and uh, uh, national projects. You are also member of the scientific advisory board of the GPI Urban, uh, Urban Europe, and uh, the presentation of your to, uh, of uh, the, uh, this afternoon. The title is "Expanding the Role of Digital Tool in the Museum: New Ways of Seeing the Origin." And so it's uh, it's fit perf uh, perfectly, which has been said, for instance, by. Uh, Francesca this morning. Right? Okay. Thank you very much. No, no, that's fine. So as you heard, uh, I'm not an art historian nor an archaeologist. Uh, so uh, what I will be talking uh, to you today regards uh, not the application of uh, all these uh, beautiful, amazing uh, technologies and techniques and, and methods to study uh, artworks, but rather what do we do with all these data? So in this regard, I think uh, what I will be talking about fits very nicely with both Francesca's presentation and uh, Sorin's, following uh, Sorin's uh, specifically. And uh, we will be uh, looking at how we can really benefit and make sense of all these uh, beautiful technologies to really uh, give value to our heritage, our past, and help uh, the contemporary users of, uh, of, of cultural heritage to better understand the value for, for their future. So in this regard, uh, I will um, show you a few examples of how we apply uh, these uh, digital uh, tools and, and methods to really engage and study um, with uh, alternative uh, identities and different multimodal representations 
of the original, in specifically in cases where we don't have access to the original because there is no original or because we can simply cannot uh, uh, access it. So uh, I will be talking about uh, the use of virtual reality and immersive visualization for the study of uh, our historic cities. And um, also, I just wanted to highlight here this, this aspect of the born digital uh, artwork. Okay, and this is like um, a photograph of uh, one of the uh, art exhibitions that we uh, supported uh, last year, where we used the augmented reality uh, to create a, an open air art installation where there was uh, no original, the original was digital. I mean, there was no physical uh, representation of the, of the artwork. And specifically, it was by, by uh, this uh, very well, internationally renowned artist, uh, Austrian Austin artist, uh, Erwin Worm. Um, yeah, so I, obviously the work that I will be presenting to you is uh, not my uh, I didn't uh, create it uh, myself uh, I, alone. There is a big team uh, to, to which I'm uh, grateful, and um, we uh, all work together uh, in the Virtual Environments uh, Lab, which is uh, a research laboratory uh, that uh, uh, conducts research on virtual environments and digital twins of built heritage and historic urban environments. Uh, the use of data-driven user engagement methods for community participation and co-creation in heritage management and historic area uh, regeneration processes, and in visualization and simulation of sites and their environment for user engagement and education uh, purposes. Mostly, obviously, you have guessed well, I will be uh, focusing on the, the, the second and the third uh, point today, especially because of the um, background and uh, uh, of the audience and the focus of the this uh, event. So specifically, I will be showing a few examples uh, uh, about uh, new ways of promoting archaeological sites uh, today. Specifically, focusing on how we can use all these technologies and this data uh, to reuse it actually in order not only learn about uh, the past uh, conditions that uh, created and produced this. This, this heritage, but actually its value for uh, the contemporary users of our cities. Uh, I will be uh, showing an example uh, about the use of uh, ICT for raising awareness and uh, specifically something that uh, is relevant to those of you who are uh, interested in museology, uh, how we could, uh, a, a way at least that we developed in uh, about talking uh, for uh, difficult heritage in the museum space and uh, the use of immersive visualization for archaeological data interpretation. I know that most of you who come uh, from a museum background, you are uh, aware of this new amended uh, definition of the, of the museum uh, that was released uh, very recently, but uh, I put it there for, so that we are all aligned on the same page, and specifically because I wanted to focus on these uh, very important for me aspects that were introduced uh, regarding inclusive inclusiveness and inclusivity of the museum uh, uh, environment, the sustainability and community participation, of course, uh, through uh, unique experiences that museums should offer. So these are opportunities for us that we should uh, uh, try to strive to, to, to respond and address by using all this wealth of data that Sorin was presenting. So in this contemporary condition, heritage institutions are bestowed with an extraordinary responsibility, which is to build a more inclusive interpretation of our societies that acknowledges cultural differences, that is the many voices and multiculturalism as a positive drive for sustainable futures. And this is how I bridge and I link to sustainability. And this is particular, of particular interest today exactly because we, as we all know, um, the our urbanization of our planet is uh, very intensified and we have already passed the point where more population lives in urban environment rather uh, environments rather than in rural areas and we know that by 2050 uh, like 80 percent of the population of this planet will be living in urban environments which means that we will be coming across different cultures all the time which means that if we don't find a way to live together we will be having, we will be experiencing more and more uh, conflicts and competition. And we propose that, of course, 
uh, under, using heritage and understanding the common values that produced our heritage can help us uh, come together. So the question that I, I, I will try to pose through this presentation of, uh, of examples uh, regards how we can uh, how can digital technologies inform, enable interpretations, and facilitate uh, visitors to remediate the richness of the original cultural artifacts and the multiplicity of its associated stories and meanings. So narratives and meanings and how these are assigned to any piece of cultural heritage are central at, uh, at the core of our uh, question. So the first example that we'll be talking about to, do, to you today regards the uh, use of uh, 3D documentation and interactive visualization uh, specifically through an application of virtual reality for participation and management uh, processes uh, of uh, built heritage. And uh, I decided to present this example because for us it's a very, very strong and good example of how we can use uh, these technologies to, to produce really real tangible impact on, uh, on our environment. So we come to our favorite site, which is uh, the divided city of, uh, of Nicosia, which is actually a difficult, an example of difficult heritage, precisely for the trauma that uh, it comes with, uh, with it because of the, of the war and the division. And we will be looking at the, a very important historical neighborhood in Nicosia, which is the Paphos Gate area, which is uh, one of the three medieval gates of the historic city. Uh, where we have been collaborating with the uh, Department of Antiquities and the municipality, starting from the uh, very nowadays typical um, process of using 3D documentation for uh, studying the excavation process in order to provide to the excavators and to the archaeologists uh, um, and uh, the, the data and an instrument, an environment that they, they could really go back and study how they proceeded with the excavation and what uh, the, 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 the results of the excavation uh, could uh, tell them. And uh, exactly because of uh, trying to address and respond to this condition that you see here on, on your screen, how this space uh, used to be, which was a very, it provided a very fragmented, uh, actually, as I said, non-experience uh, of, of the, the urban uh, palimpsest. You can see the, the, the tourists there being just wandering around, what is, uh, trying to, to figure out what this uh, archaeological site is about. Uh, and we used, uh, in this case, uh, our digital twin of the, of the city uh, in order to start building a time machine. So building, creating models of how this area used to be in the past. Uh, you can see here some screenshots, how it was during the excavation and how it was in the, in the past. And uh, reusing this data, actually going beyond the uh, simple documentation of the archaeological site, to try and introduce uh, different stakeholders, uh, as well as uh, residents of the, of, the, of the area, into the history of, the, of this uh, site, as well as uh, engaging them in questions and dialogue regarding the, the management of this archaeological site, how we could actually uh, visit this, this, uh, this site and what we could do uh, of it uh, besides just putting a fence around it and adding like a couple of uh, panels to explain its, uh, its history. So we started building a co-design method with uh, different stakeholders, in including also officers of the municipality as well as archaeologists and the director of the Department of Antiquities to um, give them the opportunity to uh, draw different paths across the, the archaeological site. And while they were uh, experiencing and interacting in the virtual environment, we were documenting, we were monitoring their behavior, how they would move in this, the virtual space, where they would stop, what they would look, what they would find interesting, for how long they would uh, uh, wander around and they would uh, observe um, uh, ar archaeological finds. And based on this process and this uh, information, 
we came up with uh, a specific proposal for the reintegration of this archaeological site into the public space of the of the neighborhood and the network of um, of uh, walking uh, infrastructure in, in in the area and uh, this process was something for us very and it was internationally not only for us very uh, novel and uh, new and he it helped us a lot to communicate with all the relevant stakeholders and to convince them of the value of this and how this would have been important for the for the city and um, here we are today five years later where uh, we will be soon inaugurating the the site uh, which uh, not only has the the platform that we co-designed together through this process uh, constructed, but of course will be also providing an enriched experience and augmented ex experience to the visitors and the tourists uh, by means of um, ICT mo mobile apps that they would uh, um, inform them about their the past uh, histories of this uh, site. Of course, in the process, we have been using different uh, other um, aspects of the of the, of design. As you see here, uh, we have these um, uh, introduced these arches. Uh, that reminds of the arches of the uh, aqueduct that you see on your top left uh, corner of the of, of the slide, and you see them here today. How they will be really give a, a presence and uh, an an identity of the the the, the past existence of the aqueduct there. And this, we were very happy because this uh, whole methodology, this whole process was uh, selected as one of the two best international uh, practices in using uh, ICT for uh, public uh, space uh, creation by an expert group. And moving on to uh, our next uh, example, which uh, goes uh, further back in time in 2017, and it was about the use of, um, um, this time, mobile platforms more uh, cheap than typical uh, VR um, gear for raising awareness uh, about climate change, uh, specifically in the space of the, of, of the museum. So uh, we were um, involved uh, in, an in an installation uh, uh, by the Future Earth uh, Network in the Sol Biennale of Urbanism and uh, Architecture back in 2017, uh, where uh, the the topic of the of the exhibition was imminent commons. So uh, we decided that our imminent commons, with other parts of the of the world around the solar belt, is the impact of climate change, and this, uh, as we know has uh, its cause in many uh, interconnected uh, challenges, uh, including not only the uh, overexploitation of natural resources and the population movement, but also the impact of climate change. And um, we focus specifically on the role of uh, uh, extreme ano climate anomalies as a, as a way to really communicate to people uh, about the urgency of responding to this because uh, obviously, and this is something that we have been promoting largely in the Cyprus Institute through our uh, uh, initiative uh, about the, the climate in, in the region. We are a hotspot here, but uh, just providing the scientific data is uh, not bringing any change. The transformation needs to come also by changing our behavior. So we're talking about the cultural behavior as well. It's not only about presenting data. And therefore, we need to address the social aspects uh, through uh, narratives, uh, something that is obviously the, uh, the, the best um, that humanities we know, in the humanities we know best how to address this. Uh, change and how to make people to communicate uh, to people about uh, their behavioral change. So we used uh, the historic core of Nicosia. We collaborated with our um, colleagues here who are uh, experts in climate and they are doing all the monitoring in uh, now KRC. Back then it was under the EWRC center. And we specifically looked at uh, heat waves, uh, dust storms and uh, rainfall. 
and be exactly because these are um, phenomena that uh, are uh, very impactful in in our uh, cities and of course they 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 have a very very strong impact on the the built uh, environment and our built heritage uh, of course um rainfall is not new to nicosia because of its uh, uh rivers uh and you see here the kind of installation we produced where we used uh mobile devices to uh immerse the the visitors of the exhibition in visualizations of uh of these specific uh, climate uh, anomalies that I that I mentioned, uh, contextualized in a, in the space of the museum, uh, that provided also the historical background and the, the 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 context of the history of the of the city. You see here Kitchener's uh, map projected on the on the table, uh, together with uh, some uh, animations. And this is the kind of experience that the, the users, the visitors of the, of the, of the exhibition uh, had, where they could uh, really see, um, immerse themselves in, in animated uh, environments of uh, these uh, climate uh, anomalies, based on visualization that we're using uh, observed data of the past, you see, from uh, 1950s until uh, the day of the of the exhibition, as well as simulated data for for the future, and you see here the visualization of Daston. and the next example that I want to talk about, uh, I, I still have some time, right? Uh, is uh, how we can talk, use uh, v virtual reality and immersive uh, visualization to engage people in the space of the museum with difficult heritage and uh, I will be uh, talking about an installation we developed uh, in the context of uh, uh, an exhibition that we co-curated last year at the State Gallery of Contemporary Art here in Nicosia with a focus on promoting the value of uh, modern architecture as heritage uh, in Cyprus and, and in the region. And specifically, we, we studied on uh, uh, an unpublished uh, archive of, uh, of a local uh, architect who was very prolific in, in, in his, uh, his work. So besides uh, the presentation of the, of the, of the archive, uh, we also integrated in the narrative of the, of the exhibition uh, multimedia representations of um, specific topics that emerged out of our study of the of the archive, as well as a, a VR uh, installation, as I mentioned, we chose specifically for that VR installation in order to demonstrate this this um, power of of uh, immersive visualization a very difficult topic to talk about the inaccessible site of uh, Varosia in in Famagusta which uh, actually is an area, a site that is uh, stuck in the buffer zone and it is under, it's supposed to be under the control of the UN, but it is mostly in its larger part uh, under control of the, under the control of the, the Turkish uh, army and it has been uh, recently um, uh, opened, at least some parts of it, uh, producing a lot of social unrest and discussion between the two communities about this decision of the of the politicians. And uh, it's an important site because uh, it's uh, th probably the only master planned city in, in Cyprus. And therefore, it's a perfect example for us to start developing, um, you know, uh, ideas uh, about how we can talk uh, um, around the big challenges of our uh, urban environments uh, today. And uh, so we chose specifically from this side uh, a, a, an important building that was designed by the architect uh, whose archive we were uh, studying in the exhibition, which was a um, seaside recreational center. And we, we built uh, our process for reconstructing this site, uh, not only on archival material and drawings that we discovered in the, uh, in the archive, but also in crowdsourced material and, and photographs from, from the web. And uh, you can see here some uh, screenshots of the um, virtual reconstruction and the, the original. 
uh, from the, the photographs. Uh, and as I mentioned, we tried to use uh, these, uh, this uh, process in order to uh, introduce and engage the, the visitors of the exhibition with the, 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 the data that uh, we were producing, but also to engage them in a dialogue uh, regarding the value of these, these, uh, the, these buildings. And uh, of course, um, something now, as I will be closing to nearing the, the end of my presentation, I want to introduce a very important topic which for us drives most of our uh, activities, which relates also to what uh, Sorin was uh, mentioning earlier, which has to do with the context. So it, all these uh, technologies and all these tools, the biggest value we, 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 we assign to them and we find uh, in, in them is actually that we, they allow us to talk about the context. We, we now know that we, have, uh, we are past the time where we, uh, in, in heritage sciences, we studied the object completely detached from its environment, and we start looking at uh, how we can use these digital tools in order to enrich every study that we, we develop about uh, any example of uh, cultural heritage. Uh, within its context, spatial context and environmental context. And in this regard, for us, it was very important to introduce the visitors to how this, uh, to, to the whole experience of how this building was uh, envisioned, designed and constructed in a site that uh, it was by the sea uh, with nothing around it. And it, in, in the, the time of its life, uh, it was fully surrounded by high-rise buildings, which there you go. This is a topic of, uh, of interest even today uh, in many uh, countries and specifically in, in Cyprus. We have many coastal cities that uh, uh, they're uh, uh, th not only the coastline but also the high line of the, of, of the, build of the, of the city changes because of high-rise buildings. And of course, this introduces many issues regarding the, the management of the, the local environmental resources and the impact, the waste that these, these buildings uh, have. So for, for us, talking about this building and introducing the, the experience, this experience to the visitors of the, of the exhibition was a good opportunity, a good vehicle to start discussing about the rise of the seawater because this building was in front of the of, 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 of the sea and if you see if you notice the photograph in the beginning now it is totally the, the shore is totally eroded by the, the by, by the sea and uh, also uh, this introduce a discussion about high-rise uh, buildings in, in our cities and the most important point which regards of course difficult heritage and how we talk about difficult heritage. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time in trying and testing different ways of how we could represent these memories of difficult pasts in, in the virtual uh, environment. So what we ended up with uh, doing was actually, besides taking interviews, uh, conducting interviews with uh, past visitors and uh, users of this, this building, we uh, voice recorded interviews and then we gave the interviews to uh, groups of uh, performers and uh, artists who reenacted uh, parts of the, of, of the interview, specific memories, and we recorded these reenactments, and then this was introduced as spatial audio in this way in the virtual environment, using the photographs, the original photographs of, this, of the site, as the connector between the high resolution representation of the, of the past, of the history of this building, and the more abstract environment that the the, the virtual space um, and the, the, the virtual representation uh, would offer to, to the visitors. So the, 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 the virtual visitors would uh, feel as if they eavesdrop the discussion between a group of people sitting on the, on the tables and talking about the, the, the beautiful memories they had and what they were doing in that space. Of course, in everything that we do, we, we complete everything with uh, uh, yes, I will, I will be finishing now, uh, with um, surveys to link also to Francesca's uh, comment. And we, in order, because for us, it's the most important part is to understand how we can insert these kind of technologies and environments in the, uh, in the space of the, of the museum. And it was, of course, very, we were very happy to discover that 
for example, 79% were interested in listening to, to stories and narratives, and 87% would like to interact more with objects. Uh, but however, we were very surprised to, to discover that only 38% of the visitors would like to leave comments. Uh, in, in our world where we, ex we all exchange information on Facebook, etc., we like, we dislike, uh, it was for us surprising that they, they didn't feel the need to, to leave some comment regarding their um, their impressions, their experience, or even the memories, because this was a, a very big exhibition. It, it attracted more than 2,500 people in Nicosia, uh, which, for this, the size of the of the city, is a big number of uh, of, uh, of visitors. So we had many people that actually had real memories of that place, and we were hoping to get some feedback from them. Uh, okay, I will stop here. Then I had just another. Uh, then the last one, you can see it, actually you saw it already across the corridor. It's uh, about uh, Hirokitia. And the only comment that I have to make so that I can finish quickly is, um, to, as a takeaway, is that um, for us, again, it was the whole process a very interesting experience of collaborating with the excavator, with the archaeologist, uh, in order to help her uh, revisit their hypothesis. And this was actually proven as a methodology because she discovered uh, things that she, she, she realized that she hadn't understood correctly when she published her uh, results and she, she, she had to amend and update the, the results of, of her research solely because of her involvement in, in the process of designing together uh, with uh, Nicolas Luca, who is sitting back then at the, at the end of the, of, of the room, uh, painstakingly modeling the third dimensional of her drawings of the excavation site. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, both of you. Uh, we had uh, two uh, communication, uh, and uh, which shows the importance today of data, uh, how to uh, acquire data, and uh, how to uh, interpret data, and how the data could be. Uh, mostly uh, uh, interested, interesting to share with the object per se. It would be uh, interesting to, to hear later on that. So uh, maybe we can start with questions. Is there somebody who has questions? But uh, thank you, Vincent. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, both of you. It's a uh, two clear example about where we are going on. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe you, I am, I will be interesting in have a, a, to have your, uh, your feeling about what is going to change in terms of cultural heritage, in terms of architecture, in terms of everything. Uh, compared to, to uh, compared to what we have today, in fact, what we will gain really, because as you mentioned, we have a, a, a book of laboratory, we have a lot of things that finally do the job. Okay, um, I think that um, we have to look at uh, other disciplines to understand the change. Medicine, for example, understood that a long time ago. And in medicine, people collaborate quite a lot, even without feeling the need to do that, because it's part of the practice. And everybody gains from that. 
So I think uh, once we will understand that, we will see, we will see the gain. Now it's not uh, palpable, but uh, also because we are used to work uh, quite alone. We are used to work in a lab, we are used to work even on our desk. It's very difficult even to, to talk between two different desks in one laboratory. So once we will get over that, and I think this is kind of so a psychological step that we have to, to take, uh, we will see the gain because others did that. Mm. It's only for us to, to win. And the win that we'll do will be, of course, more knowledge, but a deeper knowledge of what we have, what we will have. Uh, if I may add to this, uh, I think the, for, for me, the most important part of uh, any kind of uh, application of digital tools or methods uh, uh, has to do with <coughs> enabling new interpretations and therefore producing new knowledge. Uh, so for that to happen, we definitely need open data, we definitely need how to process to handle uh, the, the whole workflow of data management. But before that to happen, we need to agree on what kind of qualities in each step of, of, the, of the, this workflow uh, are acceptable for, for the data. And after this, we can start talking about the, a paradigm change where we will be exchanging data and we will be collaborating, where we get past the point of um, putting value in the documentation process, since we will all share the same understanding and standards regarding the documentation, and we have access to databases of, of information, this will, be the, the, will lay the grounds for this paradigm change where actually we'll be finally be free to focus on what we do with it, this data, how we can really use it and rely on it to uh, come up with new, uh, new ideas, new interpretations, new interfaces in order to, to help the scientists and people, of course, to better make sense of, of this complex uh, representation of the past. I wanted to add something. Yeah, like yeah, just just to, to complete, in fact, because you mentioned that it, we, it, it is something difficult because we need that people adopt a new patient or new behavior. So how reach that? Uh, actually, I, I wanted to quote my professor when once he said, I was in a room full of data and I listened very carefully and I didn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. So, w there is a lot of data out. Really, there is a lot of data. Actually, everybody talks about overflow of data. What we need is to understand what we can do with it. And in order to understand what we can do with it, we need to educate ourselves even for, uh, to be aware that in order to put out the data, we need to do some steps for that. And uh, we should think that it's not enough anymore that I know Vincent, so I will trust his data. I know Francesca maybe, okay? So maybe I will trust her data, but I don't know Jurgen, so I will not trust his data. This <laughs> thing will not work. <laughs> <laughs> It's just an example. Okay. <laughs> this cannot work anymore. We have to be aware and we have to educate ourselves that we need to do some steps to justify what, uh, what we do. Because there is a lot of data already. What we need to learn is how to make use of it and how to interpret it in, a new, in new ways. As an architect uh, in particular, for me it's like impressive how much, sorry, I don't want to blame anyone, but uh, uh, it's, it's impressive how much archaeologists sit on their data and they don't want to share. Okay. So <laughs> uh, this, is, this is what I meant by digitization. Okay? I mean any kind of process that would uh, transform the knowledge of someone who generated it in order to be shared with, with others of the same discipline. No, but, uh, the example you, you mentioned, uh, very briefly, uh, but it's shown 
the next door, uh, Kirokikia, uh, as an archaeological site, Neolithic. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different disciplines which are connected, anthropologists, uh, bioarchaeologists, and archaeologists, uh, traditional archaeologists. And they have to merge all this data to understand fully the archaeological site. And what was, was mostly interesting was, uh, and uh, I met uh, the archaeologist, the, the French archaeologist, Odile Lebrun, uh, to name her. Uh, she uh, was completely, uh, in, uh, she was mostly interested in working with you, with your group, with Nicolas uh, Lucas, you mentioned him, uh, because it forced her to uh, look to the data to another, with another eye. And uh, I do think this example should be a, a good example, a good uh, paradigm uh, to be used also for uh, paintings, for instance, because there are different uh, uh, dis uh, disciplines which are connected. There are physicists, uh, there are organic chemists, there are also uh, specialists of imaging, there are also art historians, they have to merge all this data and uh, how to uh, interpret this data. They, uh, they have uh, this uh, uh, possibility to, to uh, share this data with the different public. It's a way to uh, understand the, the data properly. Sorry. Yeah. Um, there was a time when uh, UNESCO was able to uh, edict norms, in, in universal norms, like the identification of books or, uh, you know, things like this. Today, UNESCO has collapsed and is unable to do such a mission. Is there any sort of body which could harmonize and, you know, do, do we have any idea or we really in the dark there? That's one, my first question. And I have an incidental question uh, about the crucifixion that you have shown. You, you said almost incidentally that you, they found a painted craqueleur on the painting. And it happened recently uh, at the Louvre where they almost bought a Raphaelesque virgin, and when they discovered that when they removed the varnish, the, the cracklear was, was painted, of course they said, no, 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 we're not buying it, after the old, you know, forged old master scandal and everything. So, what, was there any sort of interpretation of this strange phenomenon? So, that, that's different questions, but. Okay. Um, I will start with the second one because I think it's easier to answer than the first one. Um, the entire uh, lower part was uh, heavily restored. But be the entire, almost the entire uh, part was uh, heavily restored. Of course, if you do this kind of heavy restorations, it would be too obvious. So they wanted to mild a bit the intervention. Um, actually, what uh, I, when I presented this uh, pipeline that we do, and this is also part of, uh, of the art test, is that whatever the question we have, we will conduct a series of uh, experiments and analysis. And throughout these analysis, we came up uh, and we saw the, crackle, the, fake, the fake crackle. So this also shows uh, uh, the importance of conducting this kind of uh, overall uh, investigation. Now, regarding the first question, which is more uh, difficult in a way, um, I think uh, every community will have to come up with their own criteria. So if it's good for you, okay, good. If not, tell me what, what uh, this is a question that we always ask in meetings. You want to share, I want to share my data. You want to read, uh, I want to read your data. Okay, what do I need to know in order to use the other's data? So this is a process, uh, an iterative process, that will kind of self-define the needs. 
Uh, UNESCO, as you said, it's a very broad, uh, it, it is a very broad uh, institution which tackles very uh, important uh, topics at a very, very high level at, at the end. And uh, the data quality is something that we have to define for ourselves. Thank you, so Maybe we have a last question, mm. very last. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fabian Thiel. I come from Frankfurt University. I'm professor of uh, property valuation and land use planning. I'm just a guest here, uh, but I found it very interesting. Your topic, it's about um, common, common heritage of mankind. When I do research, I always come to the property question uh, because we talk about things that is owning by someone, getting access. So I do research. We have a lot of data. What we don't know is property uh, because the things that laying is owned to somebody. I would be interested in your, in your experience uh, when I do a project with students. Varosha, for example, yeah, is a paradise for the Cyprus Institute. Yeah? Uh, we have Augusta coming from a, from a German perspective. A property division, how it developed over the time. The students will be dying for this project from architecture, land management, surveying, property. Yeah? It's always about who's owning the thing, who owns a painting, who owns a cultural heritage thing, would be our sciences, our data much be easier if, if there would be no pro private property at all in the world. So this is a more philosophical question. So a question maybe to you, to Soren, uh, what is your, your, your experience of getting data to the property owners to convince them to collaborate with your research? I think this is the first step, because if you do not have access to the thing, we cannot, pro we cannot progress with it, is it? Okay, um, I will take this question even at a higher level. Yeah. Uh, I was once in a conference called uh, Who Owns the Past? Yeah. Okay, so there was a huge discussion about that. Yeah. One of the challenges that we have also in heritage is that there are uh, buildings, monument sites that uh, become uh, orphan. There is no more community, for example. So who is the community? If there is no more community, the Heritage stops being heritage. Actually, there was a case from Germany where uh, a set of buildings stopped being on the list. They were taken out from the list of uh, heritage. So uh, be because, as you mentioned, it's a philosophical question, uh, there should be a community always. And if there is a community, there is interest. And I think this is the simplest uh, answer. At the end of the day, it is also a matter of uh, interest, of our uh, interest. Uh, property, I don't really know how to deal with that because I'm not in the domain, I'm not dealing also with the legal, uh, legal aspects. Uh, I think it's my duty to, to share what I do, both uh, because I'm paid by, by the government, so it's public money, but also it's a kind of uh, ethical and uh, moral duty to do that. For me as a researcher, I, this is precisely the big challenge and the reason why I am involved in developing these uh, uh, environments and these interfaces to uh, interact or to offer opportunities for interaction, valorization with new communities, exactly, precisely because uh, in particular in the case of Build Heritage, this kind of ownership is either very rigid or it is involved in very interesting phenomena. For example, like here in, in Nicosia and in, in many historical cities around the Mediterranean, uh, in particular if we want to talk about second or third tier cities where they are not very rich and they have not become like, you know, before 2000s, like in the 90s, uh, like uh, museif museified uh, historical centers, we ha they have been going through several um, uh, rounds of uh, and waves of uh, new inhabitants from population movement or uh, communities with migrant background, etc. So there you go. Okay, here in Nicosia, we have like the the whole historic uh, center is occupied, is inhabited by people who don't feel these buildings as their own heritage, but they like it actually. Okay, and this is part of our research that we do. They like it that they live. Uh, 
they live there in this, this environment. So how can we help? My colleague Vincent de Tal, who is professor at the Sergi Paris University. He was formerly uh, at the C2RMF, at the Center for Research and Restoration. Uh, and he installed there a laser laboratory. Uh, before he was uh, at the research laboratory for the historical monuments, where he was in charge of the mural painting. And so, uh, after his uh, large experience, he uh, is now coordinating a huge project in France called Espadon. And he will explain to you what Espadon, it has a uh, real uh, impact of uh, our discipline in heritage science. So please, uh, Vasa. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. <laughs> So uh, uh, I'm very, very happy to, to be here with you uh, today. And uh, I want first to thank uh, all the organizers. Uh, I know that it is a huge work for everybody. And uh, it is uh, <coughs> effectively a, a, a project that I will try to present, but uh, in terms of concept, in, in fact. And it is something we are conducting with uh, Romain Thomas, uh, that is uh, that presenting uh, this morning's uh, our room project. And uh, it's very important because it is a demonstration, and it is what I uh, I try to push uh, just before uh, the fact that we need to merge community. I am coming from experimental science. Uh, uh, Romain is a art historian. Uh, we have uh, in our community now uh, uh, digital things, and in fact, crossing our uh, specialities, we are augmenting our capability to finally questioning uh, our uh, heritage. And it is uh, one of the, I think, uh, a, a modification of paradigm because we, were, we are effectively going from uh, competitive science to collaborative science, but not only uh, to uh, separate view to, a, to give the possibility of sharing view. So, Espadon Project creating a dynamic, multidimensional, cultural heritage atlas ecosystem. So, you can imagine what is an ecosystem. It is not something uh, that is physically real and so on. It is something that will be the place where we can share our different uh, disciplines. So I will start, and it's important, I think, uh, to, uh, to start with what is heritage science. For a long time, we, are speak we were speaking about cultural heritage. Cultural heritage, we are designing objects and so on, and now we are speaking about science. Okay, heritage science. Uh, it, it means that it's uh, this uh, discipline range from fundamental to applied research in order to understand our cultural heritage and ensuring a sustainable development. It is, it is a way, in fact. And when, when we are looking to uh, what is heritage, it is very, very wide. It's, it's starting with, uh, from excavation with uh, archaeological site, but it could be building heritage, it could be book. Uh, here it is the BNF, Bibliothèque Nationale de France. It could be a new, uh, new uh, <coughs> cultural heritage, uh, modern art. It could be just storage area. So uh, it's very, very diverse in terms of kind of materials, in, in, in terms of concept, and it could be uh, immaterial uh, heritage as well. So it's completely, it's, it's something completely wi uh, uh, wide, and it's concerning everybody, in fact, because it's our past, and it is what it remained, finally, when we left. So it's something that we have to keep in mind, and in such a sort of way, it answers to the questions that I tried to ask before. Why we are trying to make it digit to, 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 to have a digitalization of that, of this knowledge? Because it is something that finally we will keep 
at the end, even it disappears. And we know with the war, with a lot of things, uh, it's completely necessary. So, but it's not only uh, a, a question of uh, what is heritage. It is, uh, in fact, a question of, of questions, okay? Of transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary questions. Object but himself have nonsense. Okay, a monument or building is a building. So, so, so the most important thing is, uh, what is the function of this building? Why it is uh, cultural heritage? What we are considering that it is important? What is representing? What is its place in history? What is its place in our uh, mind? And so on. So for that, in fact, uh, we can consider cultural heritage in different ways. The first one, the first way, could be conservation and restoration. What are the issues? The issues is, uh, for example, cultural heritage and environment. We just have uh, an example just before. Uh, if there is some modification of the climate and so on, we are not sure that we can be able to conserve properly the things. And we need to have uh, action in terms of preventive conservation, conservation and restoration. So for that, uh, we developed uh, in, in terms of uh, um, uh, experimental science, different kind of methodology, new methodology. You can see use of infrared camera in order to look at uh, the lamination of uh, mural painting, for example, using uh, new methodology of, uh, of uh, cleaning of, uh, of here it is a removal of varnish uh, with laser cleaning using OCT. Uh, we mentioned these techniques uh, previously, but we have a lot of things to develop in this context uh, for the future. So, of course, continue to have a new way of restoration, uh, less invasive, uh, better, uh, better control, etc., etc. But we have to uh, take into account the climate change in order to uh, emphasize the monitoring and to be able to ensure simulation for the future and prediction and then be able to act as soon as possible in order to limit, limit the, the action and to change in terms of preventive conservation an idea because today when we are speaking about, uh, in fact generally, huh, uh, about uh, uh, preventive conservation, we are thinking on controlling the climate. Generally, is that in museum or managing in order to limit the action of the environment. But in fact, uh, there is some people developing some things like in force uh, Vivi Tornari, and we are working as well in that direction that uh, a tool like holography in order to look directly at the object, what is going on, what's happened to the object, does it move, does it, uh, what is its state, what is its evolution. So it is what we have to, to focus for the, for, for the future in that way. So if we are considering uh, conservation restoration, in fact the challenge is through the material characterization Inventing on having treat, new treatment or restoration methodology, understanding well alteration mechanism, def, uh, define state of conservation in order to better define preventive conservation strategy. The second main area is knowledge of materials, techniques, and skills, where you can find ethno ethnology and uh, its cultural heritage, ethnology issue or study of materials. For that, we developed different kind of new methodology, uh, laser spectroscopic things, uh, using IBA, uh, ion beam accelerator, or synchrotron. tool, it was mentioned this morning. Uh, we have new tool in terms of uh, hyperspectral and so on. So we can get new way in order to better, better understand what we, are, what, we are, what we are looking at and understand the way on how the object uh, have been uh, built. How, what was the techniques in order to, for example, uh, create uh, this painting, how uh, Rembrandt uh, work in order to give this specific color uh, in, in the white of the eyes. It is, uh, it is something really important and for that we start to develop, for example, Lipsil Framan and we've pushed to uh, develop this kind of thing, merging different kind of instrumentation. 
ensuring the capability to get not only one information, but mixed information with a portable system, only for mural painting, where we can, uh, you can have access to the stratigraphy in elemental composition, or performing pulse Raman and uh, pulse uh, fluorescence, and you can get, in the same time, elemental molecular uh, information and more complete things. Through, so through these approaches, uh, in fact, we can define uh, a, a new axis in terms of challenges that ensure uh, to get dating and through material studies define at the end information about uh, social science uh, <coughs> and humanities uh, on deduced origin, trade routes, uh, historical approach, so better knowledge about our uh, past, okay? And if we continue to go in that way, and it is linked to uh, both of them, uh, there, there is a third big issue, uh, that is digital cultural heritage. It is something that is now clearly put on the table, and we have the demonstration with uh, both presentations before, that it is a point that is completely support all over the, the world in terms of, of what we have to uh, focus uh, in the future. Uh, the good demonstration is the restoration of Notre Dame de Paris, where the CNRS uh, supports a huge program about, in order to localize the different stone and the different, in order to reconstruct uh, the original uh, vault that fall down and so on. And of course, and there was a demonstration in the last presentation, uh, cultural heritage and society with a new methodology to see and to look at the things, so to communicate and to disseminate. So for that, we are entering and we are already uh, managing with, uh, with Roma uh, this, pro this project Espadon, and we are involved with the Cyprus Institute, uh, with, uh, with Sorin through Digilab, Eris IP, and we are going to answer to ETCH, so European Collaborative Cloud Platform for, uh, for Cultural Heritage that is uh, support, uh, supposed to come in uh, next January, in order to have this development not only at the national level, and we try to have the maximum thing at our uh, French level, but it makes sense because it is cultural heritage at European and international, international level, because as uh, it was perfectly uh, demonstrated by uh, uh, Francesca, uh, you have a Van Gogh uh, in Paris, uh, in Chicago, uh, you can have uh, uh, artwork disseminated all around the world, so if you want to compare it, in fact, you have to share the data. You have to be sure that there are, you get this data in the same manner, with the same quality, and uh, then trying to have and to find the common point. And to do that, uh, you have to be sure that everybody is aligned in terms of how we are going to work in the future. So it is, it is, it is uh, one of the main points. And below that, as I see uh, the different aspect in terms of different instrumentation, different way to look to the different things, we can integrate uh, this uh, collaborative behavior that is coming not only from experimental science, I, mo I show some spectrum, but as well, word, for example, pigment alteration. And here, if you look to these things, I don't know actually if I can point out, but here you can imagine that you have at the end what kind of file, so we have to work with a data scientist, not a, a specialist of a digital uh, about that, and mathematician. We can imagine that we have a file with all the, the different spectrum, but as well as words, concepts, etc. And then with a multimodal approach, extract new information, new information that are not identifying if you are just looking to one or two uh, separate techniques, and it is something that is like opening a new window in order to go further. So this will ensure what? This will ensure that through creation of data-based, uh, working on 3D model, we can better uh, ensure 
achieving the, the, the information, getting a better conservation possibilities, and then ensuring mediation, museography, dis dissemination, and teaching. And it's very important because this new tool, in order to teach, will ensure that the new generation finally will immediately uh, uh, catch this new tool and play with it, and we will go to the next step. Because we are too old and we are not able to evolve, it's clear. But no, in fact, it is, it is the point, in fact. So uh, this tool will help us to finally teach and to uh, give this uh, level of uh, understanding. So it was more or less the, 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 the preliminary point about uh, the reflections that we put on the table with, uh, in order to uh, create this uh, project, Espadon project. So we, we went through this project starting uh, two, one year and a half ago, uh, addressing new instrumental issue. So the first one is to go from point analysis, analysis to 2D, 3D analysis, ensuring spatialization okay, of the information. So the model could be a nutshell where we can put the information okay, coming from everywhere. Uh, ensuring multidimensional aspect, multi-scale, multi-temporal. Of course, we need to have these uh, diachronic things, uh, and we need to uh, look at the things from micro scale to a small detail in order to understand probably a specific kind of alteration that gives us the information that the colors that we are looking are not the right one. Okay, so we need we need both. Uh, and the problem, and I'm showing multimodal, I just uh, demonstrated uh, before. But the problem of that, immediately, and when we are looking to OCT, uh, just uh, two, two or five millimeter by five millimeter of data is about two tera octet of data. So we face a huge challenge about the data treatment, about the storage, about the processing, and about the exchange, how we can manage with that. So then we need to have a complete uh, support from people that are specialists about digital to do that, because it will be in terms of uh, uh, carbon, uh, carbon effect terrible. So it is something that we have to take into account from the, from the beginning. But we are going to manage, manage this uh, digital transition, transition. So we need to federate and to train scientific, professional communities, and finally ensuring uh, that everybody uh, integrates new, new practices, as well uh, people that are not uh, directly working with that, uh, from uh, social science and humanities, for example, what is the elemental block in, uh, in, in history, uh, in terms of knowledge, it is something difficult to, def to, to define. In experimental science, okay, you have a spectrum, you can say it is my quark uh, of data. Uh, in history, what is the quark of data? Uh, how we manage that? And how we ensure that around we have metadata and paradata? So if you want to replace it's the same ecosystem, we need to have that. Huh? And then the objective is to unleash the possibilities at the end to access to artwork, as well for researchers, but as well for socioeconomic work, and to disseminate at the end to civil society and to public actors. And then, with that, we will be in position to be proactive for the different projects and future projects. So Espadon is, is, is built on a, a, curve, a curve that we can, you can see here that is mainly supported by Fondation des Sciences du Patrimoine. I am ensuring the scientific coordination, but the Fondation... Uh, uh, five minutes is not possible. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a uh, huge uh, foundation that have the change to represent, as well as the CNRS, but the Ministry of Culture, different kind of uh, uh, public establishment like a museum, Louvre Museum, uh, Musée du Quai Branly, etc., etc. So it is very interesting for that because we have inside this uh, community and this foundation 
all the partners that can represent the world of uh, cultural heritage, and not only researchers, but as well uh, we, uh, we, we have this. And we have uh, compl complete our team with different labs coming from experimental science, data science, and social science on humanity, humanities in order to cover more or less everything. And we are inside, and I will go faster because Michel is going to, uh, to beat me. So, uh, le, <laughs> an ecosystem that is as well national and international with a huge of different initiatives for a long time. Okay? And uh, of course, the idea is not to start from scratch, but to uh, make a mapping, a cartography about what is already developed, what is working well, what is the, the state of maturity of the different things, try to join the different teams that have this capability and coming and starting from the best tools in order to go further. Okay? So it is a strategy that we try to do. And we have this concept, that is a concept of augmented heritage object, that, is, uh, that I will try to, to uh, describe uh, very shortly. Uh, we are starting from the, 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 the object, the museum, the site, the collection, or the, or the concept. It is uh, patrimonialized, of course. Why? Because, because we decide that it is. Ah, it is on the list of UNESCO, it, is, uh, it represents something. So it means that there is documentation around. Okay? So if we are able to have complete documentation around this object, we get a documented object. Okay? So with the correct evaluation of the information that is present all around, we can identify the gaps, the, le the lake, that are around this object. And finally, we can uh, ask a question. It is what I said from the beginning. Could be in uh, social science, could be in uh, experimental science, could be in materi materiality, could be of conservation or restoration. But we will ask a question, and then we can uh, finally put the result ensuring metadata and parallel data on this object in order to have something that is directly, directly uh, working inside and in accordance with, 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 with what will be this new ecosystem at the end. Okay? And it, it could be iterative. Each time somebody else in another domain is asking, he continues to give some blocks of information that is going to enrich uh, this object, this concept, this aspect, and so on. But it, yeah, in the same time, it is continuous, because if you get with satellite information about climate of the, in order to follow uh, the variation, in fact, it's continuous information that is enriching, and then you can go uh, to, uh, to disseminate this information to the different people. If we look at all the people that are generating knowledge, not only researchers, in fact, the field is so huge as well. Because you are not only researcher in uh, art historian, uh, history, uh, history, physicist, uh, conservation scientist, and so on, but you are also a lawyer, you have anthropologist, you have archaeologist. All these people are working in different ways. So we have to find something that is common in order to go, uh, to go uh, in the right way. So we build the, the project in different work package, some development of new instrumentation, and integrating the different aspects that I described uh, before. And the idea is to be able to have at the end the most uh, possible, the most best, the better ca uh, capability to describe an object at a different side, uh, at a different scale, and merging this information, you know, uh, getting uh, a better, better answer depending on the question. So, uh, first with uh, X-ray things, uh, in a second way, developing a new uh, beam line um, able to perform 2D uh, scanning of uh, easel painting. You have here 
what you can obtain with IOB accelerator here with XRF. You see the difference in terms of quality, uh, in terms of precision of information and so on. So uh, it is one of, of the objectives. Um, in, uh, another one is uh, working in the development of new tools that are not existing. For example, multi wavelength society or other kind of techniques that could give you, for example, for this manuscript, the capability to get better information in terms of provenance, datation, attribution, or uh, structure and manufacturing in order to uh, uh, get conservation, state of conservation, and uh, to make a good decision in terms of restoration and conservation. So you see that everything is inside. Uh, are independent of the question, but you need the same, the same tool to describe it. Uh, I will give you a, a, an example. You, uh, I'm still uh, speaking about OCT. We uh, worked some uh, two years ago, Michel, I think two years ago on, on, on uh, Mona Lisa uh, during this day uh, that uh, where well, uh, it is open. So, uh, Vincent, you have not the right to, uh, to tell about that because it's not published. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we work on a different uh, area where um, we have already some data about uh, uh, color characterization uh, and so on. And uh, you can see the different things. And the idea was, so how is the technique of Leona? Uh, how he make the shape uh, of the ship, for example, uh, how is the veil, and so on. So I will just give uh, two examples in order to, 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 to understand well what, what we can gain, in fact, looking at this, uh, at this different aspect. If you look to the, to the cheek, in fact, the chest, sorry, in fact, it's very simple. Uh, you just have uh, a layer, probably a preparation layer in, uh, below, but you cannot see it, and a, a varnish layer that is here. And in turn, if you look to one point, in fact, it is this thickness of the varnish layer. It is clear, it is on the surface, and it is something we can see. But if uh, you, look, you look to the shadow on the cheek, it's completely, completely different how it's going on and how it's modeling. You can see that inside, you have some small layer. You see, in two, in four, in five, and so on. You can see here, in between, something that is more or less each time positioning inside the varnish, like a glaze, OK? And this, finally, is the way how he managed in order to play with I did the shadow. So we follow all the lines and we see the increasement of the presence of this in, inner layer uh, in, inside the varnish with the same, probably with the same kind of resin. Okay? And then you can have access to uh, the, the state of conservation of the varnish, of the surface, and the crack of the painting. So you can have other kind of information like that. And if you look to the veil, Ah, it's not at all the same. You have a clear line that is the veil, and you can see that it's positioning all along the, this representation, and it's not at all the same. So probably the first things I show you it was the uh, way how and the manner how uh, Leonardo. Uh, Finally, uh, ensuring the representation of the sfumato. And it is, we are able to put a number on it and to define it. So anyway, we will uh, continue to do that. But it gives something that with Neke, with other instrumentation, you cannot get. So it is a reason why we need to continue to that. Oui, Michel, oui. <laughs> we, we, can, uh, we can also, and we have also worked at the mon uh, monumental scale. And one thing that I want to mention that is really important, it is through the different work package, we have thematic tasks that are, in fact, concerning every different uh, work package. And we organize 
with, uh, with uh, Roma, Roma is managing that perfectly, uh, general assembly of heritage uh, data, including all the different specialities. And you see we create, in fact, not 11, but 10 uh, specialities in order to get, you know, uh, uh, conservator, curator, documentalist, uh, science, uh, sci uh, conservation scientist, architect, conservator, and so on, in order to, and with, with, with all community to have specific work on what they are producing, what kind of data, what kind of database base they have, how they are producing the data, what are the format, what are the things, and then in order to define this uh, new ecosystem all together, coming from uh, the, the bottom, not, and it is a bottom-up processes and not a top-bottom, in order to, to be able to ensure this co-creation. So ju just to give you, yes, 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 yes. An idea, you can imagine a researcher inside, inside a museum or inside a site that is going with any tools, here it is, a, it is a specific tools, but with any tools. He's looking or working on specific objects. He can get information, he put some information about this object, uh, looking at specific, I don't know, shape, or color, or aspect of alteration, or question of uh, uh, art history. And then he can, with that, have a first level of information. He can go after, if it's necessary, inside laboratory, complete this information, and at, at, at the end, due to the fact that everything could be placed and finally gate coming from everywhere, we can put in correlation with all the different concepts. Okay? So it is more or less the idea of this future ecosystem, and for that, we need the collaboration of all of us, of all of you, from the beginning. So you are welcome, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vincent. It was a great and uh, important also to see how uh, you can merge all this uh, discipline uh, in one is heritage science. So uh, in one of the slides you mentioned, I saw close to the Cypress Institute, there was the NICAS. And the NICAS is uh, my pleasure now to present uh, Dr. Robert van Lang. And I'm so pleased that he managed to uh, be with us. <laughs> he, uh, and uh, uh, Robert, is uh, head of conservation and science in the Rijksmuseum since uh, maybe uh, more than 15 years. He, has, he was a goldsmith uh, at the beginning and then a metal restorer, metal conservator. He has a PhD on the bronze uh, renaissance in the, in the 2012. And uh, he was uh, recently able to uh, manage to uh, build this NICAS. And uh, maybe you will give a, a short, uh, NICAS is a, a kind of a consortium which has been built and to uh, get uh, private fundings in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands uh, in heritage science. So uh, please, uh, Robert, I'm very pleased that you, you are here with us. Uh, and the title of your uh, talk is the uh, interdisciplinary approach ask for a different type of recognition of the knowledge of a conservator. Thank you, Robert. What a way to come in. Uh, thank you, Michel, for the invitation and, and for all organizers uh, that I can uh, stand here in front of you. Uh, I will indeed say a little bit about uh, Nikas and actually the reason that I literally just arrived was that I, uh, uh, we had our Minister of Culture and Education and Science and our Secretary of State of uh, Culture last night at the Rijksmuseum where I was to guide them 
uh, through a two-hour talk uh, and actually to go for, let's say, Nikas Plus. How can we really define the Institute for the History of Materials uh, in the Netherlands, combining everything and everything? But first, a question. How many of you speak Greek? Can you please raise your hand if you do so? Oh, luckily. Because the thing that I'm going to talk about will involve something as to, well, I'm not really sure. So in order to win your hearts a little bit, I will do the following. And that is Aspri Petrak Sexaspri Kaptuniljok Sexasprotri. And if you don't... Ah. And if you don't believe me, I can do it also fast. Aspri Petrak Sexaspri Kaptuniljok Sexasprotri. Anyway, uh, that, is, that is just to define I love anything that has to do with Greece or Greek language or... Uh, related to it. The Rijksmuseum, that is what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about something completely different. The interdisciplinary approach asks for a different type of recognition of the knowledge of the conservator. Now, some of you might think, is this necessary? Yes, this is indeed necessary. I've been working in the museum for 29 years, and uh, I remember when I first came into the museum as a conservator, indeed, thank you for Michel for already indicating, indeed, I'm a goldsmith, a silversmith, and sculptor by training. Then I uh, became a metals conservator, and afterwards I did my PhD, both in material science and art history. So I dare to say that I know a little bit about the field, having been in a museum for a very long time. I don't know if you were able to read my abstract, but this is concerning for people who have an, a, a master's training in uh, conservation. So, and where, when I entered the museum, it was really like I remember uh, uh, the head curator at the time, and I was a metals conservator, he gave me like a polishing cloth and he said, there is your collection, go polish and go away. And it was very, and, and, and I have an excellent collaboration actually afterwards with him. But the point was, that is so strange, because if you think of what a conservator and then a trained conservator is doing, that is really strange that there is no more appreciation actually towards what this person is doing. So first about the building itself. Always I think when I look at this picture as if it's, if it's, as if it's not real, but it is real. It's 9,000 square meters. I don't have a point. I do have a pointer and I think... Oh, oh no, that's not what I meant. This probably also not what I meant. Doesn't matter. I'll forget the pointer. Um, the building itself... Yeah. It is, it is there? It's there. It's, it's the top. Yeah, oh, yes, thank you very much. Um, like I said, it's, it, the building itself almost looks like as if it's planted there and, and it doesn't exist, but indeed it does. 9,000 square meters of education, uh, research facilities and conservation studios. Just behind the Rijksmuseum, as you see in the center of Amsterdam. Now, uh, from the NICAS point of view, that is the Netherlands Institute of Conservation, Art and Science. We were uh, governmentally funded. We received, uh, let's say, a stipendium of 5 million euros to do research, and that was in 2015. That is the reason why yesterday the minister came and I was like, okay, come on, you got to do more. And uh, basically, that's the very Dutch approach to what it is that we need our money for. And... Uh, if you want to see what it is that we're doing, because it's a really wide diversity of, of, of at least 50 different topics, from developing uh, new equipment, from uh, making use of what is already there, but always on a true collaboration between, let's say, the humanities, science, and conservation. And conservation, that is what I'm going to talk about, the history of the materials, the material historian. So there I come with my... Uh, which I did in 2012, actually, for the first time in my uh, uh, propositions that where I wrote, actually, the conservator is a material historian and, and is not being acknowledged as such, but really that is the case. And of course, I'm going to explain that with some uh, uh, slides in a minute. Why do I say that? Now, the object plays the key role. Not true, I would say. The public plays the key role because we're not doing this for ourselves, even though we love this, but in a smaller community like we are standing here or like we are here, then I would say that the object is, of course, the key. What is it that we want to know? Why do we want to know? I love the previous uh, presentation as well as to seeing uh, the amount of, of people. You can put, indeed, 30 people around it or three. It doesn't matter. It's, it's really basically, for me, it is humanities, science, 
and material history, or actually the conservator playing a role there. Of course with the public and of course with all the other aspects that you can think of. So you can make it as big as, as, as you wish, but the essence, of course, lays in understanding the object, in knowing how to read the object. And that is something that we need to do with, uh, among ourselves. So the history of materials is where you can read it here, conservators study the materials used in objects of cultural heritage. They determine which materials may have been used at certain points in time and recognize the processing traces of the tools used based on their practical knowledge and skills. All in collaboration, clearly. Everything is always in collaboration. But the point, of course, based on their practical knowledge and skills, has always been wah, put down. Yes, you are practical. And as a result, you work with your hands. And as a result, we don't take you seriously. At least not as seriously as we, as curators or art historians, are. Let's face it. And I'm happy to have done my PhD in art history and I dare to speak like that clearly and also being in a museum. This is where uh, I think 10 years ago we said, okay, there will be no more differences in pay between the curator, the conservator and the scientist. And there is no difference between in pay. So therefore in, in recognition for the field, that is something, and I, I, I'm not sure if this happens at many places, I know it doesn't happen at many places. And this is something where I think, not where we think that we are exemplary, but how it should be, simply as that. Um, now, a practical point of view. So, here we are looking at a small statuette. I did my PhD on this one, the Hercules Pomarius, which was cast by Willem van Tetterode. And um, when I was doing this, I... In 2008, I gave a presentation at the Frick where we were talking with all experts on this field and saying, you know what, the, the fact that we see this little thing here at the shoulder sticking out, and I have some more detailed pictures of that in a minute, is actually where we would say, or where I would say, the difference lays there already in the understanding of the object. Of, of course, from a curatorial point of view, it's not so much interesting what it is that we see there. However, from my point of view, that is exactly where it becomes interesting. And it's this little, what I would say, Nike huh, sign, and it's a piece of metal that is connected to the bronze itself. And, 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 and now I'm going to explain to you how that actually came to be there. And I will do that with short explanation of, of how a sculpture like that is being made. So in step one, you see the armature. We're making a hollow cast bronze, so it's a hollow sculpture, and it's called a direct method, meaning that we make an original, like a one-off. In step two, you can see that step two is, is like, let's say, 95% of the sculpture is finished, but it's 95 or 98%. And in step three, you can see that this is all wax. Right? So the, the yellowish color is indeed what is then finally wax. Now, why is it called lost wax casting? Because the wax you're going to lose. How are you going to lose the wax? We will see in a minute. But what is important to recognize is that whatever it is that we have in the wax is something that we will also have in the bronze if all goes well. Now, these black pins that you see protruding and sticking in through the, core or the, 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 the inner core, so to say, they will finally hold, as everything is mounted around it, they will finally hold, when the wax is being poured out, those inner core and the outer core at place. Now, what is very important is when this wax at step four is then being put with, the, let's say, the first layer of the material that will be the part of the greater, the outside mold for, uh, for what we see here. So on top of this wax, what we see over here, we get this finely thick crust, but that has a buildup of one very fine detailed sieved layer of material, what you can think of a plaster of, or an, a clay material. And then on top of that, more cores, etc., till we finally have the whole uh, thing as we see on step six. Where then, where the wax was poured out because of the, uh, the clay that was being baked, then these little pins, as you can see, they hold 
the spaces just in between and in top of it. So with the, the funnel you can see at the top over there is where the metal then pours in and goes around and then comes back up up here and then finally you have your bronze. Now I've done this myself many times and afterwards it's quite interesting you have to what they say you have to chase it you have to chisel and chiseling is what you see with all these chisels and, 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 and chasing punches what you have and then you do the work yourself. Now the fact that here is that that, that Nike sign could never have been there if this whole surface would have been chased. Now, how do we put that historically in a, in a perspective? First, by reconstructing, of course. Can I reconstruct these things, what I see on the left? Can I reconstruct them? Yes, I can. And can I actually also analyze it? So I used a lot of neutron uh, imaging and time of flight neutron diffraction. I did much of my research at uh, the Rutherford Appleton uh, Laboratory in, uh, in Oxford. And it's merely to show you that actually the science behind it is also solid. It's not something that it just comes to our mind. So when the history of material becomes technical art history, that is the other term, of course, which is frequently used, and that is where I divide it, so to say, at two. <clears throat> this is a description, or actually a definition, that is done by the University of Utrecht, where people are say, or where art historians are saying we are technical art historians, or technical art history is defined as such. But technical art history, and that is perhaps a little bit too detailed, detailed right now, but I want to define where people are saying as art historians, I'm also a technical art historian, but they're placing their knowledge basically on the knowledge of the conservator, which, who is a materials historian and <coughs> should be recognized as such. Now, I go back to that sculpture, and there I have various events that took place that are actually then part of the art historical aspects, the technical art historical aspects. And Giorgio Vasari, in his first edition in 1550, this is all about those bronzes, and can you make bronzes, and how is that being done? You don't have to read it all. It's just that basically the tools that are being used are the ones that I've shown you here on the right side. And afterwards, you get a bronze out of the sculpture, out of the mold on the left side, a sculpture by Rustici that we see. And there on the, on the right side, we see where it's completely polished. So you can see the differences in finishing techniques that you would have to do from something that comes out of the raw mold, depending, of course, on the first soft sieved clay layer that is on top of that wax or then finally something that we see here on the right where it's completely chased and completely uh, polished. Now, what is interesting is that Bienvenuto Cellini, uh, in 1560, uh, 1566, when he finished his, his work on La Vita, uh, he wrote it from 1558 onwards, he actually said, well, because this is about this sculpture, what I showed you, this Hercules Pomarius, is something where no chasing took place. And that is the whole aspect that in the 16th century, people were able to cast bronzes without having to chase it. And here he says, Germans and French, uh, French, uh, Frenchmen pretend that they can cast bronzes without retouching them. As you can read more, as, as you see at this slide, that this is all about how to make these bronzes. And what is very interesting, that Giorgio Fazari in a second edition, so Fazari at first in 1550, that he published about it, and in 1568 in a second edition, and then he writes the casting of figures, large as well as small, so excellently that many masters make them come out in the cast quite clear so that they do not have to be chased with tools. And that all of a sudden made a complete change and then actually taking place in Florence. But then the aspect was, of course, was this always in Florence? And no, of course not. It was, in this case, already done in 1549 in Germany. And then at the level of casting for what was done there, and you can see the skill bar here on the right, the extremely detailed casting that is still nowadays where to whichever casting foundry you go, they do not produce this. And that is quite striking as well, I would say. They cannot produce this. And of course, you can do it with the new techniques, but not using the old techniques. So finally, and this is also 
the, the Maximilian uh, cenotaph, there it struck me as well because I was almost finished with my PhD and then my, my advisor from art history said, well, it's nice for what you've done, but now put it in the context. How do we look at this at the rest of the world? And there we had King Arthur in 1513, I might say. So where you can see here the chasing patterns of the hammer with the, uh, the chasing punch that took place. And then finally, you see here those, those similar parts, uh, the finning, as we call it, as uh, for what we also saw on the shoulder blade of that sculpture by Hercules Pomarius, the Hercules Pomarius by Tetterodo. Now, to give you more examples of why uh, a materials historian is also a conservator, is, for instance, the work for what we uh, see here, examples from other disciplines, where we are reproducing the techniques as to, and, and actually by inventing, oh, I wouldn't say inventing, but looking at Diderot, for instance, and then reproducing what has been done. How can we know that this was done like that? Here we have, and, and I think it's all, of course, pretty known, these things. And you might say it's not so special. Indeed, we also do a 2D, 3D project, uh, meaning that you just take 2D uh, uh, x-rays, but then writing the algorithms in such a way that you can, uh, without having the CT scanning possibilities, that with 2D scanning possibilities, that you can create your own 3D uh, images like that. Now, with that is to visualize the internal surface of voids. But, and this is also very important for the things that we do for combining the knowledge of the conservator, materials historian, with the other fields, is what is the problem? So I love it. I see so many times new techniques which are being developed. Okay, but what problem are you going to solve? Did you talk with one another? Did we talk with one another sufficiently? Is there sufficient ground to go for all these aspects that we are looking at? And in many cases, or not, I wouldn't say in many cases that it's not fully the case. The only thing is it should be the case. So when we start doing research and all types of research that we can think of, that is the first question. What problem are we going to solve, I find? Uh, the problem that we want to solve with this is that actually using these techniques, and if you then have a good detector uh, and then a high enough uh, resolution, you can detect fingerprints. You can imagine for terracottas, which are sufficiently all over the world, that the fingerprints are inside of the sculpture. We have them, uh, what you're looking at here on the, on the left side, or uh, yes, on the left side is a model by Gregor van der Schacht, who worked in, in the uh, mid of the 16th century. Now, like this, uh, one of our fellows right now is doing, uh, uh, well, she's defining to what level can we indeed define on the inside of these models, which fingerprints are by who. So Artus Colinus, for instance, also a famous sculptor who made, I think many of you may have been to Amsterdam, well, the palace on, in the center of Amsterdam was all the sculpture on there was done by Artus Colinus, and he made all these terracotta models for it. And, and now we can correlate that. So now we study the inside of these sculptures and we are solving an art historical problem because the art, art history is saying, well, we think that this is by Colinus, but we don't know for sure. Hey, can we now use this technique to go inside? Well, clearly, I rest my case. Operation Nightwatch. On one painting, I, I easily could have talked about this and then for hours. Um, why? Um, I think this, this, these are all different researchers, uh, 25, uh, oof, that I have it all correct, uh, our team consists of 25 people, meaning conservators, scientists, curators, all working uh, together, but also uh, ranging from uh, uh, synchrotron research uh, for what you see here, OCT, yes, where is OCT? Uh, we have done that as well. Uh, we, we, we do force, we do uh, inventing new techniques, we're applying the macro XRPD uh, technique together with Kuhn Janssens. Uh, we, uh, we of course, for our, this is a, <laughs> we consider this the national painting. It's, the Rijksmuseum was literally built around this film. This, this is the masterpiece, the choir, so to say, uh, of, of the Rijksmuseum. So we believe that we have to know everything. But again, Problem-based. The night watch is not a guinea pig. It has to be something where we have a question and where we can solve the question as a result. 
So the recognition of the knowledge of the conservator also as a material historian is something where I think where the appreciation uh, towards within the museum field between the curator being usually not always an art historian or an historian where the conservator in many cases longer trained at least in some countries can also be considered an historian but then of materials. I thank you very much. Thank you so much. So uh, we have a short period of time for questions. So uh, despite of uh, Vincent is no more uh, the same place and you always have questions, maybe there is a question from the auditor. Yes, please. I have a question for Vincent in uh, Esperanto. Microphone, please. Hi, I have a question for uh, the Esperon project. So the goal is, if I get it correctly, uh, integrate all sorts of knowledge bases into a database, and if not integrate, but at least bring all these inputs of organizational structures to create uh, an easily accessible, um, either new or a new version of an old one. How far do you think you are in that process? And at what point does the research, um, do we have a, like a, a usable prototype to build on? And how do we find it? You, you mean when on, or how? <laughs> well, uh, when? When, I don't know. The, the program is supposed to go on for eight years. Okay, but uh, we uh, are going to have, uh, as I explained, a support uh, coming from uh, international community and to have more support coming from all the professionals working around this idea. And uh, I think that if we manage properly, we can, uh, we can manage uh, and have it, have it in uh, about this, this time. But the, the, we, we are going to come to, to work by bricks. You know, the first one is to ensure and to try to ensure that all the communities as, as that are producing knowledge in uh, cultural heritage, anyhow, have some tools in order to ensure environment of what they are producing in terms of metadata and paradata. <coughs> in order to be able to play at the end in the ecosystem. So we can imagine that the more uh, we ensure that it could be adopted and uh, as well for artists, huh? for example, that are producing something, they can give information on how they work. Huh? It could be uh, something we can imagine. If we have these first things, before having the complete model and the complete ecosystem, with thesaurus and uh, control vocabularies, we will start to have the first uh, level of the ecosystem. And then we will grow up. Each time we have uh, uh, supplementary um, uh, capabilities for 3D representation, for uh, absolute uh, repositioning, for etc. So it will be. Uh, uh, in progress system, uh, ecosystem. So the first brick could be uh, maybe uh, available in one or two years, you know, not working completely, but still having some capability to put in link information. And then 
and it is uh, one, uh, one of the points, is that we need to ensure a co-construction. So we need to have the contribution of everybody in order to answer and to have a representation that corresponds to the needs, to the need of a conservator, to the need of the curator, to the needs of a conservation scientist, to et cetera, et cetera. So each block, each brick has to be built corresponding to the needs, for example, for an art historian, what he want to, how he wants to represent the things. Even you have properly uh, ensure uh, uh, the environment of with metadata and paradata. Okay? But it will be something in progress and appearing, I hope, as soon as possible. So, uh, one, one thing was uh, very important what uh, uh, Robert said is about what is the question about uh, before starting uh, any analysis we have to have a question, a proper question. And so uh, uh, maybe I have a question to him about uh, the, uh, the Nightwatch project. Is uh, of course, it's a huge project. It lasted uh, more than a year, uh, as far as... No, 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 no. When this was also, let's say, quite typical at the beginning when um, uh, the the... the let's say, the directors, board of directors said, we're going to restore the night watch. I said, well, we said, no, we're not. We're going to research the night watch. So we've been doing that now for July 2019 till now. No decision has been made whether we're going to treat it, meaning uh, taking all the varnish off mm -hmm. and then all the uh, retouches off. Uh, this, is, this is really has proven to be, uh, when you do solid research, then you come to the findings that you think like, hmm, we have been seeing this, but this is actually really the, the wisest thing that we can do. And, and as a result, we did restrain uh, the, the, the whole uh, painting, and that definitely was part of, of the conservation of the treatment. However, we are still in a deciding mode, uh, and we are about to make a decision as to what it is that the next step will be. And that could very well, I, I, would, I would think we have 54 terabytes just on the painting. Uh, and, and But we are using those 54 terabytes now on the painting. If you see the, the work that my colleague Rob Erdman is doing as to, to see, hey, I see a little bit of a problem down here in the painting itself. Can I use artificial intelligence to see where else in this painting this is taking place? Then you need the data and we're making use of the data. So it's not, it's not I wouldn't say bragging about the, the amount of data that we have, but you should have the data that is needed to, to, to answer the questions that you have. And, and so as a result, we are not there yet, in, or we haven't made a decision yet. And whatever decision it will be, it will be something, a project where one will still see the glass house in which the night watch is in right now, and it will be at least for another year, and perhaps even 10 years. But the only thing is, everything that we do, it's our Mona Lisa, uh, I would say, uh, then it's a little bit bigger, but and it has, as a result, perhaps more problems, but I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's just something we have to look at very carefully and take wise decisions on. But it's not possible to do such on every painting of your museum. And well, so how it can be... Uh, well, uh, funny enough, that's not entirely one. true. We, we, I, I don't know, Vermeer, some of you may have heard of that. That's that mm -hmm. painter who makes the uh, girl with the pearl mm -hmm. and, and uh, that. Uh? No. <laughs> uh, I, know, I know he knows. He's the he only knows. one who has treated the girl uh, with the pearl. Uh, have you not? I mean, yes. Uh, we're going to have an exhibition on that where, um, uh, in, in February, where many of the techniques that we used for the Nightwatch were directly applied as well for the Vermeer. So we are using those techniques now for everything that we do. The only thing is you don't want to do that for everything that you do. You take it as an example, and you take it as uh, pushing the field. This is where we have to go. Well, I would like, first of all, to congratulate all uh, the, the, the two speakers, actually all the speakers who have learned a lot today, 
but uh, uh, especially Professor Robin said that I, since this morning, since we sat in this room, you have been asking questions. But uh, I do believe that with your Espadon very dynamic project, you answered all questions. Ah, uh, 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 well, uh, we collect data, thousands, millions of data. All specialists do these things. We collect like hamsters. And the question was, what are we going to do with all this data? Okay, I, I, uh, can, I, can, I can just answer this question very simply, in fact, because it is, it is a great question. The, the beginning of this idea to, uh, of Espadon, from the beginning, was uh, I, 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 uh, I, I am coming from uh, you know, nuclear. Uh, I, I have a PhD in, uh, in uh, the development of instrumentation and so on. I'm not at the, at the beginning uh, 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 in, in, uh, in cultural heritage. And uh, I enter in, uh, in a research laboratory of historical monuments in 2004. And I remember I started developing uh, lips for mural painting uh, because I was the head of mural painting. Uh, uh, group and I want to characterize some alteration and mm -hmm. pigment. And I have a question. I want to characterize that, but I need to have plenty of information in terms of uh, wh wh which spectrum I will have, if it is uh, vermilion or something else, or sulfur, uh, mercury sulfur, and so on. But I want to have information about date of, date of creation history of the monument, et cetera, et cetera. I need to move the documentation with me in order to help to answer in a better way. Okay. okay. Yes, so I, I do appreciate point, that. And the point of That's the why I admired what you said. Uh, and uh, what we all, uh, all specialists do is to create knowledge, to share knowledge, and the final target is to improve the world we live in and the lives of the people we live with. That's the final end, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Efosin. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my question would be, is there a final saying, uh, for instance, to Rembrandt's uh, painting had been Unbalanced at one point. At one point, uh, can it be restored? Who will decide this? And uh, you know, for restoration decisions, for attributions, is there a fin final saying? And to whom, you know, it goes? Does it go? In your opinion? So, so the, do I understand the question, uh, the question correct as to who decides on what is being done? The f the, fi the final decision. The yes. fi final saying. For attributions, for instance, for attributions, or for, yes. for, for discussions on the techniques or yeah. for restorations, big decisions like this and very sensitive decisions. Mm -hmm. To whom goes the final saying, in your opinion? Ah, to the collaboration, again, clearly. I've been in so many... But there, there's a decision which must be better. Yes, yes, and, one if point. and, and I've been in so many times... And, 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 and I'm, 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 for instance, part of the... Um, uh, at the TAFAF, the European Fine Art Fair, um, I'm a, uh, a member of the vetting committee. There okay. was always just based on uh, connoisseurs. So uh, let's say art historians who are saying this is that. This is a Frans Hals painting. I'm not sure if you know about Frans Hals, for instance, where um, uh, I think a decade ago, where a scientist actually found out, oh, you have been recognizing that as, as a Frans Hals. Well, I must tell you, there's a fellow blue underneath in the ground layer. Uh, sorry, that's 20th century. As a result, if you don't combine knowledge, if you do not start to combine knowledge, of course, in the general perception of the field, it's always like, oh, it's the art historian. No, 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 sorry. We have really have passed that stage. Of course, many still want to believe that they are in that stage. I'm sorry, I'm a strong predictor, or not predictor, but strongly saying, if you do not collaborate, if you do not combine the knowledge from a materials historian slash conservator, from a scientist and from an art historian, and that you then say, what do we look at? What do we think that we look at? And ask questions, then you will make mistakes. Okay, thank you. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book on this case.
Je une question à faire à, à l'Espadon Projet. Euh, je me demande s'il y a, d'après la loi française, une différence entre la conservation et la restauration. Parce que vous avez montré les deux termes ensemble sur l'écran. Ok, I, uh, in fact, it's... Uh How it's done. It, it is something that uh, explain, uh, was explained by you perfectly, uh, Robert. In, in fact, in French, there is les conservateurs. So the, the conservateur is a curator. And les restaurateurs, they are the conservator. But they are uh, fighting for a long time to have the name of conservator curator. Really? Yes, in terms of uh, to have this appellation. Conservator restaurateur. Conservator restaurateur. <laughs> to, to have, because, because they uh, are considered, considering are just people that are managing with the things. Without, you know, it's typically French. You know, the article things. And uh, in and fact, that is, that is there is a clear difference be in between, but... Uh, that was my whole point, because if you are not an historian of art, but an historian of materials, then you're both historians, and considered as such, then you don't have that debate anymore. So I think what one important thing which has been uh, emphasized by Robert is that the conservators are uh, matter historians. And so, uh, because <laughs> what you didn't say, in French, restaurateur means also the people who work in restaurants. <laughs> so, uh, and so, if you Google restaurateur uh, in French, you, you don't, don't get, you don't get uh, the art conservator, but uh, restaurant. I really, um, okay, I'm going to go back to something that Robert mentioned and you mentioned as well about the importance of the, of the question as a driver for this kind of interdisciplinary research, which I totally agree in principle, but I have to also admit that I feel that as we are immersed in this journey of, of exploration, we have to retain also awareness that uh, we can be also opportunistic with the, um, with the new capacities and new possibilities that we don't know. Because for example, Anastasia, and I'm going back to the first and, uh, talk, and she mentioned the work we did with RTI on the, on the El Greco, and that was total opportunism. We had just gotten our kind of RTI dome, uh, there was uh, an exhibition here at the Leventis Museum with the uh, El Greco paintings. And then we asked, can we put them under the RTI dome? We put them. Then Robertos gave me those images. I did not know what to do with them <laughs> at all. But then in time, just looking by that, then that began to make sense uh, in an art historical uh, Wait, okay, so, so let's, uh, I, I just want to, to throw that out, that sometimes this is what happens. Oh, I love it, what you just said. And I can tell you why in a, in a short sentence for that. First, you have to collaborate and then accept with one another that you are on an equal level. And then, as soon as you are, you have to start pushing the field. You have to start asking questions. We do match days with uh, Nikas where we say, Please, humanists, come, tell us what your problems are. Tell us what you think that needs to be solved. Doesn't matter what it is. And let the sky be the limit. And then the scientist, oh, but hold on, I, I can do something with that. So together we can push the field, then again, problem-driven. 
And, and that is the point. But I fully agree with you. We should not be standing, uh, sitting back in our chairs. No, we have to go forward and really show also what this field, cultural heritage, the interdisciplinarity, what that does to other fields. The macro XRF is now used by the National Forensic Institute in the Netherlands to study actually uh, crime. Is this uh, with the gunpowder and, and etc. Et so we, our field, develops new things that finally, in the end, is also good for society in many uh, possible ways that you can think of. That is the strength that we have. So yes, couldn't agree more. So maybe we have a short break yes. uh, after, before the, the last. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, break for coffee and then we're back for the last uh, discussion. Thank, thank you. you so much.
people who are following this online. So I think we went over time several uh, moments, but I think we uh, gave enough uh, uh, time frame windows that allowed us to at least now begin 10 minutes after five. So this is the last uh, part of the uh, symposium. It's been a fascinating day for all of us. I think you would all agree that we had the chance to uh, hear really, really engaging and amazing uh, work, um, different aspects on art characterization. And I think uh, definitely as we spend the time tomorrow with our international guests, I think there is plenty of uh, topics to discuss about uh, future plans where the field is going. And uh, the final session, we thought when we were planning this, and this is something that actually was developing and evolving until the very end uh, of the planning of the program, we thought that it would be a very good idea to share with our guests, but also with, uh, with uh, those interested, our own experience at the art characterization, at the Andreas Peters Art Characterization Laboratories with innovation and commercialization. It was truly an experience for us that took us out of our research comfort zones. Uh, I, in, I feel very happy to have here three people that were, uh, let's say, to a large extent, responsible for this experience and this uh, out of our comfort zone um, journey. So we have with us, uh, we have with us Karen Golmer, who is uh, Innovation Manager Emerita at the Despante Center at MIT, a member of Innovation Corps, uh, I-Corps program at the National Science Foundation, and also a mentor of the Cyprus Seeds program and a mentor of our own team, Artes. We also have uh, Maria Giorgiado, Managing Director of Cyprus Seeds, who has been uh, holding our hand uh, through the whole uh, journey that you will hear a little bit about. And also we have uh, our own um, Nikos Orosidis, who is the CEO of the CREF Business Ventures of the Cyprus Institute, related to, to the Cyprus Institute, co-founder and chairman of the advisory board <coughs> DMR uh, AI-driven insights. And Nikos also has been the, uh, the person and the mentor along with uh, Fabio Montanino uh, and the other members, uh, Annex and other members of the uh, innovation uh, office uh, at the Cyprus Institute. So we thought uh, originally, we thought of having presentations, but we realized it doesn't make sense for our uh, for, our, for our topic, and for this reason, we kind of uh, decided to have this roundtable discussion. And I will start by just uh, uh, going back to where we started this, this morning before I kind of ask questions and I try to moderate this, uh, this discussion. So, uh, I'll take you back to, sorry, sorry. Uh, and um, so I want to take you back to where the team starts. I mean, APAC is a team of interdisciplinary uh, young researchers and scholars. Uh, this is where it all starts. We heard about many interdisciplinary teams from around the world uh, through the day. Uh, we realized that there are a lot of similarities, a lot of uh, common interests. We also try to work and analyze and uncover hidden secrets in works of art. We use digital technologies and analytical methods to study archaeological material. We have plenty of those in Cyprus and in the region. Uh, you saw some of our results and some of our instrumentation in the next door in the exhibition. I want to thank all the uh, members of our team for uh, making that available to us. We visualized monuments like one of these looted churches from the north of Cyprus, the Church of Christ Antiponitis. You saw the development of a brand new instrument that, is, uh, that we are developing in collaboration with our French partners. And also, we also have our own pipeline. We saw that with Espadon and with other teams. 
we also try to kind of integrate different approach and different uh, um, perspectives on works of art. And I will end with one work that in a way kick-started for us our engagement with the concept of innovation, at least as far as I understand it, because I'm still, I, I, I'm, I'm still a learner. So definitely curiosity and discovery drove the, uh, the study of this particular small painting panel attributed originally to El Greco studio. Our work and our methods we were able to identify um, the signature that was unknown, a signature that had significance for us because it's a particular way that Byzantine artists uh, signed and actually it's the closest, here Dominico, it's actually the, the closest comparison is the adoration of the Magi at the Benaki. Okay, that is great. Me as an art historian, very excited. Uh, the experts, chemists, digital experts, excited about making such a discovery. Good for our research publications. The result was that the painting was now included as an original El Greco in the big exhibition that took place at the Grand Palais in 2019. And there is definitely one aspect that didn't really concern so much our team, which was the economic aspect of this discovery. That what was considered, and actually we had the foremost expert, uh, Sorin uh, likes to tell this story, identifying and saying that this is not an El Greco, it's not uh, good enough for his art. And then the signature and the other details that we provided uh, secured its inclusion by the curators as an original El Greco. And you can imagine how much is um, increased the value. And this is when, this is what the first case where we kind of brought to the table when the Institute and, uh, and you guys uh, started engaging us, uh, trying to begin to, to help us to begin understanding that there is also a different possibility for us. Because we are used to ending our work where the, when the research publication comes out. Okay? So after having um, followed a full day, Karen, a full day of presentations by uh, art historians, conservation experts, material historians, as we heard from, from Robert, um, so I wanted to ask you, because you kept telling me through the day, my world is expanding as, as somebody who also has a great interest for art, being an artist yourself, I wanted to ask you, what do you think now about innovation in the arts and the humanities? And that, do you, I mean, does it exist and what is it, its potential? Okay, thank you, and I really appreciate being here. I feel intimidated with all this research, but I want to repeat a couple things that were said. Okay, so Soren mentioned earlier the importance and the approach to technology and art kind of depends on what you need to know, okay? And Robert mentioned, well, what do you want to know? And Vincent talked about sharing and, and really concerning everybody. Um, so I'm going to phrase that a little bit differently and say, who wants to know? What is the problem you're solving? It, you know, it's not just research, researchers that want to know more about the work. So, so the economic value of the El Greco, how did that change? The Titian. I, what, how did the value change when you discovered that, okay, that was the first original, there's a painting underneath? You know, there are numbers associated with that. And, and who wants to know? It's not just researchers, but you're talking about art collectors, you're talking about art consultants, um, certainly auction houses. So there is a need out there, and, and I encourage you with your technologies you know, to consider that need. Um, but depending on the problem you're gonna solve could certainly determine the technology. So we encourage you to get out there and ask them. 
what is it that they're looking for? What kind of problems do they want to solve? Um, how can you help them? Nico, I wanted to ask you about the Cyprus Institute. I mean, we are, you've been with us for many, many years. You've been following the interdisciplinary development of research at the Cyprus Institute, yet you've been always trying and pushing and helping us to begin to think and go in the direction of innovation and commercialization terms that I had never really understood, spin-off, spin-outs, all these uh, ideas about uh, that are related to the commercialization of the market. And I wanted to just ask you, in your experience, how our work and our field, coming from the humanities, fit into the um, environment uh, of the Cyprus Institute and beyond? Well, I'll um, take it from where Karen left off, where I think uh, what you mentioned is absolutely spot on. Where I would extend that conversation is the, and that actually uh, is the experience here at the Institute, which is that in making that leap from research to innovation, and you carry that further to the stage of venture creation, then the centrality of what Karen was mentioning, which is the customer getting out of the lab and talking to real customers and asking whether you're actually solving problems, not just generally, but specific to the kind of segment that you're targeting, be it curators, be it museums, be it uh, insurance companies, be it collectors or whatever. So only then do you begin to formulate some kind of a plan or a business model, as it were, as to how it is that you can create ventures that are sustainable, that can actually create a sustained value. And I think that is a mindset change that is, as you mentioned, Nico, is, is not an easy one to make, because a researcher actually is uh, employed by an institution, a university generally, or a, a research institute and uh, finds it hard to think in terms of, well, I've got a company now, I've got to pay the bills, I've got to pay the scientists, I've got to actually do something with the equipment, uh, I need to rent it, buy it, or whatever. Uh, I need to source certain things, and can I make ends meet at the end of the month? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Can I do all this in a way that actually uh, creates value? And creating value in the venture creation context is actually making some sort of revenue and on top of that some sort of profit, etc. Et so that, that, I think, the entrepreneurial part of innovation is absolutely key. It's something that we... Yeah, sorry. I, I just want to add something. You asked about the potential. Well, I'd like to share, I mean, there's evidence out there that the technology is important. I mean, look at Christie's and Sotheby's you know, certainly investing in technology companies. Um, the digital art world, I mean, that's certainly not something I understand in terms of digital art having value, other than the digital twin, I certainly understand that part, but I mean, people, you know, people selling something for 69 million in 2021. I mean, there's evidence that technology has a fit out there, so I'd encourage you to, to consider that. Nikos mentioned the necessity for a change of mindset. Uh, admittedly, it hasn't been easy. And for us, we were the first uh, team to attempt that coming from the humanities, from the arts. And uh, from the side of Cyprus Seeds. Uh, tell us please a little bit about Cyprus Seeds, but also what was your experience um, and your first impression, if I dare to ask, when we first started engaging. With pleasure. Uh, okay, so a few words about Cyprus Seeds. Um, it is a, a new initiative in Cyprus. It was launched about four years ago. Um, it was a private initiative of a Cypriot philanthropist 
whose vision is to keep the talent in Cyprus and to, to bring even some of those who left uh, to bring them back uh, because he believes that there's true talent uh, on the island and it's a matter of convincing them to take what they have been working on in the lab and bring it to the market in the form of innovative solutions and s have impact in the world, not only in the art and culture, but in the health, the environment, and any sector of the economy. So Cyprus Seeds has been supporting this, this vision, uh, mission, by giving grants, um, mentoring, training, and networking opportunities to scientists from the universities of Cyprus, centers of excellence and research institutes like the Cyprus Institute. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very proud of, of, of the 10 teams who were selected uh, to, to be supported by Cyprus Seeds uh, during two cycles uh, because they have progressed not only with their technology but with their mindset. And I come to that point about the mindset, uh, Nicolas. Um, and the point made also by, by Nigos, uh, that changing of the mindset is a continuous effort, a continuous uh, objective, if you, if you like, which is critical to bringing about uh, results in innovation, in entrepreneurship. Um, especially when it comes to changing the, the mindset of, of people from the humanities, in my opinion. And I have witnessed it with the artist team. But you didn't know that when you joined uh, uh, Cyprus Seeds, um, that some people, including Steve Jobs, believe that t technology to be truly brilliant should be coupled with artistry. You didn't know that. And you don't know that a lot of people, a lot of CEOs in technology companies have training in art, history, and humanities. Did you? So there you go. You still have to remain with Cyprus Seeds a few more months. <laughs> we, s we have to teach you that as well. <laughs> so your question was, how did I find you then when you firstly joined? You and the team, Sorin, Athanasis. Athanasis was not there at the beginning. No, okay, so. And uh, guess what? Athanasis is our champion now in the project. What does that mean? Champion for the Cyprus Seeds program is the person from the research team who will dare be an entrepreneur, take it to the market, go with the company, go with the challenge of that uh, uh, of, of the market. So, so I think that speaks for itself. We started with two professors, Nicholas and Sorin. For about a year, they, they wouldn't understand the language. I don't know what was going on. I was thinking, what did we did wrong, I said. We selected wrong. <laughs> but, but then all of a I, sudden... I knew they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and mind you, it's not me who evaluate. It's we engage uh, experienced people from the MIT, from the US, to select the very best that they, this island has uh, from the applicants. So. So, but we were being patient and we were thinking there must be something there because the MIT people told us. <laughs> so with the help of Karen, who was their main mentor, we were convinced that this team has definitely a, a unique technology. Definitely it's a team and that was important for us because if it were an individual effort, it wouldn't have gone so far. It was a team. One complemented the other. And I, I still remember, by the way, Nicolas, uh, the very first presentations you were uh, doing, you were doing them, mostly. No, no, before, before Thanasis. It was you. Uh, in the pitch, at the beginning of the program, back three years ago, one of your slides, the slide that said the team, there were about 20 people on that uh, slide. W whilst, whilst the other projects would have three. So I said, this must be a good team because they acknowledge the importance of a team in commercializing and in progressing. So, um, yes, I believe we took um, a project that had a unique novel technology, um, a good team, but th they didn't have at all in their mind what that prospect of their unique uh, technology was in terms of commercializing it. 
even though they did have from then uh, customers. That magic word, customers, because commercialization means you have something that somebody wants to pay for it. You have customers. So they were selling their services to, I don't know, museums, individuals. Andreas Peters is also uh, a huge, an, an individual art collector, a huge believer in what, in what they're doing. But they didn't know that that technology of theirs had commercial value. So in conclusion, I think the last three years, I have witnessed a transformation from um, what could have remained in the lab forever to something that could be one day a unicorn. And I mean that. And a un Karen is laughing. You don't believe it? I believe it. A, a unicorn is a company that makes uh, that uh, uh, makes revenue uh, mo mo that attracts income more than a billion from potential customers. So here we are. I have this person next to me. I'm trying to convince him that in the spin out, I would like to be a shareholder. So I think that answers it. I, you know that. Uh, I want to ask, uh, before I ask uh, Nikos and Karen about um, what they see as uh, the challenges, but also the opportunities, both from looking from outside, but then Nikos also looking from the context of the Cyprus Institute. I want to briefly, because this has to be told, I want to ask Sorin uh, to tell us when we gave that very first presentation internal that we I remember that you got up in front of uh, uh, of Costas, uh, Nikos was there. I don't remember who else was there uh, to pitch the idea and what was their original response. Briefly, briefly. So, first of all, I was shocked by the concept of uh, elevator talk. That was something that I have never heard before in that context, because for me, elevator talk is a small talk. Good morning, how are you? How are you? In the lift when you go back, go down to the parking and go to work. So uh, um, the impression was after that talk was like a really cold shower in Siberia outside, <laughs> <laughs> minus 40 <laughs> degrees. But actually, I think it uh, helped. And we did a yeah. U-turn. And since then, it was better and better. <laughs> so what do you think? Uh, challenges, both from uh, the interior in the context of a research institution like the Cyprus Institute, Nico, but also as you look at it, Karen, with your experience from outside. Let's hear from Nikos. Okay, well, just to take it from the elevator pitch uh, idea, I think the the key problem, and again, we return to this whole thing of mindset, it's, it's, it's jargon now because everybody says mindset, mindset, mindset. But it, it is true, though, that researchers formulate the problem and the challenge to the problem in research terms. And usually, the challenge there is to make somebody really understand that message, a message that resonates, that makes you understand what it is all about in layman's terms rather than jargon, or, or scientific terms, let's not say jargon, because oftentimes they're, they're sort of uh, 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 conveying the gist of the research in their terms, yeah? So the elevator pitch is actually aimed at distilling the essence of what it is that you're talking about in ways that you can even tell a friend of yours. Like, for example, can you imagine if you could have a technology that reduces the temperature of a building 10 degrees from the outside without the investment that requires blah, blah, blah. So this is one of the uh, ventures that we have here, which is called mesh, yeah, for example. Or the medical imaging. Can you imagine if you had resolutions uh, good enough for the doctor to be able to ascertain whether blah, blah, blah. 
So if you formulate it in that way, the client says, really? You, you can actually do that? So th that's the, the essence of what it is that you're talking about in an evergos tool. If you are then uh, reformulating that in research terms, then we get into the, uh, the problem of uh, the, the curse of knowledge, as they call it, which is that you can't imagine somebody not knowing what you're about to say. And lo and behold, most people don't know what you're about to say because they don't, they don't understand the terminology. So anyway. Uh, I, I think that's a great intro, intro to what I'm going to say. So quite frankly, the, no, 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 really, that's right, yes. But we are like minds, right? Okay. So uh, the elevator pitch is great, and I think it's distilling the value that you're going to provide to the customer. I think that the, the technical terms really, you, you get into the specifications, and the spe specifications are not what's important to the potential customer. It's the value that those specifications are going to bring. But I think the real challenge is determining what the problem is. Specifically, what does that customer need? And you're going to find, I mean, you've got different, uh, different customers, different customer segments in this artist's project. So it's a question of, OK, who are you talking to? And how can your technology help them specifically? And it, uh, to me, it's not a matter of pitching, it's a matter of learning you know, what their problems are and okay, so what do you have that could fit in here and actually provide value to them? Thank you. Of course, now I think that anybody that wants to kind of uh, participate and contribute, I know that uh, our guests and beyond have had uh, kind of comparable experiences or opportunities and challenges with aspects of our work now um, being uh, formulated or taken in the direction of a service or then specific um, achievements like, I know here that uh, Van Sant, for, for example, with, with, the, with the making of new instruments that actually are innovative and unique. I mean, this is where also this is a very, a very also equally important aspect of our, our characterization field and our work. So feel free, this is not just, this is for us, for all of us to have a discussion. Uh, so if you have any mm -hmm. questions or comments to make, please feel free. Sorry, you, you want to use this? Uh, I wanted uh, to ask Maria again a bit. Uh, we are the only team that comes from social sciences and humanities. Currently, right? In the two cycles, yes, but yeah. for the third so cycle starting next year, there is actually one more. So, uh, even though you mentioned several times technology is related to artists, you are primarily uh, social sciences and humanities. So, what was uh, what was uh, it? If there was anything uh, different in uh, your approach to us and our approach to you, being from this uh, domain? Your approach in comparison to the other projects? Mm -hmm. You mean? How do they get in? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Both directions. If you're asking me how you got in, you should ask how. No, 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 no. But if no. you're this asking I me how you differed in the no. process and during the two yeah. cycles, that's a lovely question because I can answer it. So um, I have seen in the artist team three very important ingredients which uh, I personally believe are essential to the success of a business, which you don't necessarily see in, in, many, in many projects. And those are, I saw in you, creativity, critical thinking, and agility, flexibility. You were definitely satisfying all three throughout the, the two cycles which were in, sorry, no, one cycle, I'm sorry, I keep saying two cycles. You were with us in the second cycle and you're continuing third cycle. So let's say two years with Cyprus seeds, I have witnessed this, this uh, characteristics. Uh, I, I don't necessarily, and, and I think this come from your training in liberal arts. I, I strongly believe that. I think people who train in liberal arts um, 
acquire these skills and they don't know that they have them, but they're essential to becoming a successful business. Why? Because the world is changing on a daily basis. So you need to be agile. Why? Because you know, every day is different. So you have to be creative. And why, and, 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 and why is critical thinking essential? Because it's all about that, if you ask me. So you have it and you don't know it. So compared to the other teams who were not in the humanities and they're most of the teams trained in the sciences, in the math, these things which I don't understand. <laughs> um, they, they, are they are a little bit different. They're very strong with their technology, but w we don't see so much progress in, 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 um, in moving forward with the business aspects as you guys. You guys have made jumps, and uh, maybe it's the mentor, the mentors, Maybe it's the fact that you, you got lucky with some doors we opened for you. Maybe, m maybe you realize that there is something there for you which you want to, uh, to discover, but you got it. So I hope I have answered. I'd, I'd like to add another characteristic. You had credibility. You already had touched on that. And that's really significant. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, thought-provoking discussion and very uh, these interesting perspectives about innovation and entrepreneurship. I would like to ask you how do you define progress? So from uh, someone who is involved in this effort, either from Nicolas or Ian or Nikos, or even uh, the mentor or Maria, uh, some uh, critical uh, steps during these two years that uh, certify the city's progress. I'd like to take a stab at that, and then Nicholas, maybe you can add to it. Uh, frankly, I don't think we define progress. I think the team defines progress. I think it, it, it's just like objectives in any job. If you set the objectives, you're much more likely to achieve them. If somebody else sets them for you, um, that's not quite. Now, not to say that there might not be a negotiation here, but I think it's the team that needs to set the objectives and meet the progress. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Uh, I think the uh, key milestones that relate to how the team, specifically this particular team, has uh, defined progress is that they've gone out, talked to different types of customers, and came back with a pivot in the way in which they used to think about the solution to the problems. And that gradually refined through these conversations, experimentation, and then going back, defined the proposition in a much more fine-tuned and granular way than was the case in the beginning. Uh, now, by talking to additional customers, they also came to realize that certain types of uh, problems were being addressed to the wrong people. So that's, that's a finding. So I think that on the customer front, there was considerable progress, and then that came back to redefine the kinds of solutions that we offer in a much more robust way than we, we had before. So I, I, I guess me that, that would in fact be the, the progress and I think talking to you on a very we uh, on a very regular basis helped sort of do that fine-tuning yeah? so, so uh, yes I, I I do agree with uh, Nikos and uh, Karen the, the progress Vasily you know, to be an entrepreneur, it, it, it's not uh, uh, like you're in school and you, you know, you tick the boxes. Uh, you know, it, you're, you want to be an entrepreneur. So I agree with Karen. It's the team, the project itself, to assess if it's making real progress. And, and also what Nico said, um, the customers tell you if you make progress. 
so because it's all about the customer, as I, I mentioned before. Uh, so so you, you want to reach somewhere, a point, and, and you think you've done well, and then you go to the market and you, and you ask a, a customer, I'm here, would you be interested to, to buy what I have? And he tells you, well, no, if you do this, I would be more interested. If you progress in this manner, I may pay more for this. Uh, so the customer is essential in, 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 in giving you a hint if it's, uh, if it's going in the right direction. Yes, Anastasia. And meanwhile, I just want to quickly say that for us, for our experience, uh, from our experience, and for me especially, because now the effort is led by Thanasis and we're going in directions that we follow, but I don't feel that you know I, I fully sometimes understand. For me, progress was uh, clarifying uh, also the relationship between until now, every time we were getting requests for work, we were, I mean, Sorin and I were kept thinking about it as research collaborators. So we're always thinking, what's the new f frontier in research that we have to tackle and invent? And that's how we were dealing with a lot of, of the increasing requests that we've been having for work for some of our specialized, the more innovative aspects of our work. So once we started thinking about this and identifying, for me, it was a big discovery, wow, there is a market. And uh, I, I started understanding what that means and understand that there are ways that we can contribute to this market and there are very challenges in this market. And that kind of, for me, that was progress. That was like a step forward because it provided me with some clarifications about where, where we stand and what, what this challenge is. So can you hear me? Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for this discussion. I find it very, uh, very interesting and very, you know, today it's what, what we are all discussing, I think, um, in one way or another. Um, I was wondering, I mean, the whole day we've been discussing um, how science and <coughs> art history and conservation um, should work together as fields um, with historical questions uh, as the basis probably to be um, uh, the, the foundation for research. Um, and this, of course, does not, um, does not leave uh, innovation and that entrepreneurship outside, uh, quite the opposite. But I think that there is a question whether you, you think that the customer's needs should be allowed to redirect or define research. Because I think that we have two different, two different aspects uh, in this discussion. One is the, the definite need to distill uh, scientific jargon, let's say, into um, uh, a language that can be easily uh, comprehensible by a general public in order to understand the, the real use, usage of this, this research. But this is one thing. Is it the same? if we try to put at the beginning the needs of the customers and then define the research according to them. Because I think this latter is a very slippery um, road for uh, our field. It, yeah, and actually, you can see me jumping in my chair ready to answer. <laughs> um, no, research, research needs to continue. I, and don't, don't mistake you know, what, what I'm saying. Research is so important, and you need to continue and push the boundaries. The difference is when you decide to commercialize something. And the, and the piece of research maybe you decide to commercialize is really determined by the needs in the market. But research needs to continue, and absolutely. Otherwise, there's nothing to commercialize. Yeah, just to add, because I, I feel fairly passionately about this. I, I think that, uh, again, what, what Karen just said, that the component of knowledge creation where academia has been traditionally at its strongest, this is something that needs to continue unimpeded. And in some cases, you don't need necessarily the question why. It's discovery. And maybe the why will come later, that you discover things as part of the scientific progress, as part of moving from one paradigm to the other. Yeah. 
But when you talk about venture creation, this is, so that's why I'm, I'm saying it's not the research that needs to be changed. It's the venture and whether it can be commercialized in a particular way that you need to basically uh, uh, look at against the needs of specific customers. Because without adding value or creating value, you can't have a business. So uh, that, I think that's the distinction. But I fully agree that research should continue uh, as it is now, which is the purpose for knowledge creation. Now, knowledge exploitation in commercial terms and how it is that we can make that useful in economic or other terms, that's a different matter. Uh, 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 yes, th that's actually quite interesting, especially the, the last part that you said, because Axel Nobel and, and the Ranks Museum, we've had a collaboration uh, for decades, and um, Axel Nobel has actually started a line of decoration called the Rijksmuseum Colors. And they actually benefited and profited quite well of that. The thing is, though, how does that benefit then the research world? And, and that is the other thing where I'm thinking of as to where science uh, really made a profitable investments towards companies. And that is, for instance, with Brugge where they, uh, the Macro XRF that was uh, designed in 2008, they started to work with that. The first prototype was ready in 2012 or 11, no, 2000, yeah, ar around that time. And, and they thought that they would sell five or six. I believe they've sold now 120 machines. They're 260,000 euros each. And, uh, and, and they are laughing, so to say. Uh, there are, who's benefiting from this? The company of Brugger in this case. And, and, and there, I think, lays a little bit of problem as to for whether you have the ideation coming from our field and then to make it profitable for others or the investors, if you wish, yes. But how does that correlate back to our, the field of, of where we are in? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if, if I understood the question. But I, I think that if we come back to the whole issue of humanities and social sciences, etc., and the technological or scientific drivers of innovation, yeah, because these are, are two distinct areas, then I would say that it's the, then you get into a philosophical discussion in the sense that humanities and art address the why. You introduce values, you introduce ethics, etc., etc. It's what, what are the boundaries? of that knowledge creation that you are about to make. It's the old Socratic thing of uh, Epsihi and Techni, or pieces, which is not uh, poetry in, the, in okay, it, it gets to poetry, but it's making things. In fact, there is a parallel, because I, I wrote a book about Japanese culture, and in there there's the, the notion of monozukuri, which is making things, very, very similar to, to this old notion. But it's, 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 it's in this very, Eastern tradition of the thing actually transcends just the material that you actually make from it. It's, it, it's something bigger than that. So, uh, at any rate, so I, I see these two as, as, as complementary forces, the techni and the psyche, or the, uh, uh, the, 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 the why and the what and the how. But uh, now getting back to the, the question that we were talking about, which is essentially should science continue on as it is without necessarily to have some sort of societal instrumentality? And I, I, I personally think absolutely yes, because you never know what that will lead to. But then when we get to the point where something is identified as being relevant to specific needs of specific, then you talk about the knowledge creation transferring to knowledge exploitation. Now, if, if that happens, that's great. If it doesn't, and it's not this time yet, then we have to basically just do more and more until that, because that's the purpose of academia. I guess uh, Costa has a strong view on that, I'm sure. So I, I don't know if I answered your question. Well, 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 well uh, for actually, funny enough, yes, in, in a sense, because I think for the, 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 my first explanation with the Axel Nobel, that is where no science was involved. It was just the museum, uh, uh, the board of directors of the museum saying, hey, let's have this collaboration with Axel Nobel. Uh, they give us some money and they make use of what we have. So uh, 
I would say, uh, exploitation of, of uh, for what we had to offer. Then with Brugger, there was just the scientists who were d doing that. And as a point, not the social sciences or anything like that. So when I think if you come back again to that circle of, of using all different fields and then seeing what is the question and then finally that is of course and, and, and what the lady was saying there over there is to define the question what needs to be answered that is of course uh, the, the most difficult one what is it that we would have to do uh, what is what is the egg of columbus that's, that's a dutch expression i don't know if that exists in in, in english as well but uh, uh, so what is it that we would have to do and to think about that, and that what's what makes it interesting, and I think including everybody involved. Anyone else? Uh, Nico, you're right. Uh, I'm passionate about it. <laughs> um, the. Um, long uh, day with so much input and now coming to this which is in a way uh, a super synthesis uh, when uh, <coughs> we are discussing forming uh, star C long time ago uh, most of the scientists most especially most of the archaeologists the art historians said what science and technology in uh, archaeology in art what is this uh, who needs it well we have it's really the merging of or historical reasons uh, fields that have not yet found the interface to move forward ripe uh, questions uh, to to be answered we saw the example of uh, the El Greco uh, where uh, f techniques in uh, physics that were developed 40, 50 years ago are put to identify a hidden signature of a El Greco. This would not, would not have been possible by the experts, actually. We heard that the experts said, hey, this is uh, uh, not it. No. Record of science got the answer. Okay, and actually I like this example because it brings a third dimension, which is not in research. Research absolutely has to proceed regardless of this third dimension. Is there immediate value uh, added by having this know-how or this uh, technique or this methodology? And in this case, it's easy, yes? There is uh, value here. Uh, an auction house probably can tell us. Yes, uh, uh, you, you are painting. It has appreciated uh, by so much. Your ancient vase uh, is now so much more valuable. Um, so the value brings the market, brings the com commercialization. So I see it as a three different axes. Uh, uh, Star C brought the two together. The third one is brought by bringing in innovation. Uh, who rely, uh, relies on the other two? Uh, if I understood the question uh, 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 posed before, is okay, the value commercialization brings income, brings money. Who gets it? Uh, uh, it's not given that the people should get it, will get it. There are recent examples of that and old examples. The most recent one is the World Wide Web. Uh, as you know, this was invented at CERN. And CERN, and these are pretty good scientists and they're quite savvy. Even though they said, oh, this is going to be a, uh, a very nice tool co to communicate among researchers, physicists, which are all over the world. Let's use it. Actually, I was one of the first ones to use it. Uh, and they, we thought it was a nice tool. They didn't get a patent. Uh, they, uh, CERN has no revenue out of it. Uh, uh, 
the team got famous, but that stopped there. Uh, the commercialization and the value is distributed all over the case because uh, it's not protected. Uh, so it doesn't mean that this will go back to the laboratories or the scientists or the artists or the archaeologists that did it. Unless we're conscious about it, and we make sure, and I think it's our, and I'm talking as, as the president of this institute now, it's our responsibility uh, to make sure, that, yeah, we're doing this, but we're not going to get somebody else uh, uh, to rip up uh, the benefits because we're so naive uh, not to do it. Uh, and uh, so my answer to that is uh, yes, it's not automatic at all, especially of our scientists, our uh, are, are naive about uh, these issues, and we are, uh, generally, uh, and don't work with innovation people and uh, uh, to make sure that uh, this is uh, protected and developed. Actually, this is what our vision of the Institute is to, to enhance the knowledge economy of Cyprus. Well, this is knowledge economy, as far as I see it. Uh, in in a very specific uh, 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 domain, in a place where most people, if they ask them, experts, give us an example, they will not come back uh, to that. Although looking from a distance again, if we look at this overall, we're talking about multi-billion, uh, probably tens or hundreds of, of billions of uh, goods and services if you take not only paintings, of course, but artifacts in general, uh, uh, museums, insurance companies, uh, auction houses. So uh, there is a huge domain there. And clearly, uh, the challenge is to, again, as originally done, is to interface this third dimension in a seamless way in a research institution without not only hampering research, but revenues from this, if it's successful, go back to feed the research. So don't reap the research, fund it, uh, because that's uh, where uh, it all uh, originated. And uh, maybe I went on and on, but I, bottom line, I don't see any contradiction. I see only synergies if we somehow uh, sort it and put it in its right place and also see tremendous potential for research institutions not to be uh, demanding uh, funding for their research as though uh, they're beggars because somebody else is reaping the benefits of their research. Let's close uh, the, the circle uh, where it should be closed. I'd like to briefly add another dimension related to um, the consequences of not using your technology, and that's fraud. I mean, there are many cases of fraud. I mean, the Nodler Gallery closed with $80 million of fakes. Um, the Jean-Michel Mesquet, $100 million. I mean, there are examples there of fraud out there. If your technology is better known, Maybe people would be less, less likely to copy. I don't know. But at any rate, you certainly, um, it behooves me to suggest that you go out there and eliminate some of this fraud. Could I say a few, and address another question, that not actually the same question on value? And the, the value you were talking about is how much now the El Greco will cost or what value it will have. Now, we should consider what was the value of discovering that it is a Greco, okay? Because that adds to the knowledge that we have of who El Greco is and how did this painting fit in hi the history and development of his art? Why was it considered not so good to be an El Greco? Is it because he was changing from this Byzantine tradition to the Western one? Was it at a moment where he tried to do kind of Western-looking 
are, I mean, I'm just talking just generally like that, you know. But these, to me, are very important issues that have great value, because otherwise this object would not have had the value that probably suddenly, you know, his signature would, would make it. So the history of this uh, artist and his development and changes and our research of studying and asking these questions about him and his life, I think, uh, add the value that you're talking no, you're about. You're absolutely right. Yeah. No, that's tremendous. And how about the value to the institute? Yes, I mean, one, so it all connects in yeah. some ways. But to me, this is very important to be said. Uh, the value of the institute, probably I'll uh, make a joke, uh, is that everybody has a painting on his wall and they will bring it to us say, is it really Modigliani? Uh, can you find the signature uh, behind it? Uh, uh, or or uh, my, my grandmother uh, uh, has this a piece of stone. Is it really uh, uh, the cornerstone of the... Uh, of the uh, of the Parthenon, or, uh, I mean, it, there will be a lot of uh, noise in, in, uh, on, on this, and uh, uh, it, will, um, uh, it will pose a problem uh, to, to, to put a threshold on, on relevant questions, which is a, a very real uh, issue. Uh, uh, of course, a price for these services will be an excellent uh, an excellent uh, fence uh, to uh, to stop uh, inquiries that uh, will need no nowhere. Nicholas, can I say one last word because it's it's not late. Okay, w one last point I wanted to make is uh, as we are talking about innovation, uh, I think we should definitely highlight the importance of uh, the institution, the importance that the institution plays to bringing about innovation, and I'm referring to um, some of the points made by Costas, that um, this institution here is definitely supportive of innovation, and it's, it's, uh, it's not only supporting innovation, it's, it's trying to educate its researchers in the right direction, and to protect them from um, you know, publishing it without uh, protecting the IP. Um, and do not think that all the institutions are doing that, all the universities are doing that. It, it, it is my impression that this particular institute is, 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 is leading the way uh, in commercializing. And I think the, the, the fact that uh, in the third cycle of Cyprus Seeds we have the presence of, of, uh, of projects again, and uh, that will be announced tomorrow, uh, that speaks a lot for the for the contribution of this uh, of, of this institute in in bringing about uh, commercialization. And I want to congratulate the management and and those who have uh, uh, brought it uh, at the forefront. Um, thank you, Maria. Uh, are there any other questions from uh, from the audience? Please. We will not run it. We, we will going to wrap it up. I know it's been a long day. We don't need to stay until 6.30 according to the program. I just wanted to, to leave the, the time. I'll keep it brief. I thought your comment was uh, very valuable indeed. And I'd like to stress that every time a conservator or restorer treats and examines an object, they create value continuously. And it creates value for the museum, it creates value for the object, it creates value for the visitors to the museum because new knowledge is being generated all the time. I think that's a very important issue that we create value every day that we deal with our objects. And you cannot quantify that in dollars or euros or anything like that. It is value creation continuously. If you want to make a venture and earn revenues in providing service, you need to find that, uh, those stakeholders that really need you. And one of the groups that needs you would be the conservator restorers. They have plenty of questions, but they are not part of academia in many countries in Europe. So you have to invite them, teach them, and the art historians, the curators, 
as well what can be asked and get them together. When a conservator restorer for a lousy salary restores an object in a minor museum, that restorer is not allowed to ask questions for having science come in and help. Stimulate that. Then you create value, lots of value. Thank you. Um, I couldn't think, I mean, this is a great way to kind of end the, end the discussion. Uh, I want to thank uh, the panelists. I want to thank Cyprus Seeds. I want to thank the Institute for giving us the opportunity to venture in that direction. For our team, it definitely has been fun, to say the least. I can also add that for our team, it has also helped us uh, somehow gel better together as we reflect on new ways to contribute and to continue uh, kind of uh, diversifying what we do. So actually, the fact that members of our team willingly are uh, deciding to take that direction says a lot about our team, our mentors, and our, and our organization. So thank you to everybody. Many thanks to all the speakers today for a wonderful symposium. Uh, tomorrow we'll have the time, plenty of time, to discuss more about, with you about future steps, next steps, challenges. Uh, so, and uh, thank you to the audience, to those of, uh, of you that stayed with us uh, through the day. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>